Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, maybe good night somewhere. Um, welcome to Banana Byte Flow Diversion 2023. Uh, I'm excited uh, to be here uh, with you today with uh, all the other uh, faculty that I'm going to introduce you shortly. We're going to talk about flow diversion today. The reason why uh, we're particularly uh, um, um, we're particularly thankful to our sponsors, uh, uh, the someone who gave the grant, someone who are uh, exhibitors, please feel free to um, link to the exhibitor link on the left of uh, on, on the web page and uh, see uh, the, the material that the sponsor provided. Um, the reason why NYU has been central in the flow, di flow diversion concept is uh, uh, especially to the work of uh, Peter Kim Nelson. Um, and this is on the right is the cover of neurosurgery, May 20, 2008, when really like the device was uh, the pipeline device at that time was uh, was uh, um, described. Um, and this is uh, people uh, from NYU, um, some most of which uh, are actually not at NYU anymore, but who were part of the of this uh, key uh, moment in the uh, development of flow diversion. Um, the rest of the NYU team obviously uh, has to be recognized. I'm, I I put myself as part of that. And uh, uh, these are the physicians, but uh, obviously we have to uh, thank uh, all the rest of the team, the administrative team, the tech team, the nursing team, as well as all the fellows that have rotated uh, uh, throughout these years um, here at NYU. Um, a lot of the material that we are going to discuss, some of the stuff you're going to find on, on the website on neuroangel.org um, uh, that you may be familiar with. And uh, we also put a lot of educational stuff on the uh, on the social media, as you may be aware. Guest faculty, fantastic, incredible, stellar. It's in, it's a, such a pleasure to have in the morning. We're going to have uh, the Dr. Bree Chancellor um, uh, talking about uh, the flow diversion evidence. Uh, Dr. Dodi Boccardi, um, who is going to tell us about his uh, experience from the beginning to now, how that evolved. And uh, Dr. Isil uh, Sachi, who will... Uh, talk about something uh, very specific, which is the use in the MCA bifurcation. And uh, um, in the afternoon, uh, we'll have uh, um, um, Dr. John Wainwright, um, uh, who is an engineer, uh, who is like talk, will talk us about the engineering flow diversion, and there will be a session for, se for questions. So any question you have, please uh, uh, be connected for that. Um, Professor Chapeau, uh, will talk us about the uh, specific use of double barrel flow diversion, something that he always impressed us uh, in conference when he showed us. And uh, that, then Professor Siddiqui will talk us about uh, the use, how how he specifically um, do certain uh, specific uh, uh, um, treat, uh, treatment for vertebral basilar aneurysm, something that can be very scary. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dan Seline will talk us about uh, the uh, distal flow diversion uh, later in the afternoon. And then uh, um, this is the agenda. And uh, um, um, as you see, like there will be talk also from our team, from the NYU team, specifically talk from uh, Maxim Shapiro, uh, Erez Nosek, uh, and myself, as well as obviously Dr. Peter Kim Nelson. Um, and uh, um, please, um, without further ado, um, Maxim Shapiro, uh, we'll start now with talking us about uh, the device properties and the clinical application of the knowledge. Um, he doesn't need much in introduction, um, but uh, I will still uh, say that uh, he has been uh, a key person in the uh, in the, the in the flow diversion history of NYU and uh, a key person for myself and for the uh, as a mentor and as a teacher and as a partner. And uh, please, Max. Um, Go ahead. Eitan, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who is joining us. Uh, it really has uh, been like a lot of work to put this together. It's fantastic. Yes, faculty, thank you to all the sponsors. Um, really is um, looking forward to this. If I can I think I have to, um, let me, yeah, thanks. Um, let's see. Okay, so I wanna spend a little bit of time because of how our scheduling came together. Um, this is kind of the first talk that we'll talk about properties of devices, not just the pipeline device, but uh, braided devices and flow diversion in general. And um, Kim Nelson will speak um, later and Wainwright as well about these related topics. So 
really, um, these are my disclosures. I am a consultant and pipeline proctor for a uh, Medtronic. Um, so I can see that um, Eitan introduced a lot of our team. Uh, really, what I want to highlight is something that has been central to our NYU approach and uh, many others, I believe, um, really, you know, driven by Kim Nelson's appreciation for um, for how this is done. And this is really understanding that devices are tools. Um, pipeline and flow diverters are generally some of the more complex tools that we have. So it's especially important that we understand the different aspects of them and how to use that. Um, and I, I do want to say that, in a sense, every craftsman needs to know his tool or her tool. But in a sense, to, to the extent that we're working in the human body, there's a moral component to this, that we really must understand this in order that we do the best for our patients. How to do that? Um, I think everyone, and I very much encourage you to just do it yourself. Like take the device, look at it with your own eyes, like look at it on the bench top. You know, we're talking, we've done like years of thinking about this. If you haven't, just do it yourself. Take a look, like study it, understand the device, the delivery system for yourself. The more you do that, the more you're gonna have your own perspective and the perspective of others will resonate uh, to you in, 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 in a, perhaps in a, in, in a more meaningful way. So I think there's nothing like doing it yourself and studying it here. We have to understand the delivery system. It's essential. The device and the delivery system are, are important, how they work together. We have to understand the imaging appearance. We'll talk about that. And of course, the behavior, which gets into this idea of understanding failures. We have to understand why we don't get 100% complete occlusion with any device, including this one, um, and why that happens and what that tells us about how it works and what we can do to make it better. Um, <clears throat> The properties of braided stents in general, that's the outline in vitro properties and so forth. Um, that's just a slide to show you that the delivery system is complicated and it keeps changing. Um, we have to understand the different components. We'll review that. Now, braided devices, um, as opposed to like say laser cut stents um, are a family, right? Pipeline is one of them. There are many others beginning like with one of the first ones, which is the wall stent of which there is different versions, the biliary, the carotid, and so forth. They all share common properties of how the device is braided, how it's held together by the interaction of the different, like the individual wire braids. There isn't really soldering there that uh, is, is primarily meaningful in terms of how the construct is made. So what we're talking about applies to uh, braided devices as a family. Now, if you're thinking about a system, like how do you describe in physics, let's say, or in engineering, anything that's that's made, you have to think of like, what are the components? What do you have to describe to understand it? So the essentials for braided devices would be the material and the braid, right? If you think about the material for pipeline, again, it's cobalt chromium, you know, other devices, other materials and platinum wires, right? In this particular version, it's a three wire cobalt chromium to one wire platinum. It's important to understand how it looks on X-ray. The wire thickness happens to be about 30 micron here and the wire number. So it's 48 for the pipe the number varies depending on the device. As far as braiding, what does braiding allow us? The properties result in that is the nominal diameter of the device, of course, the length and very important, the pitch. So we'll talk about the pitch and how that influences properties as well. Now, the, as when you put this together and you have a device, right? what determines the properties and the behavior of it? Now, we've talked a lot, at, there's a lot written and a lot known for pipeline particularly about pore size, density, metal coverage, and so forth, like flow, how that affects quote unquote flow diversion, endothelialization. Um, so there's relatively more on that available. There's another key property that is more complex um, and um, more perhaps difficult to understand and to, to measure. And that is the conformability of the device, the elasticity, the flexibility. Can a device be implanted? What is the wall opposition? How stiff or not stiff is it? Because ultimately the two prerequisites for success, and this is gonna be the theme of my two talks actually, is that you have to have optimal implantation. So there has to be optimal position of the device within the target vessel, right? And there has to be optimal neck metal coverage, whatever that is. We'll talk about what optimal is. But these are the two prerequisites, necessary but not sufficient. Endothelialization, thrombogenicity, all these other things are also important. But in terms of geometry, this is what you have to have. 
It has to be optimally implanted and there has to be optimal coverage. And so these, in, in many ways, this is determined by the properties of the device. And particularly when we talk about conformability and elasticity, um, these are very important and receive a little bit less attention, uh, perhaps, than, than, than neck coverage. Um, now, where do we find this information? Like, say you wanted to know what the pore size is or what the pore density is or whatever. Turns out it's not so easy to find. You know, you go to the FDA, see what the data is that's submitted by the companies uh, for FDA clearance and evaluation. Actually, there is not a lot of engineering data that's publicly available, at least. Some of the, these things, we have them available for pipeline, but for a lot of them, you really don't have it. Um, so you have to do a little bit of lead work or perhaps you have to do it yourself. Now, this property, it's an essential thing. So if you're kind of new to braided stents, uh, you have to understand that um, the size, the, the braided stent has this fundamental property where its expansion, where its change in one dimension is necessarily coupled to a change in another dimension. It cannot expand without foreshortening and vice versa. So this is like just how the geometry of the device is. That's of course known for a, a long time. So in a wall stent, you even have this like little helpful chart to tell you how much, you know, length lengthening you might expect if you put it in a smaller vessel, which is a lot. If you look at the wall stent, there's like considerable change that happens with that. So you have to understand that, of course, about, you know, pipeline and other flow diverters as well. Um, now, in addition to that, as the length, the change in length, the change in diameter, and the change in, in pitch, right, in the angle of the braid of the pore, um, they're all interrelated and they all, it's a continuum. And so for the pipeline, we uh, many of you know this slide, you've seen this thing. Um, I very much have been looking forward to seeing similar data for other devices. It is available for some. For most, it is really not readily available. Um, and I think it should be because it tells us a lot about how the device should be used in terms of sizing it, what is the size of the device with respect to the parent vessel, how does oversizing affect coverage? You know, the way that it affects coverage for the pipeline is not necessarily how that would be for other devices, but it is important to understand that number one, for the pipeline, for the flex and for the shield, um, these curves have this um, parabolic kind of nature uh, where basically, if you look at all of them and you should study it, you know, in more detail, essentially what this, this data implies is that oversizing results in a reduction in metal coverage up to a point where there's kind of a minimum, at which point then again, further oversizing then again results in like an increase in uh, coverage, but at sort of limits of oversizing where it's probably not so commonly encountered. And number one, number two, it's important to appreciate that since they're all 48 braid, 48 wires, the smaller diameter devices have more metal coverage throughout. The curves have this similar shape, but in general, like a 325, it's going to have much more coverage than the 475 throughout. So that's important to appreciate when we talk about how to create like rational constructs and uh, and what what we might expect from what kind of coverage we might expect from implantation. Now, these things can be imaged. So we talk about Dyna CT, Vaser CT, and so forth. Can, we can image this. We can measure this. It's really not like a complicated mathematics to, to go from this sort of measurement to an estimation of what sort of percent coverage you might have um, in this um, like dissecting uh, vertebral aneurysm. Um, and so all of these things can be studied and should be studied um, to optimize our outcomes. Now, other things that come from these sorts of considerations is what happens when devices are, let's say, oversized. Like say this is a proximal and this is your distal landing zone and you decide to use one device that's sized to the five because that's what you have to do. A number of things happen. Number one is that you do have like this kind of like uneven coverage, much less coverage on the three end than on the five. There's this transition down that happens. So the transitions are important to understand the device is not able to just magically go from five to three. There has to be a zone of transition. That zone of transition has some effects like this kind of lip of poor opposition that cannot necessarily be controlled by pushing the device more or pulling it anymore. So there are limitations that result from suboptimal sizing. That becomes particularly important in these sorts of 
um, maybe like artificial models, but there is a biologic, uh, an in vivo correlation to this, where devices are implanted with short landing zones and how that may result in this sort of distal, um, we might call it stenosis or crimping or fish mousing, um, how with, you know, certain loads that might result in this sort of, you know, whatever you, some people call it arm, other people call it an expansion and how these things can be created. So these, all of these things need to be understood and they can be seen in vivo. If you study the device to see like how you should optimally think of implanting it when you're working in the body. Um, the management strategy, so we'll get into some of these um, things is basically like sizing optimally. Sometimes optimal sizing means that two devices have to be implanted, one size to like say the distal portion, one size to the optimal one. That has many advantages. Number one, optimal sizing at each end. Number two, increased coverage uh, over the neck of the this particular like um, fusiform model aneurysm. Um, there are some implications in terms of how the braid is overlaid, um, which is what this um, kind of graph is that we show. Uh, we try to show a lot. This is very important. Um, if two devices of the same size are implanted in telescoping fashion, the overlap may be min. The, the, the resulting coverage increase may be minimal if the overlap is kind of like in phase. Um, it might be almost twice as much if it's perfectly out of phase, but the reality is you're going to get a mix of this, that, and the other. And so within that, there's going to be a big range here from like quite good to quite like not very much uh, bang for the buck of the second device. And so it's important to think of varying the nominal diameter of devices to increase like this, the homogeneity of this sort of coverage. Uh, and so these things, um, you know, like not, and again, you can visualize that even with multi-device constructs, uh, it might be more difficult to measure what is the effective uh, bore size here, what is the effective coverage. You could see that, you could more qualitatively evaluate these kinds of results to see what, you know, what we have achieved and what we think is sufficient. Uh, now, this is, I think, quite important. We're talking about conformability and elasticity and apposition. There's very, very little information in that, in, in a quantitative sense on this. But it, this has been known for a long time. So here's an article from uh, 2004 from, from AJNR, right? Looking at the different devices. So these are laser cut stents. These are braided stents. There's many reasons why laser cut is not like where we are in terms of flow diversion today. So we don't have to talk about that. But if you think about braided stents, these things, they might look similar if they're in their non-constrained kind of like on the table. But once you implant this guy versus this guy into a model, you see that they're very different. That one of them, it's not just stiffness, there's other properties there. But conformability, if you will, is what this device has more and this device has less. And it makes a big difference. Not just for the wall stand, it makes a big difference for us. So here's an example. Here's a patient with uh, like a small ophthalmic aneurysm, right? Standard thing, uh, treated with uh, a pipeline device, looks like this. Here's the follow-up of that. You see the endothelialization, looks fine. This right here is the same patient, same biology, mirror image ophthalmic aneurysm, most common one, right, for mirror images. Treat it. It's a different, there's another device that's a plant. It's not a pipeline. Doesn't look so bad. Looks like it's taken this, you know, pretty serious curve along the anterior genuine. Here's the unsubtracted view. Now, if you look carefully, Right here, I've outlined this to help see. If you go back and forth, like spend a little time in it, you're gonna see right here that there is malapposition. You see that? Same here. You look at this, all of these areas, the device is not perfectly opposed. This is the end result. You look at this, this is I think 12 months later. You see aneurysm still here, this thing, this thing. If you look at it carefully with Dynacity in this case, this there's like an effective endo leak has been created right here by the endothelialization of the device that allows the persistent filling of the aneurysm because of the malaposition at the distal end here in the proximal end doesn't look good probably maybe a thrombotic like a thrombotic risk at some point there was no issue here um in terms of that but it just healed like this why because you can see how the device doesn't have the elasticity to be implanted 
optimally along the wall. And it makes a big difference. So all, both the coverage that we talk about and the implantation properties, the elasticities are key. That gets into this issue of understanding failure. Like we've published on this, other people have as well. It's critically important that we look when things don't work, right? Why is this like 80% number keeps floating around in terms of you know, the efficacy of flow diversion pipeline, uh, pipeline more specifically, um, as the kind of like 80, maybe 80 plus in puffs up to like over 90% five-year efficacy, right? Um, but it's not 100. Now, why is that? The theory is that failure of occlusion is a failure of endothelialization. Not probably perfect theory, but very close to it. And that optimal implantation and optimal net coverage. Again, like these are, this is what underlies it. Now, how do we think of it? Okay, outflow source, well known, right? The branch, it's not magic, right? The, des the, the device is designed to keep side branches open, right? Important side branches. If an aneurysm happens to be associated with it, it's not, you know, it's not reasonable to expect the same efficacy in the setting as you would if you didn't have this kind of situation. So the efficacy is reduced. But how does that relate to our precondition, like optimal coverage, optimal implantation? Okay, we'll get, get back to that in a tiny bit. So here's what happens with the aneurysm. It's a well-known example. Been three years, still not closed. Here's the ophthalmic providing the outflow, right? Well-known solution. And, you know, for the ophthalmics, add more devices, rich collateral bed, external collateral bed for most of them. And then it's, that's what happens. The external picks up, the ophthalmic proper, like anti-grade shuts down with the aneurysm itself. So that's number one. Mala position. Okay, that's relatively, so that before this is, this is a pipeline device in this particular case. Okay, relatively easy to understand that that's not a good thing. Now we talk about combination of factors. How does that work? So this example, we also show that this idea that there's malaposition to this particular component, this particular aspect of the vessel, which results in sort of a secondary creation of a larger aneurysmal component, if you will, which now incorporates the previously separate ophthalmic origin from the aneurysm itself. And that that's the problem. This is the schematic of like, this particular case. This is the same case later after a second. Like, again, the idea is at this point, I have to add more devices to have it shut down. And the solution is, of course, to do this. Malaposition as pre-existing device. So that's another like flavor of malaposition. The device is, you know, not allowing the pipeline to oppose it. So in case of residuals or recurrence, curvature, right? That's important. Everybody knows more or less outer curves, less coverage for the same device. So sometimes here's an outer curve aneurysm. There happens to be a pore like this that's like not, you know, just happens to be that you don't have as much coverage as elsewhere along this curve. That's the end result. Now you can visualize that again. So here's like beautifully visualized one. Aton's like really nice super dynas showing how this works. Like pore like this, ophthalmic and so forth. Now, so what does that mean? Like what is sufficient? Like what is sufficient coverage? That gets to this point. Sufficient is whatever it takes to address the clinical need, right? Sometimes the clinical need is prevention of rupture. Sometimes it's mass effect. So like it could be more complicated, but that gets to the art of the practice. And that depends on the circumstances. So larger aneurysms, right? And those with outflow vessels require more neck coverage. And that's the connection, like coverage and in, like conformability opposition. A presence of an outflow vessel is related to the need for more metal coverage right because that's that's ultimately what happens so that the coverage number is dynamic what works for one aneurysm may not work for another one it's very hard to know a priori what that number might be or how that would work in a person so, so definitely a lot we don't know um what we can't really measure but that's how we think about it. and we have to like that gets us to the point of like multi-device constraints they're essential to be able to know how to create them Certainly one device works for many aneurysms, but it doesn't always work. And we can't be stuck in with this one and done thing. We have to be very like, I'm gonna be quite strong about it. It's just not a rational statement in terms of medical treatment. Not anymore that like, you know, one pass, stroke didn't work, I'm done. No, like not one coil, not one clip. 
there are reasons to do this. The reasons might be like fear, magical thinking, financial reasons. These are reasons, but it's not a medical, it's not a rational physiologic principle. The physiologic principle is you, as many as it takes to get the job done, whatever that job might be. Um, so I think that's very, very important. Um, now, I think, Eitan, am I out of time? Should we keep going? Or I think this is like something that's kind of... You have five minutes uh, left, uh, let's say four. Fantastic. Okay, so we can do that. Um, I want to say a few words about the delivery system. The delivery system is important because the delivery system has to match the device. You have to understand it. You have to study it um, in vitro. Understand like the markers, you know, the sleeves. Why are the sleeves there? The sleeves are there because the leading edge is delicate. There's no soldering here or anything like that. It needs to be protected. The trailing edge, the proximal edge, which used to be pushed in the first version of the pipeline and that had certain issues, is no longer pushed by this bumper. It's really this friction fit with the resheathing pad that allows the device to be advanced and resheathed. And that also has the function of protecting the trailing edge or the proximal edge from damage. And we'll look into that a little bit in the next lecture. Um, so these are all these different components. Now you have to understand where they are. If you look at like this slide, just go to pipeline device and you arrange your page, study that. So you understand like where things begin, where things end like how long the sleeves are and so forth. All of that's important. You can find that in the FDA information. Um, it's important to understand how the sleeves work in terms of proximal opening that particularly that law, like larger diameter devices require longer opening time, opening because of a, because of how, what, what basically is the radial force difference between a two and a half, let's say, and a five. And we have to expect that that can be mitigated by resheathing. So we'll talk about like resheathing to allow it and then redeploying it to allow the distal end of the device to deploy better. But it doesn't always work like in the pictures. Sometimes one of the sleeves will come into the catheter again. One of them will be out. So all of these things, like once you think, like see that, you realize that like what the permutations are in view because we can't see that, that, that you know, you can't see those things, uh, the PTFE sleeves now. Um, in the current version, you have to think of what they might be doing. Um, okay, here's, if you want, take this, you know, this is where the page is, um, and uh, you have more information over there. Um, endothelialization and healing. So this is something also that is much more difficult to study, but it can be studied, even if we don't have like clinically uh, widely available OCT or something like this. There is a way to study that. There's a way to understand that. There's a way to image it. The imaging of it um, is something that I want to just like spend a second on. Um, very commonly, we see publications, we see people presenting data, and they don't have this image. Just a native image with the device in. Everything is subtracted. That's not how optimally we want to image devices. We want an unsubtracted image so we can see the device. Then we want an unsubtracted image with contrast so we can see that relationship. And then we want the subtracted image so you can see like the vasospasm and this and that. Um, so all of these three are important. Now we have to understand Dyna, of course, or Super Dyna in this case, so we can see how rational constructs are made. Go to this paper. This is tons, um, really fantastic work of like showing how to do this. Like most of you can do this most of you have the machines to do this. Um, not everybody, certainly, but a lot of machines are able to do this or something close to it. Um, follow up, you know, again, they have to understand endothelialization. We can study this. Um, in the interest of time, we're not going to spend too much time about these interactions, about remodeling and healing endothelialization, but there is a way to look at it. Today, with the tools we have, you can understand what the distribution of the thickness are and what the factors are that play into that. And we can kind of pick up on that, maybe if not today, a little bit later on. Um, and so in conclusion, again, we have to understand the tool, the geometric and the physical properties. And I think this is something very, very important that the group outcomes, when you look at these numbers, the sum total numbers of our group results are really into like, this is based on individual success or failure. 
So granular examination of each and every case for the factors that may have contributed to both good and bad are essential. And I encourage you all to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Fantastic. We're, we're going to have a chance to discuss after uh, Brie, um, Brie Chancellor talk. Um, Brie, are you ready to share your screen? Okay, why, while you do, I'm going to introduce you. Dr. Brie Chancellor um, is uh, uh, originally a graduate from Harvard, where she graduated with cum laude, and uh, she did the residency in uh, in uh, neurology at uh, NYU, where then she stayed for two fellowships. Actually, she did stroke uh, uh, neurology, vascular neurology fellowship, and then uh, a fellowship in neurointerventional with us. Um, and... Uh, uh, she uh, since then she has worked at uh, um, at the Neuro Jersey, neurosurgeons of New Jersey, and she's done fantastic work. Um, and uh, uh, she actually published a paper, like going through the details of like uh, all the uh, evidence, uh, all the trials uh, of flow diversion, and um, that's what she's talking to us uh, today about. And uh, we're eager to see what uh, what is the data. Thank you, Bree. Thanks for the nice introduction and thank you all for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I am passionate about flow diversion and yeah, I'm going to take you through the evidence uh, briefly. And I'm going to talk to you about the flow diversion origins until 2020. We'll go through a little bit more detail on a few trials, Premier, Fred, Scent and Pedestrian. We'll talk a little bit about Pipeline Shield and the Vantage and then some of the discussion points um, which my colleagues will be covering um, in more detail throughout the day. So here's um, a paper that um, we wrote in 2020 to cover the flow diversion for intracranial aneurysms, trials involving flow diverters, and the longest term out outcomes that we had. Obviously, to look at these minimized porosity endoluminal devices for the reconstructive aneurysm treatment, which did represent this very uh, significant conceptual shift in terms of aneurysmal treatment from controlling the dome to reconstructing the diseased parent artery. This trial, um, this paper covered some of the major early trials. Um, the earliest uh, major one was called PETA, which was Pipeline for Intracranial Treatment of Aneurysms, which enrolled from uh, 2007 to 2011. Um, the types of aneurysms treated um, are depicted on the right, um, often large or giant. The mean size of the aneurysms were 11.5 millimeters. Most of them were internal carotid artery. Um, the device used in this trial was the Pipeline Classic, so the original. 31 aneurysms were treated and primarily with single devices. Um, the outcomes were 93% occlusion at six months and there was a 6.7% morbidity and a 0% mortality associated with this trial. Um, and this really led to the approval of the pipeline device in the United States in 2011 for the large and giant internal carotid artery aneurysms that are proximal to the PECA. Following PETA, one of the seminal trials, of course, is called PUFFS. Um, PUFFS is pipeline for the uncoilable or failed aneurysms. It was a prospective multi-center single arm trial, which enrolled patients from 2008 to 2014. A total of 109 aneurysms were treated. And the image on the right just depicts kind of a classic puffs aneurysm. It included both extra and intradural aneurysms, large and giant. So even larger than the PETA aneurysms on average, the mean size being 18.2 millimeters. And PUFFS was a, a sort of an evolution on PETA from the standpoint of number of devices. Uh, the mean number of devices per aneurysm was 3.1, so larger aneurysms and more flow diversion. Uh, PUFFS is also one of the trials where we have great five-year data. Um, the occlusion rates at one year, 86.8, increased by three years to 93.4, and by five years, 95.2% occlusion of the aneurysms, which you know, previously with other techniques, it was a sort of unheard of uh, level of occlusion. The morbidity and mortality was 5.6% and the retreatment rate was 5.7%. Um, so from PUFFS, uh, moving forward to sort of a summary slide of 
many of the trials that we had that informed us prior to 2020 with PETA and PUFFs summarized on the left. Um, there were three ma main registries, um, Aspire, uh, which was uh, published in 2014, that described uh, the treatment of 207 aneurysms, primarily of the anterior circulation, also quite large, mean size of 14.5. The angiographic follow-up was a little bit shorter, on average 7.8 months, um, mostly single device, uh, but some multi-device treatment, so 18.8% were single device. Um, about the same amount of retreatment, the complete occlusion was 74.8%. Um, Aspire was a little bit different from some of the other data sets in that there were more uh, parenchymal hemorrhages, 3.7%, whereas most of the other trials, um, the primary risk related to these devices was around ischemic stroke, um, ipsilateral to the device. Uh, the morbidity was a 6.8% in total. Intraped was an even larger retrospective multicenter uh, registry of 906 aneurysms, a little bit smaller, 10.7 millimeters. Um, this was a nice um, a summary of data regarding complication rates and how they differed across uh, various aneurysm types. So they did a lot of uh, subgroup analyses. And even though the morbidity uh, per this intraped in summary was around 7.4% with a total m, &M of 8.4, um, the posterior circulation was found to be much more risk with 16.4% morbidity and mortality. And when the intraped um, uh, trialists uh, took out the giant aneurysms, the fusiform aneurysms, um, they did get a uh, morbidity and mortality of about 5.7%, so for the more typical aneurysms. There was a registry uh, performed in Australia by Chu and his colleagues published in 2015. This one covered 119 aneurysms, um, still um, focused on large aneurysms. So most were um, large, uh, a little bit larger, uh, with 43% being greater than 10. Um, this was a nice registry in that the follow-up was a little bit longer, 28 months with excellent occlusion rates of 93.2% at two years and very low uh, morbidity and mortality, only 0.08% uh, ischemic stroke and mortality of the same. The next three trials uh, were prospective, Premier, Safe, and Scent. And I'm gonna go into those trials in a little bit more detail, uh, specifically Premier, we now have the three-year data. SAFE is a trial of the FRED device, um, and that one was followed by the, um, the FRED pivotal uh, clinical trial. So we'll actually talk about that one instead of SAFE, but SAFE was 103 aneurysms. The efficacy was about 73.3% at one year, and morbidity and mortality were quite low, 2.9% and 1.9%. SENT was a trial of the SURPASS Streamline device, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on that one. And then finally, we included this one um, comparative trial, which was prospective and randomized called PARAT. It was a trial performed in China. Um, 144 aneurysms were randomized, primarily the anterior circulation, and it evaluated, evaluated the turbridge flow diverter uh, against stent-assisted coiling. And the complete occlusion rates on follow-up for the flow diversion was about 75% um, versus 25% for the stent-assisted coiling with fairly comparative, um, but a little bit higher morbidity and mortality, uh, as you can see there. So just shifting forward to the Premier data set, um, Premier was uh, uh, enrolled between 2014 and 2015 at 23 sites. Um, both the Pipeline Classic and the second generation Pipeline Flex device were included in the trial. The pictures there depict the Pipe Flex, which has a little bit easier deployment. Um, so some of the features that Max was describing in terms of easier re resheathability, et cetera. It was prospective single arm. Um, it was for unruptured wide-necked intracranial aneurysms. And the main difference with the Premier trial is that it really focused on smaller aneurysms with a mean size of about five millimeter. And um, uh, 141 patients were enrolled. The efficacy was complete occlusion and the safety was the major neural, um, neural events. So in terms of the design, again, primarily still inter, um, internal carotid arteries. Uh, with primarily ophthalmic segment, 74.6%. 
and some vertebral artery aneurysms. Um, about 50-50 with the classic versus flex, because in 2015, the flex was approved. So it kind of shifted that enrollment toward the flex devices. The failure reasons, primarily residual aneurysm was the reason that uh, um, these aneurysms uh, failed. Other uh, causes would be instant stenosis of greater, greater than 50% or just the residual neck. So this um, is just kind of the, the decision tree for how they performed this. The one-year occlusion rates for Premier was 81.9%. So 113 of the aneurysms were cured. Only the uncured aneurysms went on to for the three-year angiographic follow-up, but it was quite good. They had 22 of 25 um, uncured patients with a three-year angiogram, and the clinical follow-up was also quite good. This is the three-year outcomes for Premier. So again, the one-year occlusion was quite good, 81.9, but by three years, 83.3% were occluded. Um, the one-year safety was excellent with only 2.1% uh, safety events, primarily being ischemic. The three-year safety, there was only one additional event um, between years one and three, uh, so a total of 2.8%. Um, the authors of the premier trial also included uh, a modified efficacy scale, which included um, residual necks and aneurysms that shrunk but were not fully cured. And if you include all of those aneurysms, about a 97.1 efficacy rate um, um, in terms of that. So after Premier, the pipeline indication was expanded to the small and medium-sized aneurysms, uh, extending from the petrus all the way to the terminus, so including significantly the PCOM segment. Just moving forward um, uh, to talk about another device, which is the FRED device, which is flow redirection and aluminal device and the pivotal trial. FRED was first uh, reported in the SAFE trial, um, as I mentioned earlier. The concept for the FRED device is it's the only flow diverter that's both a flow diverter and a stent um, with the idea that it's much simpler in terms of the deployment like pipeline, uh, there's 48 inner wires, but it, the difference is this 16 outer wires that act more like a stent. Um, the pivotal trial enrolled from 2013 to 2016, 145 patients, and these were large, wide-necked, and fusiform aneurysms with a mean size of 11.5. So um, in terms of the location of the aneurysm, a lot of cavernous carotids and ophthalmics and they did have about 14% of the PCOM segment. Um, they had excellent follow-up with 130 of 145 with a 12-month angiogram and also very good clinical follow-up in the design. Um, the primary safety endpoint in terms of stroke, death, ipsilateral strokes altogether was about 6.2%, so fairly close to the other uh, previous trials. And um, the efficacy is a little bit different from the other trials from the standpoint of only 57.6% at one year with complete occlusion of the aneurysms of 62.9% at one year. And this, um, in terms of why that might be a little bit lower efficacy, um, one theory is, you know, around Ma what Max was discussing in terms of the seal of the devices. How opposed uh, can the FRED be when there is a stent around the flow diverter? Um, however, the FRED was, um, there's a FRED meta-analysis that was published in 2022 that included 21 studies, mostly retrospective with a 14.3 month follow-up. This showed a little bit higher occlusion rates of 75.1% at seven to 12 months and the occlusion of 86.6% beyond one year uh, with acceptable morbidity and mortality rates of 3.9 and the procedure related mortality of 1.4. So um, when you looked at more patients, perhaps FRED efficacy does compare more favorably. So in terms of the summary about the FRED, it's the only flow diverter with this dual, la dual layer stent and flow diversion design. It's the only flow diverter in, that's approved in the U.S. that has a 21 microcatheter delivery system um, in the FREDX device. Um, it has had slightly lower efficacy, which I mentioned in those uh, pivotal and the safe trial. But then, you know, when you look at the meta-analysis, it does compare with these other flow diverters somewhat favorably. 
Um, the new version is the surface mod modified FredEx. Um, I'll get into those in a little bit, but um, a 2023 paper on the multi-center experience with that, only 45 patients, but showed a good efficacy of 89% at six months and no major morbidity mortality. Just shifting forward to the SENT trial, this is the trial of the SERPAS Streamline. Um, it, it's a bit of a different device from the standpoint it's more wires, 72 or 96 versus the traditional 48. It was enrolling in from 2012 to 2015, 180 patients, extra and intradural ICA annual aneurysms, and again, quite large size of mean dome of 12 millimeters. Um, this is uh, the follow-up for the streamline was not quite as good in scent with only 134 of 180 having that three-year follow-up. Uh, most were intradural ICAs with about 21% PCAP segment, um, and the rest were extradural. Um, in terms of the efficacy of the surface streamline, so at one year, 62.8 with occlusion rates of 66.7. The main difference with the streamline trial of scent is, is around the safety endpoints, um, stroke or uh, neurologic death of 11.1% at one year. The three-year data, we did see an increase in the occlusion rates with 77.8% at three years. Um, very few additional safety events between one and three years, uh, but slightly higher, of course, uh, for the first year. In terms of the summary here, um, the second generation device, uh, the Evolve, has really eclipsed the streamline in practice. And so um, how to sort of... Um, uh, rationalize the scent result with the Evolve, which is currently used when they're quite different devices with the Streamline having more wires, the Evolve being more similar um, in its sort of basic features to pipeline with either 48 or 64 wire, wires, different braid angle, it has the platinum wires. And the Evolve trial is underway. Um, the goal enrollment is 235 patients, which is pretty ambitious. Um, it's going to be uh, four wide-necked aneurysms, um, secular or fusiform, so less than 12, so kind of more similar to what Premier was looking at. So this is just a summary slide of the approvals for the United States, the pipeline initially, of course, for these large and giant, uh, proximal to the PCOM aneurysms, then expanding the label after Premier. The FRED um, was approved in 2019 using the SAFE and um, FRED trials. That one doesn't describe a particular size, just wide neck or the dome to neck ratio of less than two and all the way to the terminus. Same thing for scent is gonna be larger giant aneurysms um, and all the way uh, to the terminus. Um, the pedestrian registry uh, described the Buenos Aires experience. It was uh, retrospective from and covers 2006 to 2019. So just a huge amount of experience. Um, and it covers all three devices, pipeline, classic, flex, and shield. It included difficult previously treated anterior and posterior circulation aneurysms and excluded acute aneurysmal subarax and posterior fusiform. A thousand aneurysms, um, small was the majority, but also a good amount of large and giants. So um, in terms of the aneurysm characteristics, primarily saccular, um, though they did have dissecting fusiforms and some blisters. Uh, so kind of like an experience that mirrors what we as operators might see in the real world, um, um, primarily anterior circulation aneurysms, but again, a smattering of posterior circulations as well. Complete occlusion at 12 months was almost 76%. By two to four years, 93%. And greater than five years, we see just incredible efficacy of 96.4%. The major morbidity and mortality really mirrors the PUFFs data with only about 5.8%. And the retreatment rate was quite low as well, of 4%. Versus the other large uh, trials and registries, PUFFs, Intraped, Aspire, and Pedestrian, our best five-year data is really from PUFFs and Pedestrian, uh, where we get to greater than 95% efficacy by five years. Um, the major morbidity and neurologic mortality hovers around 5.6 to 5.8 for those two, and is a little bit higher for Intraped, which did include more complicated types of aneurysms, um, like I mentioned earlier. Pedestrian um, authors did a subgroup and follow-up for the pipeline shield. The pipeline shield is one of our coded devices with phosphorylcholine surface modification to reduce thrombogenicity. 
It's our third generation pipeline. Um, they did a single arm retrospective look at 302 aneurysms, um, which showed good occlusion rates of 75% at one year and 92.5 at two years. The shield was really significant um, if, uh, when you pull out the data to show a little bit lower complication rates of 2.4% altogether compared with the 5.8%. So uh, the efficacy is essentially on par, but the complications are lower when you look at the surface modified shield. The shield trial is underway. This is of the third, um, sorry, this uh, this is the shield trials results in terms of the third generation. This is um, a prospective trial uh, that enrolled 204 patients. These patients are treated with DAPT, um, almost 90% of them or more during and post, um, and the efficacy was 71.7 with fairly low uh, neurologic morbidity and mortality, kind of like that pedestrian subgroup. So looking very safe, another um cohort of looking at the shield um, was the Australian AUS registry, 278 aneurysms, but the patients are, are all on dual. Um, the occlusion rates were outstanding, 92.5 at 80, uh, 18 months, and pretty low morbidity and mortality, 3.8 and 1.3. Um, these safety trials for a shield really beg the question, um, you know, in terms of how the shield's going to perform off dual antiplatelet. The fourth generation pipeline is called the Vantage with Shield. Um, the selling points for this device is really uh, more precise delivery control, the 21 microcatheter delivery. Um, it was already launched in Europe and the size is up to six millimeters. There's 48 and 64 wire versions. Early data um, does suggest good safety um, with enter up uh, um, these two shorter papers with uh, 40 to 60 aneurysms treated. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the Vantage uh, performs in bigger uh, um, studies, specifically this advanced trial that's underway looking um, with planned enrollment of 140, um, and it's treating intracranial aneurysms of the ICA to the terminus. They will be trialing with patients on the dual antiplatelet, um, so mainly wide-necked, um, pretty similar kind of aneurysms as prior trials. It does notably exclude aneurysmal saw. So one of the questions that this brings up is how do the surface modified flow diverters perform on single antiplatelet? Right now there is a trial underway called coding and that is to trial the P64, which is the Phoenix device with the um, uh, hydrophilic polymer coding on single antiplatelet versus the regular P64 on dual. So this is kind of a, a nice trial in that it's randomized and it's really comparing and trying to answer this question. Are there fewer ischemic events with the coded on single versus uh, the regular on dual? Um, to really try to get at this question, can we move away from dual antiplatelet uh, moving forward and expand our utility of the, um, the flow diverters in ruptured settings? Um, just some brief discussion points that my colleagues will be getting into more flow diversion and ruptured cases. We do have some data. There's two fairly big meta-analysis um, here, uh, but I won't go into too much detail. We'll, we, we really await the results of these larger studies on the coded devices, um, the optimal timing of the flow diversion placement and the antiplatelet strategy. Um, but there is good evidence that in rupture, the flow diverters are efficacious. It's just these higher complication rates related to the dual in that setting. Max talked about this one, so I'll skip over this discussion point. He, um, his paper is excellent on, on the factors affecting treatment failure, the three main ones being branch vessel incorporated into the domer neck, malopposition, and inadequate neck coverage. There's some other factors that many of these big trials that we just went through helped pinpoint. Um, and then there's some factors that help increase occlusion as well that I just covered there. Um, other discussions that we uh, kind of came up with when looking at all of these major trials, what about the fate of these covered branch vessels? Well, in essence, um, what PUFFS and some of the other studies looking at the ophthalmic found was that there's very little ipsilateral blindness from uh, using flow diverters um, due to collaterals. And there's a good amount of silent occlusion rates when covering these side branches, ophthalmic, pecom, and choroidal. However, um, these are very low uh, chance of, of causing symptoms, again, because we think that the branches close slowly and the collaterals come in. 
in terms of the MCA, and we'll have some more conversation on this later, there's a nice trial that recently came out um, on the surface modified devices. Previously, the MCA was some uh, a place where we really didn't want to go with our flow diverters due to fear of occlusion of these branch vessels and the higher um, uh, risk with the original devices. Um, but this surface modified devices um, enrolling from 2018 to 2023, 75 saccular MCA aneurysms were treated with a mean size of five millimeters using um, a, 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 several of the uh, surface modified uh, and dual antiplatelet for a year. This found major mor neural morbidity of 2.7%, which is just way lower and the mortality of 0% with excellent occlusion of 81.9 at two years. Brief. Uh, how many more minutes uh, you think you have? Um, I think I'm pretty much done. I'm going to leave the okay. fate of covered branch vessels regarding posterior circulation for our colleagues for later. Dr. Siddiqui has been an expert kind of in early looking at this. Um, and we have some more um, data on this, but I'll, I'll leave that for later. The distal aneurysms, that's going to be covered later. We kind of await this data with how the low pro profile and the surface modified ones will affect things. Um, so just in conclusion, um, the flow diverters have this great proven high long-term safety and efficacy um, in the treatment of intracranial aneurysms. Originally, we were looking at these sort of previously untreatable wide-necked large and giants, blisters and fusiforms, and then we expanded into the traditional berry aneurysms formally clipped or coiled. The surface modified flow diverters are allowing us to increase our safety and potentially use this more safely in acute subarachnoid with single on fusiforms. And then uh, other things we're looking forward to is around the distal evidence to, we expect more safety there regarding the low profile flow diverters with the surface modifications. And I think Thank I'll just- you, Thank you. There. Um, now we, we open uh, uh, to a few minutes of discussion. Um, um anybody is connected uh, from the faculty uh please uh, feel free um uh, any comment any any point uh both to dr chancellor or dr shapiro you know from my perspective uh you know, it's, uh... another issue you, you wanted to say something Oh, yes. Uh, actually, I have a question uh, for the entire panel, uh, but it is about one of the statements that Brie uh, said, which is, if I'm not misunder, if I do not misunderstand, uh, understand, uh, coiling decreasing the success rates according to the um, studies. Uh, is it the experience of all of us? Or, I mean, because uh i'm kind of um i mean uh it is not our experience sometimes it may be if the jailed catheter may uh, prevent good opposition of the device perhaps but otherwise uh i'm not sure about the efficacy for the safety it can still affect in a negative way, uh, causing more thromboemboli, perhaps, if it, if there is a branch coming off from the sac and the additional coiling may increase that risk. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a great point and question. I'll just jump in because I think um, I was moving pretty quickly through the discussion points. Um, you are completely correct that the data shows that coiling tends to increase occlusion rates. So, oh, okay. So um, I miss, okay. okay. Uh, so the increased occlusion rates, the number of devices, smoking, C6 segment, and adjunctive coils were the main things that through looking at all the trials together were highlighted as uh, factors that can increase occlusion rates, um, whereas the other factors on top are really the things around persistence. I'm so sorry. So sorry. No, then no, no, no. I can change my question. How about smoking? <laughs> so smoking, of course, can increase occlusion rates, but um, in terms of safety, that's where you have the downside of the smoking in terms of increased rate, rates of uh, thromboembolic uh, complications and instant stenosis. So maybe it will smoke more thrombus and that more thrombus may lead to increase the uh, occlusion rate of the aneurysm. Pretty interesting. 
Not yeah. that we are advising anybody to smoke. But both, uh, both, both thrombus and endothelialization. So there's data like in terms of hyperendothelial response in, in smokers. So I think they both contribute for good or for bad. Um, one of the things that impressed me is uh, really like the, um, the, both the safety and the efficacy as shown in the premier trial. Um, that's really impressive. And uh, especially, you know, um, uh, at three years, you know, that's, uh, that's a number that uh, is certainly impressive. Um, anybody else? Otherwise, we have two, two questions from the, from the uh, audience. Um, Max, uh, uh, there's a, a question on uh, on uh, um, uh, neck. Uh, um, uh, someone says you mentioned neck metal coverage and endothelialization as key determinant uh, of occlusion. But how much does intraaneurysmal blood flow reduction and thrombosis contribute to occlusion? You want to try to answer? Uh, actually, I'm not sure we understand that very well. Um, we believe that endothelialization is necessary, but certainly in other like surgical, like true flow diversion, it's not always like, I think it's a complicated question. I don't spend too much time on it, but we like to see some changes in flow in the aneurysm, but I'm not, I don't know how to really directly um, translate that. Anybody else? I just want to remind that uh, fact that, yes, we like to see like a significant stagnation within the aneurysm, but when we see zero flow into the aneurysm, we are really concerned, right, uh, Max? Yes, yes, no, absolutely. Um, and that I think we'll get, that's a great point. Like we'll get into that when we talk about like large branch coverage, how important it is to have good antiplatelet coverage and not have like acute thrombosis on the device. Yeah, totally. And then there's a, another question, which is uh, what percent of neck metal density is required for endothelialization in braided stents? There are braided stents with 16 wires, such as the Leo and the Elvis Evo, which can be coiled through and have a flow diversion effect. Why are they not sufficient as flow diversion in uh, uh, isolation? That's interesting. I should take that. I think it's the same, like, it's also like, we don't really like what, what's sufficient for one is what is not sufficient for another. We really don't, un like, there's obviously tons we don't understand. This is one thing that we don't really know, like, would the same coverage be sufficient in one person with one endothelial sort of mechanism or propensity versus another? There's so many, like, we, we really don't understand it. And in fact, yes, like these low coverage braided devices are sufficient in some cases, right? It's just when we look in aggregate, the numbers are not so great. Um, Excellent. Um, um, there's actually a last question before we restart. Um, instant stenosis doesn't appear to be a major issue, especially with newer generation device. Do you agree? Um, and here I would like the involvement of uh, um, Dodi and Isil, who had as a uh, working in Europe, but they had the access to the newer generation device. So the person asking said that instant stenosis seems to be not a major issue with newer generation devices. Do you agree? Actually, uh, right. I myself, I do not agree that much, uh, especially uh, with the less, uh, how to say, uh, newer generation devices like Vantage uh, or uh, Silk Vista. Uh, I don't have numbers though. I'm just uh, talking on the impressions uh, that I'm uh, seeing uh, intimal hyperplasia in uh, those cases. So I do not really agree with this statement. What do you think, Dodi? The same. Um, we had very rarely intimal hyperplasia with the original uh, um, uh, flow diverters. Um, and the impression was that maybe it had something to do with when you do the control, the follow-up. Uh, it looks like it if you do it too early, you might find some intimal hyperplasia that you don't find anymore later on. So uh, our follow-up 
angiographic follow-up has always been at six months, and we very rarely saw any intimal hyperplasia, at least uh, uh, of some importance. Um, for people who did the, the follow-ups earlier on at three months or maybe two months, one month, there were there was like a more evident intimal hyperplasia that maybe it goes away if you just wait. And we know it does go away if you wait. So um, again, it, it was not a problem absolutely with the first generation. Now, as you will see from my presentation, we have kind of more uh, problems with the new generation uh, pro diverters, not only with hyperplasia, but with other issues. And uh, uh, so, yes, I'm, I, I certainly don't think we have moved forward in this uh, topic uh, with the new generation. Interesting. And hopefully later, also with uh, the engineer talk, we'll try to figure and understand, like, is there a reason, like, how the device are made that are causing this new problem? Um, thank you. Uh, Max, are you ready for the next talk? Um, Max now will uh, talk us about uh, F uh, flow diversion on label. Max, you're muted. Max, you're muted. Thank you. Yeah. No, I want to use this to like expand on some of the uh, points that I made in the earlier talk. Uh, okay. So, like on label, disclosures are the same, but the unlabel is different because the unlabel depends where you practice and we have an international audience. So I'll show you what unlabel is here, but that's not necessarily where you are. Um, so, you know, I want to talk about, like, we're not getting into the debate of what's dual and single and all of that, but I do want to, I'm just going to share you with, with, with you what we do, because I think a lot of people, frankly, are interested in, like, how, we, like, what's our pro protocol at NYU um, in terms of antiplatelets, like, discuss some interprocedural factors and, and so forth. But again, like, I want to, you know, like, you know, Carsago de Landa est, right? Optimal implantation and optimal neck coverage. Like, we talk about this again. Like, I think this is this is necessary, but not sufficient. We don't understand a lot about like how endothelialization varies from person to person. These factors are a little bit like more complex. What is the flow? Like, question of like, how about flow changes in the aneurysm? But the things that we can understand and I think the things that we can control are these. Um, and that's kind of like where we're going with this. Um, okay, so about a third of the aneurysms roughly are gonna be unlabeled in the United States, which is basically like ICA, you know, to the terminus. Um, um, you can read it over here um, in adults. Um, dual antiplatelets, just a couple of points. Like the whole dual antiplatelet, like it's really a euphemism for aspirin alone, right? Like. Nobody will argue that if you just like put somebody on an integral and drip, it's a single antiplatelet. It just happens to be extremely good, <laughs> right? Um, same thing with like, say, prasugil, longer acting than, the, um, for example, um, like, you know, whatever, Berlinta. Um, So like how we work with that, I think will remain, will continue to evolve. But um, what we do is we still do aspirin and clopidogrel for most like unlabeled cases. If the PRU is good, we really trust the PRU, we, we measure that. If the PRU numbers are good, which for me in my practice, I prefer to have lower PRU still like below 100, you know, um, there's no real answer to that scientifically like what's right, but this is my preference. Um, if the PRU is good, stay on Plavix or Clopidogrel. If not, you'll switch to Berlinta, for example, or baby aspirin. But I do think that is important. Like I believe that the shield technology, like surface modification, allows for more latitude in what is acceptable platelet inhibition. And that gets into issues of like how to manage uh, ruptured patients, which is off label, but um, sometimes. But like, so there is more latitude in terms of what we can do. And that allows, I think that that gives an increased margin of safety. Um, now, in terms of interprocedural considerations, so again, like, expanding on some other points in the previous lecture like what's important good measurements are important right like different machines have different um uh, protocols like in some machines like for example in the siemens machines usually 2d measurements 
are fairly reliable. Um, you can, um, didn't have a, put a slide in here, but you can always use um, like calibrated to like, a, like say if you know what is the diameter of your intermediate catheter, you can always check that, just like measure it, like see what that measures if you're not sure. See what that measures, and and you know, in, in in your machine, make sure that correlates to what the actual measurement is. And if not, you can just like use a simple ratio and adjust for that. Some machines are not well calibrated, um, and you might be off on your measurements, and that could be important. So measurements are essential because wall opposition is essential, right? Now, if you look at this simple case, small paraphthalmic aneurysm, right? Four point five by fourteen device. What can we expect? We can expect a slow opening of this particular like shield in this case. Um, why? Because that's how like a lot of four seven fives, four five uh, fives even more so. But this one, like if you look at this, a lot of you might have seen this. You know what what happens? Like why does it open like this? Like why is this the particular configuration? Okay, well like start thinking about it. Like imagine where the flaps are. Like the flap is invisible, but if you think about it, look at this distance. Look at this vector. You can imagine that the flap that might be somewhere up here potentially is still either hasn't come off or there's a vector here that doesn't allow this, the device to expand. Whereas down here, both because of how the vector is transmitted and because this flap might be down, already allows it to expand this way. So now you can start to think of like why a trumpeting might look like trumpeting or whatever, something like this. So again, like thinking about how that is. You see how much device has to be opened for in order for it to like finally start to pose the wall. That's a property that we have to deal with now. Now, once the device opens, you see that there is foreshortening. Well, no, like has to be built into how we think of devices, like where we position um, with respect to where we want to land the device, because we do want to have a good landing zone um, to allow for like secondary remodeling that we can get into as well. You see how that proceeds. As the device opens, you see like at the end, again, because of how the, like the math works out, it's in the last stages of it's like when it's almost completely opposed to the wall that it tends to move back the most. So you have to like have patience and not pull it back too early because thinking you're too far um, because it's, it, it's just when it's about to like be nominally open that it tends to foreshorten a little bit more than, than what you've seen before in the earlier stages. Okay, so some like fine points, okay? Now I say, okay, this is one device, here it is. You can see that the, the proximal end, you know, obviously is not opposed, that often happens like this. You can bump it, you know, when we go through with the with the phenom and so forth, so you could bump it up and oftentimes it'll look something like this. Now, if you look at this, and if you're uh, like, uh, how that transmits on your screen, but you can see that this is not perfect. Um, now here we recapture. Again, like here is an angio. <clears throat> We've taken out the phenom um, because we, you know, it's, you get a better picture and you don't need it there anymore um, because you have net, good net coverage. You look at this again, unsubtracted, like optimal evaluation, unsubtracted view, unsubtracted with contrast, right? And you can see right there. Right, just like before, I showed you, like in this other case, that it's not a pipeline. This is a pipe. You see, like not opposed. Can you leave it like this? Like, look, you have, you know, you got stasis. Okay, that's good. Um, but is this good? Is this optimal? Will it heal fine? Maybe, maybe not. But I wouldn't leave it like this. There's no issue with like doing this. Like, there's not. There's no. I don't think there's a penalty for doing a, a, a balloon. Um, angioplasty afterwards to make sure that it's optimally opposed. And so we do that and you see the difference. Like now you have good opposition, still have the stasis, fine. Like, so it's side by side. Look, look how much, look how much this is like, obviously an expansion in the, you know, increase in diameter associated like with the relationship it has to foreshorten in order to expand. This is what happens at both ends. You see, like if you see bony landmark, you see on both ends, this is what happens, but that is optimal expansion of the device. The reason it's like this now, is not because we supra maximally expanded it. It's because it wasn't opposed to the wall. That's why it was able to do this in the first place, right? Um, and that's important. Um, and now you see also conformability. You see how conformable it is like this, 
pipeline happens to like be very conformable. It's very important. Uh, you see how it allows it to like be like exactly opposed. Um, if you go back to this, you can see how there's no lip here. This is like, this looks quite good. Um, all of this um, can be like, so here's one of Aton's cases. Like when you have, when you do this and you combine, you know, understanding of how the, the implantation behaves and so forth, you can really like push it to the limit of like, say you have this parapsalmic. Now there happens to be a choroidal here, it's small. But if we want to treat this, you can achieve something like this. You can take this and ultimately like do good measurements and so forth. You're able to like create this construct. You're just under the terminus, right? The choroidal aneurysm is covered. Choroidal one device coverage is fine. Here we have two devices across the neck of the paraosalmic. And that's basically how um, the strategy um, here is um, using several devices to like achieve this coverage and this and that. And like, this is, you know, this is, this is the goal. This is the strategy that we had. This is how that works out. Now it's important. Again, when you look at imaging, when you're evaluating something like this, when you see, when I talked about the braid, how the braid is delicate, both at the proximal and the distal ends, that with, Manipulation of the, let's say, proximal braid, and we're pushing it forward with our like phenoms, like pushing it forward, getting it to open. You have to be careful about that. Like too much of anything is not good. Um, and so when you see something like this, it's like a case like that, right? You see these kinds of like these are platinum ones. Um, you see that there has been a, like a little bit of damage to the proximal braid, and you have something like that. It's impossible to see that on two D, like on DSA. You're not going to see that on DSA, but you're going to see that on the dime. Will is that okay? Will it heal fine? Yes, probably it's going to be fine. Will it contribute to like some stenosis? Like, is there going to be some like endothelium around here when you're coming back? Yes, likely there will be. Is it going to be clinically important? No, but this is again like something to think about because there can be degrees of this, and this can lead to like some of these uh, follow up imaging appearances that now we question like, why did that happen? So, here's another example. You know, like a well, look at look at how like good coverage across the device and so forth. But like when you look at these, when you do Dyna, again, you can see like these little things that um, you should pay attention to. Sometimes they can be made better by ballooning, sometimes not. Sometimes that requires placement of additional devices. A um, couple of more minutes. Yes, Eitan is okay. Uh, well, one minute, no more. Ah, okay, so in that case, well, some points about large device, large aneurysms. The important thing about large aneurysms is we have to have, um, we have to have good, uh, like a delivery system has to be good. We have to be able to do runs between deployments of devices, which we don't usually have to do for the small ones, but for these ones, it's important. You have to understand the neck. We have to understand the measurements like pancaking here, for example, flattening from the mass effect, all of that has to be understood. Sizing has to be understood. So like the sizes might be different from one dimension to another, how that plays into treatment. So like, if, let's say if we select a 4.5 millimeter device, because we want to be conservative, we can then measure what happens after one device, realize that we have control for some of that, over, like pancaking, some of that mass effect. The second device might be smaller in diameter than the first, because we know, we, again, we have measurements, so this is a four. And again, so like when you look at some of these advanced applications, um, looking at the results, um, we can maximize our utility. Let's stop here for the time's sake and let's have a discussion. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, we're just gonna have uh, like uh, two minutes break and um... Uh, we're going to reconnect actually um, for the next uh, talk, which uh, um, is going to be mine on uh, Usom in PCOM. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, welcome back after this short break. Um, I'm going to talk about the application of uh, flow diversion in uh, posterior communicating artery aneurysm. And um, uh, these are the um, the disclosure uh, important off-label use of uh, the pipeline device. So, 
to talk about this, I would like to remind three important concepts. First, the concept of the magic device, meaning that we know that this is a device that tend, tends to keep open what needs to stay open and closes what needs to stay closed. And this is the uh, seminal paper uh, for that in animal showing this concept with the uh, jailed artery in the aorta, treated the aorta remaining open after treatment. Other important concept, failures. What we discuss and what we understand is that often, like if the flow comes off from a branch that comes from the aneurysm, that will keep the aneurysm open. Something to keep in mind. Not always, but that can happen. And the third, the concept of vascular remodeling, meaning that uh, the vessel size and the flow are not static, but can change according to the demand and the local environment. And look, for example, this case, this is an ophthalmic aneurysm, just to express the concept, you have an ophthalmic aneurysm with the vessel coming from, from here. What happens is treated with a flow diverter here. And at follow-up, what happens, the ophthalmic is gone, the aneurysm is gone, and now the ophthalmic is here. So there is a new ophthalmic that was not uh, present before, was not visible before, that now fills the uh, ophthalmic integrally. What happened? It remodeled, the, the ophth this ophthalmic closed, and the other one filling from collateral now started to take over. These are the concepts important to understand the application of flow diversion all the time, but specifically in this talk about PICO mannerisms. Uh, let's, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna show this graph in the next few slides. So let's just get familiar with it. This is like essentially an axial view of the ICA with the, the PCOM and, uh, and the connection with the PCA and the P1, which is essentially like an axial, an axial view. So, um, you have this, uh, this, uh, uh ICA and uh, we're gonna put here a PICOM mannerism just to understand what can happen. And uh, the important he thing here is like to talk about the variance of the uh, of the PCOM size. You may not have a PCOM at all, um, PCOM absent. You may have a very, very small PCOM, or you may have a small PCOM. Those are three situations in which we believe that these are ideal for flow diversion. And uh, um, obviously, PCOM absent, I put it uh, in bracket because uh, um, because it it's, is it really like possible that to have not a PCOM at all? This is our, up up to discussion. But we're talking about a PCOM not visible, and this is an example of a patient with this uh, uh, ruptured PCOM aneurysm that uh, um, with a decent sized PCOM. Um, how is P1? P1 is actually bigger than the than the PCOM. And uh, the aneurysm is first uh, coiled and uh, there is a residual. Uh, this was a ruptured aneurysm. So this is how it looks like immediately after placement of a pipeline here, which still flow through the PCOM. And uh, this is a follow-up, two years follow-up. There's complete now aneurysm occlusion. There's also not integrate flow anymore through that PCOM. And now there is a PCOM filling retrogradely just to fill this sort of, uh, of, of perforator that we're coming from the PCOM and now with a complete aneurysm occlusion. What was indeed the perception of flow diversion for PCOM? In the earlier years, there was actually a few papers coming out saying that uh, it was not good. It uh, appeared to be ineffective, but also sort of like dangerous because it was limiting other treatment. Then more evidence started to come out, such, such as, for example, the SENT trial uh, uh, evidence more, more recently, um, showing uh, that uh, actually the, the effect, the efficacy was good. The safety was actually kind of a problem, but remember these were uh, large, uh, large patients, uh, large uh, aneurysms. One of the important things that came out of here is that uh, the patient in which the PICOM occluded uh, closed the, had no clinical sequelae, something to keep in mind that is really consistent with our experience as well. And uh, this other paper from uh, uh, Phoenix uh, came out also showing that there was actually quite some aneurysm occlusion uh, in a patient that were, they were treated with a fetal, uh, PC, fetal PCOM. Now, keep in mind here, the fetal PCOM is defined as any PCOM with caliber larger than the P1. And uh, uh, this concept of fetal PCOM not being good for flow diversion confirmed also in this more recent meta-analysis, um, while in other cases, you know, it showed how it's very effective. So the main question here, like when we talk about the application in here is, what is a fetal PCOM? It's actually not an easy question to answer if we look at, the, if we look at how it's defined in, in, the, in the literature. I give you these three examples, A, B, and C. Which one of these examples you define as a fetal PCOM? Okay, A, any PCOM which is just a tiny bit larger than the P1, is this a fetal PCOM? A PCOM that is large with a small P1, is this a fetal PCOM? While C, probably we all agree that to call this a fetal PCOM, which is essentially a terminal vessel without evidence of P1. 
Now it's important that to understand that uh, while uh, in in this case like this can be very good for flow diversion in which p1 is present even if we call it the fetal the flow diversion is likely to succeed even if may need staging in a situation like this this is where like we call it a true fetal peak where indeed uh, it's not favorable if you can still do it and i'll show in an example but these are the situation in which is not favorable and uh, for the reason for reasons that uh, we we described before in terms of uh, failure so you have a dominant PCOM, you put a flow diverter, what happens? It reduces in size, the aneurysm shrink, and then goes away. Example, very small P1 case. This is the large PCOM with the aneurysm, put a flow diverter, and uh, uh, what happens? This is how it looks initially. You barely see a P1, very small P1. Follow up, the aneurysm is gone. There's minimal undergrade filling into that PCOM and the P1 has grown and the aneurysm is gone. And the patient did not have any issue in terms of PCA territory. What happens if it's unchanged follow-up? Are we reducing our options? It's actually not true because there are other options. First of all, if it's still there at follow-up, you can add another stent. And that stent will maybe, maybe lead to increased uh, coverage and higher effectiveness. Other option, if uh, you still have the aneurysm at follow-up, what you can do, you can come from the back with a microcatheter and add coils. And the coils will actually shrink and uh, shrink the aneurysm and lead to occlusion. This is an example in which this was also a ruptured aneurysm, initially coiled with a very, very dominant PCOM. Okay. And uh, uh, what happens with a, in the small P1, as you see here on the left, and uh, we've flow diverted this, but still like it remains patent. It remains patent. It actually grew also a tiny bit. So uh, um, what what happened is that uh, um, what to do? How to do? What to do to fi to fix this aneurysm with still integrated flow in this pico? And the way is to come from the back and uh, go for the cure. And as you see here, we come from the back with a microcatheter uh, and we go to the aneurysm and we add coil and now we cure the aneurysm. We close the aneurysm. And now she's feeling completely like uh, the left PCA from the posterior circulation. Now there's another option. I don't have time to go through that, but another option that we applied in a, in a, in a good way, which is if you have these and that follow up, there's no uh, shrinkage. You can also add a flow diverter on the back, just occluding the what can be the integrate flow to the PCOM. And this is another option. This is the case, but I don't have time to show. And uh, um, so, what about the true fetal PCOM? True fetal PCOM, uh, is it possible to, to be successful? Yes, we tend to avoid, but it can be successful, as I'll show you in this case. These are, uh, uh, again, a previously ruptured aneurysm with a dominant uh, dominant fetal PCOM. And as you see from this image, there's zero P1, really. And uh, um, this is after the treatment, immediate tre post-treatment, two flow diverter, you see some stagnation. and uh, But still, like, no feeling from the back. And uh, at six months, there's still, like... Uh, feeling of the aneurysm and the PCOM and uh, uh but still like no no really feeling from the from the uh, posterior circulation and another stent is placed and immediately post now we start seeing like feeling of the PCA um which essentially at follow up one year later it led to complete occlusion of the aneurysm and now a complete like uh, undergrad feeling of that through the uh, through the PCA through the P1 without any clinical or imaging sequelae so this is a, what we call it a strategically staged flow diversion. You put first two, you reduce the flow, you add another one to complete the aneurysm occlusion, the aneurysm is completely gone. One thing about the technique, uh, an important thing about the PCOM aneurysm is when you can, if there is enough landing zone, uh, think about avoiding jailing the A1. Um, technically, maybe not absolutely straightforward with something you may gain with experience, but it's something that uh, is uh, worth uh, to uh, try. In this case, for example, like I'll show you the video. One important part of that, you need good support. And once after the, after initial opening, you really need to load, uh, uh, load the system and be able like to essentially deploy under appropriate push in order to limit the possibility of the stand to fold down. Um, 
In our last concept, how about covering the anterior choroidal artery? We know from uh, our and other people experience that it remains open the vast majority of the, of the times. And, but we still prefer to cover just with one stent um, when, uh, when possible. Um, and uh, this is an example of a previously ruptured picomanorism that we decide to put uh, to treat with uh, two, two stent. Um, and uh, these are the images posed in which uh, you, you can see some. So this is the previously coiled aneurysm, is the residual. And uh, obviously, as you see, like we try to avoid the terminus. And you see here the anterior choroidal artery also with probably a small aneurysm there. This is the aneurysm neck. And as you see here, there are two stands. This is one and this is two. So we double cover the, the aneurysm neck, but we single cover the part where the choroidal artery comes from. So single coverage of the anterior choroidal. To conclude, PCOM absent or very small, um, um, ideal for flow diversion. Dominant PCOM but P1 present, uh, flow diversion is uh, likely to succeed, may, may need staging. True fetal PCOM, not favorable, if it's possible to do, but these are the situations that are most likely to uh, not be ideal. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, times for discussion and question later. Um, so um, to follow this, there will be uh, Dr. Uh, Sachi uh, talk. Um, are you easy? Are you are you ready to share your screen? Yes, I am. I'm just yeah, okay. So while you do, I mean, uh, I'm gonna introduce you, okay? Okay, sure. All right. So um, uh, Dr. Sachi uh, has been a pioneer in the field. She has been practicing for, for many, many years uh, in, in neurointerventional um, in uh, Ankara first and uh, in Ankara all the time, but first at the Hasse Tepe University. Correct me if I if I pronounce it uh, wrong and now at the Koru Hospital. Uh -huh. um, she was the first uh, uh, woman to practice NeuroIR in Turkey and uh, she's uh, one of the organizers of the WLNC. Um, again, she's a pioneer. We know her like uh, among many, many other things for her incredible work on uh, AVM and uh, and to to being the, one of the first one to really like push the use of flow diversion in uh, in uh, uh, MC aneurysm together with uh, Saruhan uh, Sekirje. Um So here we cannot uh, let's uh, let's uh, go. Like I'm looking forward to hear from you, Isil. Uh, it's so kind of you, Aiton. It's always a pleasure to work with you at the MYU team. We always enjoy it. Uh, and uh, while being part of the PAF study, uh, Peter Kim was our proctor uh, at the beginning. So we always enjoy it. Um, and I'm going to uh, speak on the use of flow diverters uh, in MCA bifurcation aneurysms. Uh, and uh, the concept of uh, simplicity, which is the most ultimate sophistication in our understanding. Um, one of the most important revolutionary changes in aneurysm treatment created by flow diverters has been making the treatment possible for the aneurysms with an important vessel coming off the sac, which used to be the major limitation. Uh, for us, and uh, we describe a new aneurysm occlusion process called flow remodeling. I am uh, lucky that uh, Aiton and Maxim uh, were talking uh, before to uh, I actually describe these issues uh, very um, uh, uh, detailed way. Uh, but still, I would like to uh, show these images. Uh, to uh, say uh, what, to describe what I mean by remodeling. Uh, we first uh, recognized it in the sidewall aneurysms. Uh, uh, when there's a branch coming off the sac, when we place a uh, flow diverter, the depending on the flow demand, the uh, uh, sac disappears or gets occluded while the branch is uh, pre uh, patent, remained uh, patent. Uh, look at this anterior choroidal aneurysm. Uh, this beautiful reconstruction while the choroidal artery is uh, keeping its patency. Um, however, 
as uh, Aiton showed examples, uh, the results uh, are not always that ideal. This was a fetal PCOM with no P1 at all. And it was one of the very early cases, uh, the PCOM aneurysm that uh, we tried everything. And uh, th uh, thankfully, the flow diverters were introduced and we placed a pipeline in this particular case. And this is the three years image on this patient. So there is a slight enlargement at the origin of the PCOM because it is uh, continuing uh, through that aneurysm, uh, so to say. And however, it stayed stable for 10 years. So are we going to call this a failure or uh, is this acceptable? This is uh, actually what we call flow of remodeling, uh, that uh, there is filling, uh, but staying uh, stable uh, uh, throughout the uh, follow-up. Uh, so this paradigm shift actually uh, brought the uh, concept uh, which was brought in, uh, by the sidewall aneurysms actually inspired us in the treatment of complex MCA aneurysms. This is a very uh, classical example that I am showing. Uh, when you look at it like this, then it is very similar to that one. Uh, the MC aneurysm can be looked at like a like an MC uh, like a sidewall aneurysm with a branch coming off, and uh, we can consider flow diverter treatment in this regard. And this was one of the uh, very initial cases, although it took 18 months uh, to have this result. It's a beautiful result, very simple uh, treatment, one flow diverter only. And eventually we had this nice reconstruction with total occlusion of the aneurysm. Uh, is this reproducible? This was the uh, question at that time. Yes, this is reproducible uh, in our experience. And this simplicity let us expand our series after the initial cases. Uh, you don't have to deal with the branch coming off the sac, just flow diverter uh, placement and had this beautiful result. And it is a uh, simple, oops, sorry, let me move my uh, bar, upper bar, because it comes to uh, on my way. Um, anyway, okay, uh, so um, in this giant aneurysm or very large aneurysm, uh, we, it may have been a challenge, but even our fellow, uh, ex-fellow, just out of the uh, training, uh, she placed a device a flow diverter a pipeline, and this was the six-month control on this patient with no problem at all, two years control. And uh, the, these were the uh, eight-year control and geography on this particular patient. So... It brought uh, significant simplicity to the practice, actually. We used to do dual stent-assisted coiling in these complex aneurysms, difficult aneurysms. We enjoyed very much. Uh, we liked it very much. Published our results first with the uh, bigger stents. Uh, and it was very successful, made us uh, possible to treat such aneurysms. Uh, even with the uh, smaller profile stents, we could treat more difficult cases as well. So the question is, is placing a flow diverter in complex aneurysms that can be treated with conventional dual stent assisted treatment acceptable? Can we just place a flow diverter in the easier trunk? Could that be a good treatment option like in this one, for example? However, if we look at uh, the initial uh, case uh, album, the potpourri, uh, many of them, 
cannot even be considered for endovascular treatment, very challenging cases. Actually, these were not the cases that we were treating every day by endovascular means, but a flow diverter provided uh, good results uh, and actually simple results in these cases. Uh, it brought uh, very uh, uh, it brought the simplicity to the treatment. For example, this was a live conference case, uh, and the treatment was so straightforward. Uh, in uh, you know, very short time, uh, the uh, flow diverter was placed, and look at the result at one month CTA. I mean, the uh, bifurcation is reconstructed, slight enlargement at the origin of the jailed inferior trunk. And look at the eight month control. The aneurysm is gone. The uh, bifurcation is reconstructed very nicely. Two years control. This is according to our classification, class five, uh, uh, stable flow of remodeling. This is what we call. We do not call this total occlusion because there's not, we do not see a straight line. However, this is occlusion. This is occlusion. Uh, so the treatment concept or target needs to be understood. Uh, and uh, See the six-month control angiography. Uh, the aneurysm is gone, and uh, the uh, jailed branch is filling, and we see a very nice result. What do we do? Well, the uh, we uh, place the device in the a straight, non-dependent uh, trunk, easier trunk. Uh, we prefer. Uh, the straight trunk. And uh, this is the class one occlusion, which means keeping the branch coming off the uh, aneurysm or jailed uh, branch uh, still patent, and the aneurysm is totally occluded. And uh, these are the three years control CTA to show the patency uh, and uh, the stable occlusion of the aneurysm. How about uh, that one? Uh, two aneurysms uh, at bifurcation, uh, and we have seven months control, very nice result. However, it may not be always the case. Uh, this was a, for example, challenging case for any treatment, but with flow diverter, inferior trunk, uh, we placed the, the uh, flow diverter in the inferior trunk, and you see the one-year DSA, uh, the branch come uh, jailed is uh, got smaller uh, because of the lesser flow demand and jailing, uh, and this is class one B occlusion. If the, both trunks are relatively easy, then we prefer uh, uh, the straight one, the larger one. Uh, and in this case, it is the, the inferior trunk is larger. So this, uh, we prefer the inferior trunk and we align the flow diverter at the convexity, conform it. And we oversize systematically in such situations a quarter to half millimeter so that it will give time for remodeling. And uh, this is the one year control on this patient. Uh, jail branch is slightly smaller. The aneurysm is gone totally, so it's a 1B occlusion. And uh, this is the uh, control angio at one year. What if the both trunks are difficult? Then we choose the larger trunk, let the smaller one remodel, and six months control. The bifurcation is reconstructed very nicely, even at six months. I'm going to show other examples too. And uh, this is an example of so-called indirect flow of diversion. Uh, because we place the flow of diverter 
uh, and that the flow diverter is not actually uh, covering the neck of the aneurysm, which is on this branch. However, the flow diversion is good enough to be effective, and you see the result here. This is an extreme example of so-called indirect flow of diversion, case of Dr. Ishlak, uh, bifurcation aneurysm, the large one, uh, which is covered by the flow of diverter. However, there are other two aneurysms on the superior trunk, which was jailed, but the uh, neck of the aneurysms are not covered by the flow diverter. Despite that, at one year control, uh, the, uh, all the aneurysms are gone. The superior trunk is smaller than it used to be, which is class 1B occlusion. However, total occlusion of all three aneurysms due to flow change, flow remodeling. Most important issue at bifurcations or any aneurysms with a branch coming off with the flow diverter use, it is very, very, very crucial to have an effective and reliable anti-aggregation. Actually, this is why we use either Presugral or Ticagralor in all of our cases and in all of our cases of flow diverter, we use testing. With Prasugral, the resistance is very low, like 1% in our own community. Ticagrelor, it's around 4%. But despite that low numbers, we still do testing. It is very important because you jail a uh, branch or maybe more than one branch. So it is very important to avoid any thrombus formation, even not seen in the angio. And for this, we cannot... Uh, rely on clopidogrel. The uh, uh, initial publications on NCA use in flow diverter treatment are, some of them are positive, including ours, some of them are negative. Uh, this is why we ended up uh, doing a, a study together with Limoges Group with the same understanding and same protocol uh, with uh, emphasis uh, on the intensive and well-monitored anti-aggregation uh, with uh, new generation uh, drugs and proper technical management. Uh, and this is, uh, we published uh, uh, two centers together, 63 aneurysms, no mortality, 3.5, uh, 3.4 permanent neurologic deficit at discharge and only 1.7 uh, uh, MRS bigger than two at six months. Jail branch occlusion is around one fifth of each uh, cases. Uh, however, 3.2 symptomatic events uh, uh, overall, and uh, the um, occlusion rate is 68 at six months, but goes up to 95% at one year, even more in the more uh, longer period. The meta-analysis, because they put all studies together, so the uh, it doesn't look good in the meta-analysis because the studies are not homogeneous and the anti-aggregation is likely overlooked or ignored in many of the studies, not given enough importance. And in that meta-analysis, meta uh, it says that although uh, it is effective, the complication is not negligible, so it should be spared for uh, the cases otherwise uh, not treatable, which is not uh, our um, experience. And interestingly, uh, the uh, uh, meta-analysis from uh, Mayo Clinic comparing sidewall versus bifurcation aneurysms uh, with flow diverter treatment, they showed that uh, the bifurcation aneurysm results are not any worse than sidewall aneurysms, and the efficacy is not any worse than uh, sidewall aneurysms, to the belief of many uh, operators. Uh, for example, this case, 
it's uh, it can be treated with any any technique. We used flow diverter in that one. Maybe we we got lazy or got older that we wanted to have it done uh, in a short time. And two years control, beautiful reconstruction of the bifurcation. Uh, but uh, this branch is filling in a retrograde way. Uh, so we always do 3D to appreciate that because the flow, retrograde flow is sometimes too fast that you may not uh, understand in the 2Ds. Uh, the jet branch got occluded, but filling in a retrograde fashion very fast. But if you are treating aneurysms with clopidogrel, then please do not use it. Do not use uh, flow diverters in your bifurcation aneurysms if you are to use clopidogrel as an anti-aggregating drug because it is unreliable, not only because of its uh, relatively high resistance or low inhibition, but also because of its fluctuating effect. So uh, it is not reliable in such uh, delicate locations and delicate use. And another issue, we have to adapt ourselves uh, to understand the aneurysm occlusion in flow diverted treatment. It is not the same with intrasacular treatments. So this is uh, after flow diverter treatment, uh, and there is slight enlargement at the origin of the inferior trunk, which was jailed. So are we going to call this a failure? No, it is not. It is stable, and uh, this is called stable remodeling, which is class 5 occlusion, because it stays same. And we are not treating the pictures, but the patients. This is why actually we uh, proposed a new aneurysm occlusion classification so that it would describe uh, the treatment with flow diverters, flow modifiers in a better way, in a detailed way uh, with its implications for the future. And very recently, uh, Dr. Hanel uh, and ourselves, we modified the treatment to be more detailed. And uh, let's see some class five occlusions. For example, in this one, this part of filling is necessary to fill this jailed branches to continue the flow. And it stays uh, stable all through the uh, uh, follow-up. So, so are we going to call this a failure? It got smaller uh, significantly, and it is the part necessary to fill the branches. And this is the five-year CTA on this patient. Uh, this is 15 months. This is five-year CTA. This is class five remodeling. Are we going to call this failure? No, this is class five occlusion, stable remodeling. And flow remodeling may develop in a longer time uh, at bifurcations. Uh, we shouldn't get frustrated uh, with six month follow up or plan retreatment immediately. This is six months. This is clearly an aneurysm remnant. But at two years control, nice reconstruction, no filling of the aneurysm. And this is another extreme example. Uh, Dr. Ishlak waited for three and a half years to have this result at four years. Very nice occlusion with the branches patent but it took really long to be patient. And these are our uh, overall results, updated results uh, in uh, 179 aneurysms. We have one mortality in the uh, recent last year uh, due to spontaneous hematoma uh, removed from the uh, operation uh, area. Uh, Otherwise, uh, the procedure-related permanent neurologic deficit is 2.9 in this series, uh, and uh, retreatment is 2.2. Uh, still, uh, this means uh, not necessarily all aneurysms finish with one device. 
uh, and 63% uh, is the aneurysm occlusion at six months. This includes class fives as well. And 95% uh, at one year. And in, uh, importantly, none of the class five, which we called class five, stable flow remodeling showed regrowth. And we do not, we have not seen any aneurysm rupture during follow-up in this particular group. And lastly, I wanna uh, show this meta-analysis, which is very recent, published in August uh, from Cleveland. Uh, and uh, it is actually overall on bifurcation in reserves, but two thirds of uh, cases are at MCA bifurcation. Uh, and they uh, nicely uh, provided the results uh, at MCA separately as well. And uh, the, actually, the uh, numbers are not that bad, I would say. The complete occlusion rate uh, uh, and uh, uh, my criticisms are, number one, anti-aggregation is not taken into consideration like other meta-analyses. And they call only class one, uh, Ramura and uh, Okeli Marotta D as a complete occlusion. All the others are called failed, which shouldn't be because it is not an intrasacular treatment. So uh, a um, class two uh, with coiling is not the same thing uh, with a uh, stable remodeling. Uh, occlusion rates in flow diverted treatment increase. We know that from all kinds of uh, uh, trials and registries. So mean of 16 means you also include six months, seven months, eight months. So uh, it would not, uh, so the occlusion rate would likely be uh, increase uh, in the follow-up or long follow-up. So uh, it is not fair for the technique uh, to call uh, modest efficacy and unfavorable safety. They are uh, this, uh, discussing, com uh, in the discussion, they are comparing the, these numbers with other techniques like clipping, uh, web and stand assisted calling. Actually, the numbers are not that different from those that they found. And uh, uh, despite that, um, uh, uh, although uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, some points, uh, weak points in this uh, uh, study uh, in terms of interpretation and in terms of how the study is designed. So we basically, as a summary, place the device uh, it's simplify the treatment. We geometrically modify three models by time, but if we do not, uh, if there's still remaining after flow of remodeling, we wait and it may show a uh, good result, complete occlusion like in this one with the branch itself occluding or with the branches coming off getting smaller uh, like in this one, or there may be remaining filling, but it stays stable. It is the necessary part to fill the branch continuing. If it is, if if it stays same for years and years, then we don't need retreatment in such cases. That doesn't mean that there is no failure. There is failure. This patient presented dissecting MC aneurysm, presented with stroke. Uh, a flow diverter was placed elsewhere. And the one-year control showed uh, even bigger aneurysm. So we ended up, the patient referred to us, and we placed a pipeline device in this case within the first one. And this is the sixth month. So actually, it is not the technique that has failed, but it is us failing uh, to 
foresee how many flow diverters would be good, good enough for this sufficient slow remodeling effect. We cannot know in each case, as alluded before, as nicely shown before, uh, it is not possible to say uh, beforehand. So for MCA bifurcation, we put one device only and then wait long enough to see its full effect, unless the aneurysm gets bigger as in this uh, particular case, which is an you know exemption. So take home messages, uh, flow diverter treatment at MCA bifurcation aneurysm is, to, uh, the philosophy is to simplify the treatment. However, anti-aggregation should be done using new generation, more reliable drugs. And we, in our routine practice, uh, we give a single antiplatelet most of the time, either presugral or ticagral, or depending on the test result, we may add aspirin in the minority, but for a longer period of time, for example, a year, even sometimes longer, then switch to aspirin. And follow-up results, please be patient to wait enough to see the flow remodeling effect. Thank you for your patience uh, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Isil. Uh, this was a uh, fantastic. I mean, it's uh, obvious how you pioneered this uh, and uh, and you show us uh, like fantastic cases. Um, there's indeed, there are a lot of questions and we're running late, but in my view, honestly, it's more important to answer these questions. So, uh, let's uh, let's go through them. Um, okay. Um, let's start. So there's a there's a question about uh, how long you use dual antiplatelet. Do you use aspirin for life or withdraw after two years? From Rene Viso from Argentina. Actually, uh, as I said, it was the last slide, uh, but we use most of the time single antiplatelet which is either presugral or ticagral, or if the patient uh, uh, cannot use presugral for any reason, then ticagral or is our second choice. And uh, depending on the test result, it may be single. If uh, very high uh, response, then we do not even give uh, aspirin uh, uh, with those, uh, either of the, these drugs. We give at least for a year, and uh, we usually do, uh, a um, after gathering all these experiences, because we are not going to um, stop uh, giving uh, the potent anti-aggregating drugs, uh, we do not do DSA on six months uh, in the uh, recent years, but uh, do CTA uh, in six months and then do DSA at one year. And depending on the DSA result, uh, we usually stop presugral or ticagral or whichever and switch to aspirin. We give aspirin lifelong, depending on the patient's weight. It may even be a baby print like 81 milligram, but we do not stop all the way. We give aspirin lifelong. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, then there's, a, I see two questions that were answered to you by showing the last case in which there was a question of what do you do when a single device doesn't work? And, uh, you know, is, do you advocate additional device? And as you explained, you know, if the if it gets bigger, yeah, if the aneurysm gets, gets bigger or if the, uh, the uh, you know, if uh, the shape changes in a negative way, then we go ahead and do retreatment, which is putting additional device. Otherwise, if the aneurysm has positive uh, interval change, meaning getting smaller or the shape is uh, more rounded, not irregular anymore, then we wait. Okay. Uh, with uh, changing the medication, meaning after one year, we switch to aspirin. And most of the time, after we stop the potent anti uh, platelet, the aneurysm got occluded, gets occluded. Excellent. There's then two questions which are essentially are addressing the same thing, which is uh, um, the fact that, uh, you know, the occlusion rate uh, or complete occlusion rate of, uh, um, of you know, as per the meta-analysis, 75% or whatever we're going to call it. But uh, the fact that uh, 
you know, even if we're treating pitcher, uh, patients and not pitchers, uh, the, the fact that there is aneurysm residual uh, uh, can create concern in terms of to patients, right? And so uh, to worried patients, like, uh, is this considered a good outcome for the worried patient? It's considered a good outcome for the interventionist, but is this a good outcome for the worried patient? And uh, what do we say to the patient when we consent? Which, you know, this is essentially, you you address a lot of these things during during the talk, but you know, maybe we should change uh, our culture and and try to uh, our colleagues' culture and so forth. Well, what is your what is your answer to that? Well, we actually explain uh, all the uh, possibilities, meaning that additional treatment may be necessary. Uh, that they're going to use the anti-aggregating drugs at least for a year, which carries uh, a hematoma or hemorrhage in anywhere uh, in the body, in the brain, wherever. Uh, and uh, they need to uh, be very uh, keen on this uh, treatment, very uh, strict. And uh, well, in every treatment, there's always a risk of failure. Uh, and uh, actually, we are changing the anatomy. So uh, I do not specifically uh, explain all the anatomical issues that one branch may get smaller or may get bigger, whatever, but uh, explain it as a risk of stroke because of the, uh, you know, covering of the branch. But there is always risk of thromboembolic event in any kind of endovascular treatment at bifurcations. And to my understanding, uh, actually, if the anti-aggregation is uh, good enough uh, with the newer drugs, I mean, since 2013, we have not been using clopidogrel in any of our uh, flow diverter uh, treatments, sidewall or bifurcation. And I don't remember when was the last time that we have had thromboembolic event, uh, periprocedural uh, in the flow it's diverter treatments. Yeah, in the following weeks there happened to be, but not in the periprocedural area, uh, time actually. I mean, Excellent. a few days after the patient was sent home or a few, few maybe weeks they skip after, that door, but yeah, not we, whichever, back. I don't know. I, I mean, they always say we took the drug, so I'm not sure, but, uh, uh, but I mean, procedurally or during the procedure, I don't really remember when it was the last time. The... Um, Ethan, do we have more time or we need to uh well it's uh it's no we're delayed but you know these discussions are so so important that oh, you know and that there is a uh, question there is a you you want to ask a question go ahead yeah no i want I, and it's not really a question it's just uh something to say first of all Isil, this is this is just amazing i mean the uh the pioneering in this territory is just amazing what you did and it's extremely impressive in some of these cases are really magic for me, how it, you manage to completely, completely take out of these aneurysms that are so complex to treat. Um, I just want to say something. I really liked your uh, kind of uh, putting this MCA as if it's a PCOM when you turn the, uh, you turn the, um, the image and it became like a PCOM, became like an MCA. I really like that uh, slide. Um, but the main difference as I see it is obviously in the collateral potential, as my partner and my previous mentor, um, Dr. Shapiro, used to say, what is the collateral potential uh, that we look in these aneurysms when we treat them with pipelines? And so for the PCOM, obviously, there's great collateral potential because you have the P1 segment of the PCA that will provide flow uh, when you try to close these PCOM aneurysms. For the MCA, as you said before, we don't know the collateral potential. Sometimes there is good co collateral potential, sometimes not. But the collateral potential is complex in an MCA branch vessel because you need this, you know, PL to PL collaterals to come over. And then this takes me to the next issue, which is this kind of, as you call, um, flow remodeling, and then you have a residual aneurysm. We have to call it a residual aneurysm. I know that you call it remodeling, but it's a residual aneurysm, maybe, because there's no good collateral potential and still lots of flow 
goes through the aneurysm to provide flow into this jailed vessel. And so in a and then it takes me back to the PCOM. If we see this residual in a PCOM, we don't leave it as remodeling and now we don't need to re uh, to to treat again or to further address that or to say to the even just to say to the patient, you still have an aneurysm there. And in well, aneurysm, this MCA, we are not so sure that we can say it. So I just wanted to say that it's it. I really like the comparison and the putting them together, but I'm not sure that it's completely the same. No, no, I'm not saying that they are completely the same. I'm, I just, I'm just showing that what inspired us and how we consider at, at, considered at the beginning. I'm not saying that they are the same, number one. Number two, the, uh, I have a question for you then before I explain my view. Uh, what do you think about the anterior choroidal artery? Because anterior choroidal artery, uh, even, uh, you know, having a very transient uh, thrombus formation, you may end up uh, hem uh, hemiplegia, uh, permanent hemiplegia. And we put flow diverter uh, in anterior choroidal artery aneurysms, and uh, there's a chance of anterior choroidal artery to get occluded as well. This just, is... because, just because of a clot, not because of the demand, not because of low demand. Yes, That's... yes, absolutely, because of the clot and also yeah. because of the because of the flow as well, because you are uh, basically covering the origin of the anterior choroidal artery, which is much much smaller with the flow diverter, and on the other hand, you are covering or you are jailing a two three millimeter. Uh, superior or inferior trunk with the same flow diverter. So do you think that the risk is less with the anterior choroidal artery? No, I mean, it is not less to my understanding. I'm not talking but, about the risk. I'm not talking about the risk. I'm talking okay. about complete occlusion. But okay, yeah, complete occlusion. Okay, go back to anterior choroidal artery. So, what do you think uh, may happen if anterior choroidal artery gets occluded? You, you talk, when there's an anterior choroidal aneurysm, that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anterior choroidal flow, artery aneurysm, flow, and you treat with flow diverter, and the anterior cor choroidal <laughs> artery gets occluded. What will it's happen? A, it's a great question. I just think that the flow on the anterior choroidal artery is so so low that it will not keep an aneurysm open as compared to an MCA that has so much flow. And and obviously it will keep the aneurysm open as we can see in in, in yeah yeah but we are talking about at the moment the vessel occlusion and the ischemia no this was yeah. your question at the beginning it is the second part of your question so no I, I'm, no, no I didn't is... talk about ischemia I'm not I think that I'm not concerned about ischemia in the as you as you showed right you have minimal amount of, of ischemia in your cases. No, I think that's a great option in terms of ischemia. I think it's very safe what you did. Absolutely. I'm just talking okay. about the conclusion. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry for my misunderstanding. Then going back to the so-called residual aneurysm, there are cases, of course, I mean, 2.2 .2 is our retreatment rate. Uh, so there are there were cases in that 179 aneurysms that we put additional flow diverter. So as I said before, it is not the technique failed. It is us that we uh, do not know uh, for sure beforehand how many flow diverters would be good enough uh, for the aneurysm get occluded. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you really think that the ones that I showed uh, with flow remodeling, with the slight enlargement at the origin of the continuing branch, you call aneurysm remnant, are you? Or yes. are there other ones that are? To me, they are not. And in my, um, almost, it is 14 years now. And in 14 years, I have not seen a single case who, uh, had uh, either regrowth of that so-called stable remodeling or any rupture. So uh, are we treating the picture or are we treating the patient? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Make, we are me, treating lots of pictures, absolutely, because most of mm -hmm. our patients are asymptomatic and unfortunately we're treating pictures. Yes, in our profession here, I think that we treat lots of pictures. 
But, uh, uh, and I want to say that, uh, um, yes, I agree that um, it's difficult to assess these residuals, but from my standpoint, as I view this profession, it's either you got complete occlusion or there's no complete occlusion. Um, but okay. maybe, I'm, maybe I'm too strict, you know, with myself. Okay, um, okay. Going going back to other techniques. So, do you think that clipping is for sure a hundred percent occlusion? No. Do you think that web device is hundred percent occlusion? Do you think that balloon assisted coiling has? Uh, 100% occlusion. Do you think that stent assisted coiling has 100% occlusion? No, no, no. And so no. what is wrong with flow diverter in MCA then? No, I didn't say that it's wrong. I'm just this saying. Is, uh, this is phenomenal. Okay. Uh, no, the the so the so we are at the same side. I just okay. said that the definition for me, for me, okay. Okay. it's either, and for my patients, it's either complete occlusion or no complete occlusion. You can get complete occlusion with some options in some aneurysms, and you can get <laughs> don't very, not very useful uh, conversation. I think uh, for us and for everybody connected. I saw I saw Dodi like saying thing for the head. He wanted to say something. <laughs> Dodi, it's, it's, Dodi, uh, Dodi, we're gonna go forward. You're, uh, so otherwise, you're not gonna have, we're not gonna have time to listen to your experience. Uh, thank you so much, Isil. There's quite some question on the portal. If you can, uh, I'm going to give you the, the instruction how to answer them, maybe by writing. There has been obviously a lot of interest. Um, okay. Next is me talking about uh, ACOM uh, application. And uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm sharing my screen. You know, the concept here is similar, meaning that um, um, honestly, we can treat uh, Quite many, if like many, many aneurysm uh, of the anterior communicating uh, system with flow diversion and uh, conflict of interest the same as before. But it seems that the perception is actually like close to the one of the MCA in our community. I asked this poll on Twitter. And as you see, like uh, most of the people that answered, either they don't treat any aneurysm with flow diversion, ACOM aneurysm with flow diversion, or less than 10, the vast majority of the people, uh, less than 10%. While in our opinion, like many more of that can be handled. The reason why the anterior communicating artery complex is uh, um, quite different from uh, from other location is because of really like the embryology of how like the connection between the ACA can be very variable and uh, and as we see here and it's a really, really like an embryological reason and uh, and so you have you can have ACOM which may really look so different to one another but let's uh, let's uh, look at the evidence what is the evidence in terms of flow diversion for ACOM aneurysm uh, there's nothing uh, nothing prospective and there's three good series the Johns Hopkins the Bicetra experience the Milano Niguarda uh, experience and uh, three the all all three actually show quite some uh, high occlusion rate with uh, a a decent amount of uh, complication rate around 6%. Um the the important thing as the the group in Bicetter did is differentiating and understanding the different different kind of acom complex that we were uh, were dealing with. And uh, while they divide in four types in our opinion there's more like three kind of situation that you really have to consider. And uh, one in which you have codominant A1, one situation you have you have in which you have one side dominant with the other ones one smaller, and one situation in which you don't have it at all. Again, you don't see. It. Maybe there is. It's so attractive you don't see. It. But uh, this is essentially a white type is called, which you can think of is like going back to uh, uh, Doctor Sachi talk. Is this really look like an MCA? With the other one completely, uh, completely absent. So if we put aneurysms in these uh, in these sort of uh, drawings, uh, we can think that these two types with codominant and one dominant these are good for flow diversion. While this one, you know, it's possible, but maybe not ideal. Maybe yes. Now after listening to to Doctor Sachi talk, maybe those also can be ideal. Granted, certain features. So let's, uh, those are the ones that uh, we will discuss because this one again, like what are the options? You know, certainly there are options. Flow diversion, flow diverter where ipsilateral, contralateral, web, surgery, obviously, stand coiling and so forth. So let's concentrate on this kind of, uh, of situation. Like how is this possible to flow divert? It's possible to flow divert by putting a flow diverter A1 to A2 ipsilateral. Then if needed, second stage, then can be done in different ways as we will see. 
The main challenge to, in order to flow diverse such an aneurysm is to catheterize the distal A2 with the, with the 27 microcatheter. And keep in mind that as much as we have uh, uh, European uh, and uh, Asian and uh, uh, other uh, Latin American people connected, uh, you know, in, in the USA, the only FDA approved device uh, to use in a 21 microcatheter is the FRED device. And we don't have nothing for 17 so far. So what happens after we put a flow diverter here is that uh, the aneurysm shrink and the other one, uh, A1, it growth. And, you know, this concept of vascular remodeling, plasticity that we, we've been discussed quite a bit so far. And then the aneurysm goes away. This is an example of a dominant A1 with a, uh, with a large aneurysm supplying both uh, a, 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 A2 and you have a small A1 from the other side. So... What do we do? We put a, this is a max, max case. Uh, he put like a flow diverter here uh, across the RD ACOM and he also called the aneurysm at this time. And uh, what happened at follow up, now you start to see the inflow from the other side. You start to see the inflow from the other side. So there is now new washout that was not there before. This is how it was at the beginning. And uh, so the other A1 has grown. This is how it was before. And now it's at one year, has enlarged. It's filling the ACA territory without filling the aneurysm. Aneurysm occluded and uh, remodeling of the A1. Uh, this is another case. I'll skip through this, but same concept. So what to do? What to do when there's a codominant A1? What strategy are we gonna do? And the strategy, most of the time, in this kind of situation with an an with a codominant A1, is really like to put a flow diverter on each side. You can do it in one stage and see what happens, and then decide to put the other one. Or sometimes in in uh, in in uh, sorry in two stages and see what happens to do it later. Or in one stage, do both. And uh, this is an example of uh, this kind of situation. What we recommend not to do is this. So to do a crossing flow diverter. So we recommend against this technique. What we recommend to do instead is this one. We call it the H-pipe, extremely effective approach. And uh, this is an example um, of, uh, of this kind of treatment, flow diverter on each side and uh, the aneurysm completely gone and the filling of the each side of the ACA from each side of the ICA. Another example here, like uh, uh, quite a large A1 on each side, and uh, this is the follow-up, complete uh, aneurysm occlusion with preserved flow to the ACA. And when you see the baseline, this is how the aneurysm look like. And uh, at six months, the aneurysm is gone. And uh, um, sp specifically, I wanted to show no coded infarct. And we noticed not really like this, uh, this to happen to us. It has been noted in other, in other groups uh, that also put calling as well. And I think that's a, that's a difference in, in terms of uh, this, uh, this approach. Technique, I want to talk about techniques that are very important for these. Uh, first, uh, the first one I want to talk about is the, uh, uh, the, the problem with the wire. The typical problem uh, of this catheterization is that you go with a 14 wire and you try to follow with the microcatheter and what happens, it's hard to get through. And the reason is that the 14 wire doesn't give enough, uh, enough support. And this really like something that came up came to uh, solve this problem is the Aristotle 24 wire, which is a very thick wire with a minimal ledge with a 27 wire. It's very soft, so the catheterization is safe, but then it allows to follow much easier with the microcatheter and go up. And then once the microcatheter go up, obviously like the, the, the treatment becomes much easier. And this is an example of this. So this is the, the catheterization with the 24 wire. And uh, you see once the wire goes up, um, once the wire goes up, then, uh, the uh, the microcatheter would follow very smoothly uh, at this stage without evidence of a ledge. How about the use of a body wire? Uh, the use of a body wire has been something has been used uh, sometimes for for this A one when it's not uh, when it's not possible. But in this case, I'm showing you is uh, to show you this uh, complex residual after coiling in which it was very hard actually to gain the A two, and I couldn't do it with the with the twenty four wire, and I had to go around the world in this case with a with a twelve fourteen wire. But even with the twelve fourteen there, I couldn't really follow with the microcatheter. So I was in this situation and needed more. Support support and what I can do there, I can put another wire, which is the body wire. In this case, I put the, an eight wire and you see here trying to help the catheterization. And uh, uh, even actually with both wires, uh, you really need much, much more support. And if anything, I had actually like to eventually like to turn around to be able to catheterize. But once there, the case became very uh, obvious and straightforward because at that point, you know, I had just to deploy the pipeline with uh, um, a very good result. 
Another point about the technique, the size of the device. Uh, in terms of, uh, if we think about pipeline, that's easy, meaning that uh, the diameter essentially almost 100% of the time uh, is uh, that you have to use a 2.5 millimeter diameter. How about the length? In terms of length, we recommend not to use too short. The 10 may tend up to be too short. We recommend really most of the time is the 12 of the 14, because keep in mind, you have to think about the geometry in 3D. And here there's a lot of uh, loss of length in the at the level of the aneurysm neck in both ax as frontal and the axial sort of like perspective. So really like you don't want to be too long because you don't want to be the, to the ICA, but be careful of not being too short. And then last thing about ruptured aneurysm. This is such an effective treatment for ruptured aneurysm because knowing how you can fix the completely the problem by putting a pipe, if you have even a very complex aneurysm such as this one, what we do, we do the plug and pipe. We plug the aneurysm very simply and very safely, and then we will follow uh, uh, to, with the pipe, uh, time to flow diversion. One month later, we put the flow diverter and uh, we cured the aneurysm with, yes, two procedures, but each one like uh, done in a safely uh, environment. To conclude, flow diversion for ACON can be extremely effective and safe. And again, the understanding of the device, the vascular remodeling concept, and uh, in this case, also the techniques are paramount. Thank you very much. So, um, Dodi, are you there? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, good. Um, now, um, are you ready to share your screen? No, because you're going to give me the screen and uh, I will yes. manage it from here. Well, not me, Nick. Nick, are you ready while, while I introduce Dodi? Okay. All right, thank you. So uh, for whoever doesn't know uh, Eduardo Dodi Boccardi, um, he has made the history of more intervention. Um, whoever goes to conference um, have had the privilege to he listening to his uh, 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 to his uh, not frequent but very on point comments, um, and that tells us a lot about him, about uh, his uh, how smart he is, his spirit, his experience, and uh, which really makes him one of the leader in uh, Nuro IR. Um, he has. Uh, he he had all his career in Milan at uh, Niguarda Hospital, and he really experienced all three revolutions. I would say you you maybe Dodi will add uh, more to that, but I think the main three revolution he experienced is the coiling ex uh, revolution, the flow diversion revolution, and the thrombectomy revolution. And so we ask him to talk to us how his experience with flow diversion evolved since the beginning. He was there from the beginning up to now. Thank you, Dodi. Um, eager to well, listen. Uh, thank you for, very much for the introduction. Um, as a primitive human being, I very like bananas, and so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, of course, now I'm retired, um, and uh, my conflicts are no more money-related, but probably the fact that I adore flow diverters. Um, and I will explain you why by going through, you know, a little bit of history. So flow diverters, where do they come from? Let's bring back some memories. Um, after the cards arrived in the 90s, the endovascular treatment of aneurysms became the first option almost everywhere. But recanalization was an obvious problem, especially in the eyes of neurosurgeons who didn't like it. And maybe also some, uh, I've seen uh, uh, Eretz also not liking residual aneurysms. So coils proved to be unable to obtain stable results in large aneurysms with large necks and in difficult to treat complex aneurysms, which means uh, mostly fusiform, serpentine, blister, giant, partially thrombosed, etc. So since the beginning, we would have preferred to fix the vessel rather than fill the hole. And at the turn of the century, my presentation started with these slides about the difference between clips and coils. So if you are a surgeon uh, and you treat an aneurysm, uh, you, before you see the aneurysm and uh, you don't like it, so then you clip it and you restore normal anatomy. 
the surgeon sees the aneurysm like a head with the neck. So the neck is uh, the part of the aneurysm, and he puts a, a clip on the neck. He strangles, he or she strangles the neck, and that kills the aneurysm, of course. It's like hanging somebody. You're going to kill him. When we started, and this is one of our first cases in April 1993, well, uh, you have a very large aneurysm and you start placing coils, and we were so happy. We had completely filled the aneurysm with coils, but at the six months follow-up, oh, it was recanalized. And so we filled it again, very happy, and then six months, oh, again, recanalized. And two years later, we would have the rupture. Uh, so, what happens with endovascular treatments of aneurysms? We don't see really a neck. What we see is a hole in the vessel, which looks like a mouth. And we start filling the mouth with coils, which look like spaghetti. So finally, what we do is to feed the aneurysm. And the more we feed it, the more it will enlarge and it will grow, it will be happy. So we are not going to kill the aneurysm by coiling it. Um, so we started to think that based on the favorable experience with dissecting pseudoaneurysm of the carotid in the neck, we might have started to use stents. But which stents? Well, at the time, we only had coronary balloon expandable stents. And this is one of our first cases in 1999, 42-year-old lady with a subarachnoid hemorrhage for, due to this uh, um, dissecting aneurysm of the basilar of the vertebral artery, and we placed a Nicomed sequence stent, which is a coronary balloon expandable stent, and also Gilles and all the people from uh, from Turkey, they know very well the use of, of balloon <laughs> expandable stents. And we had, so maybe you can see the stent here. We placed the stent, and after one year, well, uh, it's still there but it is a little bit smaller and we had no hemorrhages. So it was kind of promising. We, this is the right way to go. We should perfection this. And so after some time in the early 2000s, I was heard saying in, 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 in Congresses in 2002, stands for the treatment of aneurysms. What do we need? Well, we need an intravascular device capable of excluding the aneurysms from the arterial circulation. Would be better if we could stay in the vessel without entering the aneurysm, if the whole disease part of the vessel wall were repaired, and if all the normal branches or perforators were spared. Uh, we need a safe, non-traumatic procedure with everything under control. That means a self-expandable stent because the coronary balloon expandable stent were a little bit risky. We could rupture the vessel. Um, low friction, smooth progression, retrievable, resheatable, well fixed, no movements, safety wire inside. Does that sound familiar with something we have today? So coronary stents were good, but aneurysms were not completely cured. So we moved to covered stents, the so-called graft. So the first case we did in, in the year 2000, we used the, the Yomed Abbott uh, Geostent Graft Master, but then also the Cardiovas cover stent came, which was a little bit less stiff. And in 2007, I presented our experience with cover stents in intracranial arteries, which were 30 patients. And this was the fir very first one, which convinced us of the of the of how good they were. 29 year old with the paresis of the left six, uh, cranial nerve. You can see a horrible giant aneurysm in Petrus bone. Uh, we were able to go through the uh, aneurysm into this normal carotid artery and that, with the envoy six French catheter. And that was needed to place this very uh, stiff stance. And this is the stent right in there. And we opened it. We took a deep breath, and then we look at the result immediate, immediately after, and this was what we saw. So a perfect looking, wonderful artery, the no more aneurysm of no uh, type. 
So this was before one year follow up, four years follow up. You can see the stent there. And we could see also that uh, in this situation, the bone could regrow uh, uh, because, of course, there is no more endurance. So you even uh, uh, have the possibility to go back to normalize uh, the bones. So my conclusions in 2007 were cover stents are a very effective device. Interventions are technically very challenging because of the stiffness of the device. So we certainly need neurovascular covered stents. Why? Well, what are the theoretical advantages? No need to enter the aneurysm. No need to fill the aneurysm, which can therefore deflate. Reconstruction of an arterial channel. Immediate and persistent cure. Saves the cost of many coils. Does that sound, sound familiar with what we have today? And so... A year later was the birth of flow diverters. And the very first case of flow diverter uh, in Niguarda was the 2 October of 2008. Uh, Peter Kim Nelson was proctoring. We were very happy to have him with us. And this was a 30-year-old lady, the classical good indication for a flow diverter, which means a carotid ophthalmic uh, uh, aneurysm. And these were the stands placed two uh, pipelines at, at follow-up, no more aneurysm, perfect artery, before and after, wow. The first wow in a very long series of wows. From then on, we could only say, wow, every case we did. So that was the second revolution after cause for the treatment of aneurysms. We can treat simply and effectively aneurysms that before were not treatable, no matter how. Aneurysms not only are occluded, they disappear. After cases like this one, where you have this uh, very large aneurysm at the origin of the pica, you place flow diverters and two year follow up, the aneurysm just disappeared and the pica is still there. So I began to call these devices, I've heard magic devices. I called them intelligent devices because they occlude what needs to be occluded and they leave open what needs to remain open. So immediately we stopped to use normal bare non-flow diverter stents. The stent and coiling technique went to almost zero. If we had to use a stent, it would be a flow diverter. With these results, very soon we started to treat all sorts of difficult aneurysm. Proximal aneurysm, like for example this one with a pipeline and a result of six months, or this one, in, of course, all the intracavernous aneurysms, uh, six months follow up. And we go up a little bit to paraclinoid aneurysm. This is a case of bilateral mirror aneurysms, this, the two aneurysms, uh, right and left. And uh, I showed this case also to show how at the beginning we just placed a few coils. We just, we did not fill the entire aneurysm. And this, you can see the shrinking of the aneurysm with all the coils that come down and uh, lie on the flow diverter. We started to call this the sleeping coils. They lie on, uh, on the flow diverter, like on the bed, uh, sleeping coils. And uh, this is the left one. And in this case, we didn't even place even uh, any coil, and but the result was beautiful anyway. So this was before and we, this was after. Wow. And then we went up to distal. Uh, this girl who presented with an ischemia and the basaganga had really this di horrible dissecting aneurysm. And uh, we could place a flow diverter there. And at six months, we had a beautiful result. Wow. More distal, we could go into the uh, pericalosal artery. This again, the dissecting uh, uh, aneurysm, uh, ruptured aneurysm of a branch of the uh, pericalosal artery. And there we placed the flow diverter. And uh, of course, six months follow up was 
resolution of the aneurysm, but more importantly, the artery is still there, as uh, Ezeal was showing before. Um, so the dissecting were a really perfect uh, target for a uh, flow diverter. Mm, this is a, a very large aneurysm of the posterior cerebral artery. You can see it there. Uh, and by placing a couple of, of pipelines, the uh, re six months follow up just showed uh, the complete exclusion of the aneurysm, but more importantly, the deflation of the sac, which is the most important thing. So if the aneurysm start to shrink, well, that's the cure. We don't have any doubt about that. So the shrinking of the aneurysm follow up became the proof of the cure of the aneurysm. We have never seen uh, a an aneurysm that rebled after it showed a reduction of its volume. I don't know if anybody has seen that, but I I don't think there there is any of that. And then we went to bifurcation. Of course, I don't want to show this because uh, Igil already showed, but we did that also. Uh, and uh, at follow up the eight months, beautiful result. And then blister, and then ruptured or unruptured, and then with branches arising from the sac. Again, I'm saying things which have already been said. This was an interesting case with perforators coming off from the dome of the aneurysm. Look at that. And by placing flow diverter at the six months follow up shows that the uh, sac goes down, but the perforators remain just you know, with a, with a little channel through the remaining part of the aneurysm. This is absolutely beautiful. And in one case, even a giant venous pseudoaneurysm of the cavernous sinus uh, complex case, ehlers Danslow's disease. I don't know if uh, Aitan wants to show this later, but uh, it's an incredible a giant pseudoaneurysm 20 years later after we treated the carotid cavernous, cavernous fistula 20 years before. And this is a, the, the giant tumor-like uh, aneurysm in the head of this poor boy, which now he's an old, a, a grown man. And by placing uh, three pipelines uh, at, at the level of the petrous carotid, this was the aneurysm before. And this is... Uh, Three years later, it just deflated to almost nothing. So, of course, we have had complications, very new and difficult to explain complications. Uh, the rupture of an ruptured aneurysm in the immediate period after the procedure. This is something we have not seen before with uh, other treatments, or at least very rarely. And so we started to use adjunctive uh, coils uh, good or bad, right or wrong, we still don't know. Um, and this was the first case where we understood that aneurysms that had never ruptured could rupture after flow diversion. So this was a horrible looking uh, uh, giant aneurysm of the basilar artery. Um, and we placed one pipeline. I think today some people would fill it with coils or place many more pipelines. But at the time we didn't know it yet. And so uh, the CT immediately passed uh, and pre-discharge showed the thrombosis inside the aneurysm. The, the lady was okay, but three weeks later, she had uh, the bleeding, of course, of the aneurysm. So since then, we uh, started to place coils in uh, large and giant aneurysm. But another complication that we had not seen before was the delayed appearance of intraparenchymal hemorrhages. Uh, which prompted the thorough flushing of the device before inserting. Uh, this was the case, uh, the, one of our first cases in October 2008, where the CT immediate post-treatment was perfect, but uh, um, before discharge, we did another CT because she was uh, uh, she just had headaches, and this is what we saw, so a hemorrhage. Uh, in, in the frontal region, very far away from the aneurysm. Um, but the complication rate was more than acceptable in view of the special high-risk kind of aneurysm we were treating. Um, and it looks as though these unusual complications have diminished over time. I'm not sure about that, but I think they have diminished. So uh, 
To prove the revolutionary efficacy of flow diverters, I started to make people play a little game. Where was the aneurysm? So I show in a, 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 an image and I ask, where was the aneurysm? To show how uh, with flow diverters, not only you don't see anymore the energy, but you don't really know where it was because you cannot say because it's such a beautiful image. Uh, the, the anatomy is so normal. So this was the energy before. And you can see before and after at six months. This is a perfect image of a normal carotid artery. And of course, again, you can see the shrinking of the aneurysm over time. Where was the aneurysm in, in this case? You just look at the image. You're not really sure where it was, uh, but it was here. And, and you can see at one here, at one year, I'm sorry, how beautiful it is. No, a completely normal appearance of a vessel. And the uh, aneurysm has shrunk and there's a fi it's fibrotic now. It is a scar. It is a dead aneurysm. It will not recanalize. This case I already presented to you before, but it, maybe you don't remember. Where was the aneurysm here? There. Before and a follow-up. Before and follow-up. So this is an intelligent device. Where was the aneurysm here? One, two, three. There. You say, oh, this is small. Yeah, oh, no, I'm sorry. The aneurysm is that big. It's a giant aneurysm of the bifurcation, and you can see also the change in position of the uh, flow diverter before at, at six months. It just deflated. And in this case, well, you, I just showed it before, the dissecting aneurysm. And here, where was the aneurysm? One, two, three, there. You cannot tell just by looking at the image uh, of the, of the follow-up. This was a ruptured aneurysm, dissecting probably of the A2 segment. We placed the flow diverter there. And uh, the six months follow up is just beautiful. So the extraordinary results started to continue to accumulate. How else could we treat these aneurysms? So the, if you have this aneurysm here, how can you treat it? Well, of course, you have surgery can have some options, not easy. Stent and coiling, well, maybe, but if you have to put a stent, you can well use a flow diverter. And just by using, in this case, it was a Silk Vista baby, you see uh, the, flow uh, uh, the flow diverter there and the six months follow up. The pica is sane and healthy and the uh, energy is gone. Uh, this is just to show that there are no uh, problems in the in the cerebellum. And this case, see how big this is. This neck is. Uh, no other treatment is possible rather than place a flow diverter. You place a pipeline there, and at six months, the aneurysm is gone. And uh, uh, this was before, and you already see the shrinking of the aneurysm at six months. This is a horrible looking aneurysm, giant aneurysm that compresses the medulla here. Of course, she has she's symptomatic and there is edema also. You how can you treat that? Well, you just place flow diverters. It at one year, no more symptoms, of course, and everything is gone. And look how it is shrunk. The shrinking of the aneurysm is uh, very important. Effusive for aneurysm with the origin of the ophthalmic artery there. You can occlude everything and have the ophthalmic coming from another side, as uh, Aiton showed, but you can also have uh, this incredible result with the uh, aneurysm that is gone and the ophthalmic artery is still there, same as before. So in spite of the fantastic results, we have not fallen into the trap of treating aneurysms which should not be treated, which means small incidental aneurysms, in my mind. All our cases were 10 millimeter or more, with few exceptions. All difficult to cure with other techniques. So what happened next? Uh, I don't know, how much time do we have, uh, Aiton? 
No, please go ahead. Okay. So what happened next? I think we are close to the end. So we started to address the need to reduce the impact of dual antiplatelet therapy. Unfortunately, the first experiences were not fortunate, and it looks uh, that uh, as today, we still do not have a real solution in my mind. This was the very first case where we used the surface modified stent. We placed it in this way in from the middle serratory to the internal carotid, and at the follow-up, we had a major, major uh, is intrastent uh, hyperplasia. Um, we thought it should be less, and uh, this is what we found. So not unlucky. Uh, and, and then many op operators complained of the difficulty of the procedure and asked for simpler devices. Uh, so new devices were born, and so we are at the last generation of flow diverters, uh, of which I'm not very happy. Uh, but they are easier to place, more, but they are more stiff and less respect to the natural shape of the vessel because they are more stiff. So the follow-ups results are not that good. And I already showed uh, these cases uh, a couple of Valdezers ago. So when deployed, they look good. But at the six months follow-up, the, there is the unhappy discovery. I show you a few cases of the ones we have seen. This is a silk Vista baby. When I placed it, it was like this. I liked it. But then a follow up, you can see how it inflated in the middle, it straightened, and it gave a fish mouse on both ends. Um, and if you look at the uh, uh, angiography, you see that a follow up, we have a stenosis here at the level of the uh, proximal fish mouse. Um, another case where we placed the flow diverter to cover both these entries, we were, uh, we thought we were very bright and smart in doing that. Uh, look at this beautiful placement of this flow diverter that cover just one flow diverter for two aneurysms. Uh, but that six months follow up showed a very ugly. Uh, situation here again for the same reason uh inflation of inside the aneurysm and uh, uh fish mouth uh, proximal and distal look at the difference between how i left it and how it became this is again horrible uh when i uh, we placed it it was like this a six months follow-up see how say how it changed from how i left it to how it was six months later. Another one, the change from uh, the original and the six months follow up. This is the, how I left it originally, and this is how I found it six months later. So new devices have been designed following the complaints on behavior of old devices especially in the, in the desire for immediate, full, and precise opening of the device. But so far, they do not behave as well, in my experience. Original flow diverters were already so good that I have not yet witnessed major improvements. So my conclusions are that there is still work to do, and I will be around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dodi. Uh, thank you. That's uh, that's fantastic. That's um, that's exactly what uh, I was hoping, you know, to to learn uh, and listen from you when I when I when we thought about having you talk to us about the experience, how these uh, how these evolved um, over the years and the challenges and uh, how that. Uh, uh, led to you know this um as you mentioned with the to to these new devices that uh you know it's uh almost feels like we're lucky we don't have them yet um um by hearing not only your experience but uh, many other uh, experiences um we're open for uh, discussion um we are we have a few minutes to discuss um Erez, uh, Isil, uh, Bree, Max, uh, please uh, 
uh, uh, turn on your microphone and uh, go ahead. Easel, go ahead. Uh, one comment for the ACOM location. Uh, uh, with the 27 microcatheter, uh, we usually do not go primarily with 27 microcatheter for the ACOM aneurysms. Usually we catheterize with 17 microcatheter. Uh, if it is uh, really too difficult, the angles, we may even uh, prefer uh, Hedway Duo double marker O016, uh, which uh, t takes uh, 14 guide wire. Uh, and we go all the way to uh, distal pericolosal or whatever, so that uh, when we get there with the microcatheter, we put exchange wire and we go over the exchange wire. Uh, that uh, was for our coronaries uh, better than uh, primary actually navigation. And of course, we put the guiding catheter or intermediate catheter in general, I would say, very high, even going to A1, uh, so that we have a good support uh, for the micro catheter. Uh, that was the thing that I wanted to say. And actually, we uh, worry about shortening very much. And uh, I personally cannot uh, dare to use 12 uh, millimeter, actually. It is uh, too short for my uh, practice. I, uh, I don't feel comfortable. I usually select uh, longer. Uh, the shortest is 14 that I use in the ACOM region. Um, thank you, Isil. Uh, those are excellent uh, comments. And uh, um, in terms of like the catheterization, I guess that's another way, honestly. Like uh, um, I would say in our practice, as I tried to mention, the presence of the, the availability of a 24 wire made, made a huge difference. It really like uh, because um, it's actually very soft. I mean, it sounds 24, so it sounds big and dangerous, but it's, it's distal is very soft. So once actually, once we catheterize distally with a 24, um, um, actually like the, the 27 follows so easily that, uh, you know, once you try that, it really makes it uh, uh, unnecessary to think about a, an exchange. But it's really like it's good to hear, uh, you know, you're mentioning just another another reason, uh, another way to... to yeah, to, uh, we don't to have that wire, yeah. No, don't I know. Have I have Aristotle, uh, I so know. I don't have any experience with that. Yes. So, <laughs> no, I know, and uh, but that's why it's good to hear your experience as well. But you know, that's uh, that's uh, very good. And in terms of the length, yes, I you know we're essentially we're we're saying the same thing. Um, in terms of like something to be careful about there is not to lose length and going. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, like it's important like to keep that have that in mind. Thinking three D, not only on one. On one plane, the direction seems very, very, very uh, short, but actually like the length of A1 to the mid A2 is really longer than usual. And, uh, you know, 14 is actually an excellent length and uh, never had a problem with that. So uh, I think that's good. Obviously, one thing to be careful is that not to be too long than to fall into the, the, the terminals. That's that's bad, but we're sharing the yeah. same the same concept. Yeah. Dodi, um... This was an incredible talk, you know, I've heard you so many times and every time it's just, again, it's, and it's so important that you give this talk, so please don't stop. Um, I just want to have a, a quick question about the uh, Silk Vista baby that, as you know, we uh, have minimal amount of experience here. Um, do you think that these changes of the caliber of this uh, um, devices is because you have, you're going to a more a smaller vessel, smaller caliber vessels, then you have more spasm maybe that you can't uh, really see. And then the changes in the, uh, because of the spasm, it, or do you think it's something else? I really think it's something else. Uh, not only the Vista baby, but all the uh, third uh, generation uh, flow diverters there are, uh, they behave uh, like uh, um, a change in the shape of the vessel. So they want to be themselves, and they don't adapt to the to the vessel itself. So and that what's so they are more rigid. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that over time they will tend to uh, uh, to to do different things. If they have the possibility to expand, 
they will. So every time there is a, a, a neck of the aneurysm, they will tend to enter the aneurysm. But by doing that, they will enlarge. By enlarging, they will shorten. By shortening, they will do something on the distal and proximal part of, of the uh, of the device itself. So I don't know if that happens the next day, the next week, the next month, because I see them only at six months. So I really don't know. But they do. And all of them, I mean, the uh, Evolve, uh, the Vantage, uh, the Vista Mom and Baby, um, the Rivo. Uh, so they all do that because they are more uh, are designed in order to open more, uh, um, in, in more importantly, more, more with more effect, immediate effect. Of, so they really want to open compared yeah. to uh, the old pipeline, the shield. Uh, so uh, for me, that's that's not good, and uh, it, uh, we have seen that those changes in more than half of the cases, wow. and uh, that is also um, you can see that if you do a, a, an angiogram, of course, because if you look at uh, follow-ups only with MR, you you will not see it. You will only see uh, the aneurysm has disappeared. It's cured. They are happy. The patients are okay. There are no clinical events. So everything is good unless you look at the angiography. So maybe who cares? I don't know. But I, <laughs> I really don't like it. Yeah. But I so think the, so the, there are yeah. actually two questions uh, about this. Uh, first is like, how do you address this failure? Like, okay, what do you do? You just use the older device or... Uh, Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> but of course, you cannot do that in cases where you, you have already used the, the the new ones. So I tend to uh, to 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 use only the older ones, and uh, I really force the um, the companies to look back uh, into that and to be uh, sure that they want to keep the production of the old devices before. Uh, being sure that the new ones are behaving well, because otherwise uh, we are not having. So uh, we are losing something which works well, uh, and uh, that would be a major disadvantage. Just and just, just to emphasize again, like uh, for the audience, just to be clear, like all of this, like especially when we talk about MCAs, when we talk about ACOMs, like these kinds of applications, they're very device specific. Like we're talking about pipeline, like because this is where the vast like, majority of experience is, right? Not that another device wouldn't necessarily work, but this is the one that does. So if we were to go to something else, like it's not, they're not really interchangeable for reasons that Dodi showed, but like for others as well, like in terms of how they're designed. So it's very important that like this, this is the device in which this data lives, um, if you're gonna try. And, um, um, um... So, start, yeah, go ahead. Isil wanted to say something. Oh, Isil, go ahead. Yeah, I cannot agree uh, more with the first Todi and Maxim as well. And regarding what Maxim says, yes, my entire experience with MCA is with pipeline. Perhaps one or two Fred Jr., but uh, and one or two uh, uh, silk uh, vista baby, but other than that, all pipeline because pipeline conforms well, and I do not really con I cannot consider more than forty eight wires in MCA. I would feel more uncomfortable for sure, and uh, because the conformation is very very good. Uh, there is less dead space. It is very important to conform well with the uh, curvatures uh, to avoid any uh, thrombus or emboli, emboli formation. So uh, I didn't mention that before, but Maxim alluded it very nicely. Yes, I mean, MCA and uh, territory is, uh, our experience is kind of actually uh, very specific. Excellent. Uh, uh, Dodi, uh, one of the questions was about this, was uh, this this failure of or these problems with the newer devices. Could oversizing solve the problem of late expansion? What do you think? No, on the contrary, because if we think that it 
it's due to the fact that the device will herniate inside the uh, neck of the aneurysm. It will do it more if it's oversized. The only thing that could happen, that could um, help, is to have it very long, uh, uh, distant from the neck of the energy, so that it would be kind of kept be kept in place more by the uh, two ends, uh, and and that maybe is a solution of the problem. But even that, uh, we have seen also that these devices will change the curves of the vessel and uh, when there, if they are close to a curve they will tend to go straight because they are rigid they will not follow the curve so part of the stent would be easily will remain inside the vessel rather than be well opposed to the vessel wall um the, the, i think i i think it's mostly the rigidity of, it's like a throw so the the old pipe uh, the flow diverters I called them like socks. They would be a socker that that you could just place it well around the wall of the aneurysm of, of the vessel. Now they are more like straws, uh, and they they are more rigid and kind of stay where they don't care about the vessel. But of course, maybe the engineer will help us. Yeah, exactly. This is exactly what happens. That the engineer may be, help us in understand because I, I don't have the 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 competent the um, uh, to explain exactly what happens. Uh, but the sensation is really that uh, the the more it's rigid, the more uh, this happens. Um, uh, so oversizing, I don't think it helps. Uh, on the other, on the contrary, maybe uh, undersizing is a little bit better with new devices. I think that. Yeah, you have the experience, but I wonder. Like this picture is probably what what you're talking about. Yeah, um, this, this was an ex accentuated picture for the pipeline version. Now with stiffer devices, this is going to be more. This is what you're saying. It has everything in there. The arm, this yeah. and that. Um. Anyway, um, does anyone have any uh, rich experience with the Vantage, and did you find it to be much stiffer than the Shield, especially with that sixty-four braid version? It's for me. Yes. <laughs> or yes. for anyone who may have uh, already been using the van. Yeah, I, I I haven't used it a lot because uh, at a certain point I retired. But <laughs> before that, uh, I tried it. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I said, no, thank you. I want the old one. Um, uh, th th it's very rigid. And this also... Um, uh, may may uh, happen that you, once you are deploying it, we we were talking this morning, uh, and Maxine was showing how you should compact it, the the flow diverter, shorten it in order to uh, well oppose it to the vessel wall. Now this is what we want to have: you shorten it. So you start to deploy it, and then at a certain point you kind of push it from from the from the back. If you do that with these new devices, it will not open more. You will just uh, push the whole thing forward, like a tube, like a straw. It will not open. It will just go forward the whole thing. And I'm talking I've, this I've seen uh, absolutely with the Evolve, but also with the Vantage. So uh, all the, uh, the, the 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 opening and the deployment of these new devices is not as it with the old ones and, and they, they the representative they will tell you you should not do what you used to do with the old uh, devices because these are not as soft as as, as push them uh, like like before but the, uh, you just deploy them um, more or less where you are and you hope that it will they will hope open the best they can um, so this is, I don't know, I don't like it <laughs> again, because I, I, I need to control everything I do, but, and, and they, they open, but not perfectly well. And so maybe there is more use of balloon afterwards and uh, with the risks of balloon and so on. Um, I, I, and the, the final result may be very good. And then you have to wait for the six months follow-up. And maybe the six months follow-up is not as good as you hoped it would be when you left the, when you deployed it yeah 
Last question I see from the audience. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's from you because you didn't show many distal flow diverter, but the question is, if you have an experience in your surgeon, why should we expose the patient to distal flow diversion with its complication and lifelong antiplatelet treatment? Um, I guess it could be for uh, both uh, Easel and, uh, and uh, uh, Dodi, and maybe for me as well. Um, uh, who, who wants uh, to start? Gil, go ahead. Okay. I have a question for the one who is asking this question. Anonymous. We don't know. We don't know. No, no, no. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. But just for the purpose of discussion, actually, uh, because this is always, you know, an asked question. But on the other hand, uh, nobody wants to have their skull opened up. I mean, no surgery is any easier, I would say, number one. Number two, regarding the complications for the distal aneurysm, so to say, uh, if, uh, you know, um, you play uh, according to the rules or taking certain things into considerations, the complications are not that high to avoid a an endovascular procedure, but to send it to uh, open surgery, unless the patient has an hematoma, you know, associated with it, this is a different story, of course. But otherwise, I think <clears throat> if the operator is um, experienced enough, then endovascular treatment is not any more dangerous or any less effective than surgery, I would say. For us, uh, we, we we have a very good uh, cooperation with uh, uh, our neurosurgeon, uh, who is uh, probably one of the best vascular neurosurgeons in Italy. So we are very lucky to to collaborate with with uh, with him and with his group. So we we always work together. We always decide together what to do uh, on every single case. And um, uh, so the cases we did were the cases he where we decided together as a group as a, as a team that they were uh, best treated with uh, uh, endovascular technique rather than the surgical technique but we have plenty of cases that were surgically managed and plenty of cases that were managed as a team uh, surgeons does a bypass we occlude the aneurysm blah, 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 you know all these things so no there is no risk of uh, and not having a, a, a good cooperation with the, with the surgeons in our in our group. Yeah, and <clears throat> thank you. And the same same for us uh, here. Uh, uh, honestly, as you see, Doctor Nosek, uh, vascular neurosurgeon, uh, connected here, and uh, you know we always discuss, and uh, we're it's good to be always on the same page. Um, Next, uh, we're, I'm going to uh, have to finish this discussion. I'm going to have to give the final talk of the morning session. It's about uh, complications. Um, I kept it for the end. So maybe people is like la uh, tired for going for the break and is not going to see the complication. Um, let me share the PowerPoint. Um, here it is. Um, so um, complications of flow diverters. Um, Um, I'm going to talk about the complication going about the timing. When do they happen? Before, uh, during, or, or post-procedures? And uh, uh, as uh, Bree showed us, you know, the complication rate really goes uh, between like a very, very single digit number up to 17%, depending on the series you see. But uh, uh, when you put them like sort of like in a graph, there's an interesting sort of seems like a, a correlation between the aneurysm size of the of the series and the and the complication rate. Except there are two outliers, I would say. One is the intraped, which show us quite a relatively higher complication rate with a smaller kind of aneurysm. And one of the reasons is probably it was like about the earlier experience, really, like people was learning how to use these different uh, catheters and device. And the other outlier is really the premier trial with an impressively low complication rate, but it also has like a, a low, uh, very small uh, uh, aneurysm, average aneurysm size. So we can really about thinking about this sort of like uh, graph of like that correlation between the two. Now, complications start before the intervention. This is uh, a patient of mine, 70 years old, new onset of ophthalmoplegia, this uh, large uh, 
or giant, uh, uh aneurysm partially thrombosed and uh, uh, coming to to our uh, our place. And you see, like here, the the large uh, aneurysm. We do the angiogram, and uh, after this angiogram, we decide to to treat the day after. And uh, uh, the day after, just before the treatment, uh, while in the hospital, uh, loaded, yes, but uh, uh, we didn't do anything else. Uh, she collapsed in the bathroom, and uh, um, obviously, we she she had a rupture. Few lessons from this. One of which, first of all, you know, cavernous aneurysm do rupture. If uh, they're big, if they perforate the dura, they 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 can rupture and cause a subarachnoid hemorrhage. That's certainly one of the lessons. And um and uh, so so you know, keep in mind, you know, the complication can start even before you do the case. How about interprocedural complications? Uh, I'm going to go through some cases. This is a, a patient also with a symptomatic cavernous aneurysm, but very hard arch and. Uh, and the treatment is done successfully, but as you see, like after the treatment, uh, uh, we notice like a, a, an embolus in the in an M2 uh, post pipeline, and uh, this is uh, quite a few years ago. And uh, at that time, we didn't have the newer d devices that we have today. So the attempted thrombectomy was done at that time with a mind frame capture, which turned out to be not a very good device for this kind of uh, of uh, recanalization, and we, indeed we were not able to open it. And not only, like after the treatment, after waking the patient up, we notice quite some amount of uh, contrast in that location that two hours later or one hour later, like increase even more. So that uh, prompted uh, to bring back and uh, occlude the vessel, occlude the vessel, which was uh, damaged from the attempted thrombectomy and had uh, uh, continuous uh, extravasation. So this is an example of a um, relatively bad outcome because of this. Lesson, bad arch, uh, higher risk, no question. So something to keep in mind, something that the radial approach may have improved in certain situations. And doing a thrombectomy in a patient on dual antiplatelet, you know, think twice. You know, certainly now the devices are better, but it's something that uh, you, 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 a procedure that can add, uh, add a, a, a hemorrhagic complication in someone who's having uh, an ischemic complication. How about intraprocedural occlusion of jail branches? Uh, you know, we heard from... Uh, 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 Dr. Sach about like the importance in these situations, like to be like very like to to have a very active like uh, sort of antiplatelet regimen, um, and and in in our case is an example in which that happened. We treated this pericalosal aneurysm, and you see this jail branch. And after treatment, yes, the aneurysm is gone. Something that, as Ares was saying, is something that you shouldn't see. You shouldn't see completely go away the aneurysm immediately. And as you see, also the other branch is uh, is now occluded, and something that you treat on the table. You have to notice this, obviously, and uh, and you treat on the table with uh, integralin, aptifibatide, with uh, um, now the vessel filling. So for this or in situation of higher thrombosis risk, we we like to to wait uh, um, at least like thirty minutes from the implant. That you know, by the time you get the final and so forth, it doesn't seem it's not that long, and it's certainly like in this situation, it's better to uh, to be uh, to be sure. Um, how about early post-procedural complication? Aneurysm rupture, there was one case in PAFs and one other case of a basilar that uh, Dr. Nelson uh, will show later today. Um, I'll show about a case about stent separation in a, a patient coming in with a, with a stroke, an MCA occlusion related to a, a, a dissection of the ICA. Um, we recanalize the, uh, I recanalize the MCA. I take responsibility for this complication. Um, recanalize the MCA. And then I noticed that essentially like the whole, uh, the whole ICA was, uh, was dissected. But what I noticed is that the wire seemed to be in the true lumen. So I really wanted to take advantage of this situation to reconstruct this vessel. You see here how really like the wire was in the true lumen. So I said, okay, this is the time to reconstruct this vessel. Otherwise, then it's going to be much harder later. And uh, and so I did it with um, pipeline devices, so multiple uh, overlapping pipeline devices. And um, and this was uh, the final. I was uh, very happy, you know, complete recanalization in the brain, reconstruction of the vessel. But despite this, what happened is that later the patient had uh, a worsening and by repeating a CTA, you know, we we found out that the, the, the stents separated. This is the image from the dynas, intraoperative dynas CT showing the separation of the stents and something that can be very, is very, very challenging because passing through the separate stent is actually very challenging. This is the video of that, uh, that uh, successful attempt after many, many unsuccessful uh, attempts before this. And then after that, obviously the, the treatment was, uh, was obvious, meaning like creating more overlap between the devices. And uh, this is the final result. The patient ended up, ended up doing very well, but 
this uh, led us to, and, and, and I mean, we already knew that, but certainly like we, we need significant overlap for telescope construct, especially in a location like this, where there is quite some uh, mobility, uh, obviously like in the neck. How about early stent thrombosis? Um, early stent thrombosis can be relatively benign. In this case of a 45 year old woman with a P12 of 120, like we treated this with a, a pipeline device and uh, um, feeling of the of the ophthalmic right after. But two hours later, like uh, she started to have some droop, uh, noticed actually by the nurse, and we brought her back. And uh, you see, like the ophthalmic is slow. There's now some instant thrombosis, and uh, treated with uh, at that time Reopro. Today we use we would use Integralin, but uh, complete resolution and the patient did uh, perfectly normal. But um, Sometimes uh, these early stent thrombosis can be malignant. In this other case, with a relatively good P2Y12, nothing added, 155, a very, um, very simple treatment, um, finished at uh, noon, um, good appearance of the of the stent right after, and the patient wakes up normal. We get the routine post-op CT at 1 p.m. and as you see, like everything looks good and clinically, the patient looks good. Now at 2 p.m. the patient worsens. Now at that time, you know, there was no really ICU. There was a slow recognition of the syndrome. So really like the stroke code ended up being called at 4 p.m. But we're still talking about a few hours later. And uh, and uh, we get that repeat CT at that time. And here it is, you already see a completed infarct. It's just a few hours. and. Obviously, we understand that it's about collaterals. This patient doesn't have collaterals. And, uh, you know, as much as uh, uh, this is uh, relatively early, it's not early enough for him. We reopened this completely with a very good recanalization this time. But regardless, this patient did very poorly. And uh, really, like, uh, uh, since then, you know, you can, everybody can will have their own uh, decision. But really, a P2Y12 around uh, 150, we, we like to add Integralin and then switch to Brilinta upon awakening. But the concept is that, you know, these are uh, uh, like th there's no enough uh, enough of being careful about the uh, antiplatelet uh, antiplatelet uh, um, uh, like coverage and and precision with that. Um, this is another example: patient with uh, this P2Y12 199 switched to Brilinta now with a good P2Y12. This PCOM residual PCOM uh, post coiling treated with a, a flow diverter, very very simple treatment. Patient wakes up well, did well. Six days later. She did not take Brilinta for two days. And uh, guess what? She ended up having a full MCA syndrome. The stent now is closed, comes in for an acute thrombectomy that we perform and successfully. And uh, and the patient is actually decently from this, but really like this leads us to, to like the concept of like patient counseling is never enough. You know, as much as, you know, and uh, in, um, you, you know, they, uh, you, you're going to tell the patient, but like really repeat it twice or even more many times. Like the, this is a paramount, a paramount concept. The patient has to understand if they don't take the antiplater, they're going to have a stroke. How about delayed complications? Uh, I'm going to go through some of these and uh, uh, retinal ischemic issues. W there was one case in PAP, so really not, not a common, uh, not a common uh, uh, experience there. While um, in, there are some series in which their retinal ischemic complication rate, rate was up to 40% in these series from, uh, from France. And, uh, um, but what the, the interesting part I would say about this, uh, this, uh, this uh, paper is really they notice how that happened, especially in the situation A or B. And uh, uh, this is a case of mine of uh, that kind of situation. You have the aneurysm, you have the ophthalmic coming from the aneurysm. And uh, uh, this is what, what happens is that uh, this patient did very well, but uh, seven days later um, had blurry vision in a superior aspect of the left eye. And this is the, uh, the spot in which uh, she had essentially an ischemia. She completely recovered from this, but really like uh, uh, what is important in this situation, when you can predict this to be a risk based on how the aneurysm looked like, it's important to really explain the specific risk to the patient. And, you know, depending on the patient's really preference, you know, they may want to take this risk, even if low or not. How about delayed interparenchymal hemorrhage? We heard already from Dodi how this used to be like a much common situation, 2.5% as per this, uh, per this uh, uh, series, uh, meta-analysis, um, much lower now. Why is much low? This is an example, you know, the treatment, like uh, uh, no, and everything look look good after. And then you see this large hemorrhage uh, in this case a few days later. 
Uh, why is that? Why we don't see this anymore? It's for many, maybe different reasons. Certainly, like it's about the technique, it's about the embola, it's about the flashing. Maybe the reason. Um, it's uh, is it, could it be also about foreign body for, uh, from the from the from the co- uh, the the hydrophilic coating? Maybe because we also at that at the same time, maybe a little later, we also notice this uh, this sort of like problems that uh, very very few patients really like. It's a very rare complication to have, but some patient may develop. Uh, foreign body uh, um, sort of like emboli granulomatous reaction, which look like terrible on on MRI, look like a a complete hemisphere is edematous with all this enhancing lesion. But what we know is that these are the situations that may be controlled with steroids, may recur, uh, may recur causing like a lot of problem how to handle these patients, but like these uh, uh, tend to be controlled with steroids, really like confirming that it is a granulomatous reaction. And this is a confirmation on a pathology specimen showing the hydrophilic coating uh, um, surrounded by this uh, granulomatous reaction. And uh, this is a paper from uh, from Max in which uh, there was a series of patients that were uh, evaluated very thoroughly. Um, we don't do we see that again we should see this very rarely there was pro- it seems like it's something we see a little more rare than before could it be also put together with the reason why there were more hemorrhages um certainly in some of the hemorrhages the, it was demonstrated the presence of this foreign body emboli so this is uh, all food for thought fish mounting we call we talked about it uh, quite a bit uh, i'm gonna show you a case in this uh, patient treated with a um a, a, a construct of uh uh, uh, a laser cat stent and a flow diverter all the way to here. This is the follow-up. The follow-up showing like uh, now this stent, it's not uh, how it was left and it looks uh, it looks uh, quite uh, uh, fish mouth here and uh, at the level of the carotid. And uh, this is uh, an example in which uh, because it was a hemo- hemodynamic, this stenosis, we um, we treated with uh, a, a precise stent and this is the, the final result, which looked very good. And uh, to finish, I'm going to show uh, this case of a severe intimal hyperplasia. If a patient treated for this MCA aneurysm, looked very good at the end, no no problem with the stand, how it was placed, and the follow-up, a few, actually not a follow-up, patient comes back three months later with left-sided weakness, and this is the appearance, very severe stenosis of the M1 um, with hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamic issue, and this was treated, uh, this is how it looks like, and this was treated with uh, uh, an eMERGE uh, uh, balloon. Um, um, mild intimal hyperplasia is very frequent, but intimal hyperplasia resulting in, in this stenosis is actually extremely rare, especially again with uh, the older, older, um, older stand. To conclude, um, uh, by looking at the, at the papers and our experience, you know, it's certainly obvious how the amount of problem we have with uh, flow diversion is much less over the years. We improved a lot in the last 15 years. Still, like you can think about if you want to think of a number like that 5% complication rate is uh, seems to be like an average between like very small aneurysm, larger aneurysm and so forth. And, uh, you know, think about complication happening in every stage of your treatment, pre-procedure, inter-procedure and so forth. Thank you. And uh, I open for the last uh, uh, last uh, sort of like uh, discussion or a question for just a minute or, or two uh, before we go for a lunch break. Thank you all. Um, thank you. Uh, Isil Sachi, Dodi Boccardi, Brie Chancellor, Maxim, uh, and Erez for participating in this uh, this uh, morning uh, session. Um, there is a uh, there are two questions. Uh, uh, there is actually one question for me. The question is: It seems like older devices uh, that don't move forward with manipulation are better for large on label ICA, and newer ones better for off label MCA. Actually, um, um, I would say I. I don't know, um, you know, and uh, uh, I don't know. The question is for me, but actually I don't have experience with these newer devices. So um, I would like to open this question to the rest, but we're really running late. We need the half hour of break um, and uh, uh, before the afternoon question uh, session. So unless you have a last very fast comment, anybody? I mean, the, so for the MCAs, it's really the pipeline. So it's the older device, quote unquote, that is being used now. So. 
we, we talked about. All right, excellent. I'll see you all at uh, exactly half an hour from now, 1230. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending where you are. And uh, uh, welcome back. Um, we had a rich morning. We talked about uh, a lot of things, applications, uh, the properties of the device. We heard uh, um, different uh, different guest speakers. Uh, the, the, the talks will, were, have been recorded and will be available for uh, in a, one week from now. It will be available for a month or so for uh, all the registrants. So if you miss something... You know, you're going to be able to look at them later. Um, it's my pleasure now as a first talk in the afternoon to introduce uh, Professor Peter Kim Nelson. He's a, um, um, for those of you who don't know, he um, has been uh, uh, quite a key uh, person in the uh, development of uh, um, f uh, the flow, the, the pipeline flow diverter. Um, and uh, uh, he uh, just a little bit uh, introduction on him. He he's uh, uh, originally uh, he's, uh, he's graduating in radiology from the um, Mallinckrodt Institute in uh, uh, Washington University in uh, St. Louis, and he came to New York to do uh, to do the fellowship in neurointerventional uh, uh, with um, uh, Alex Bernstein in um, 1991. Uh, after that, he came back and continued to be an attending here at NYU. And since then, he has been um, here at the NYU and uh, he he uh, uh, trained uh, generations of uh, interventionalists. And I'm lucky, lucky enough to say that uh, uh, I've been one of them. And uh, um, without uh, without more, because he's going to talk us about the history of flow diversion. Uh, please, uh, um, um, Kim, please go ahead and uh, share your screen and uh, start uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eitan. Um, well, it was fantastic uh, listening to the talks this morning, uh, particularly uh, um, uh, Dr. Picardi's uh, initials. It, it reminds me of, very fondly of uh, times we shared in the past uh, as this was uh, developing as a technology. So the question is, like, uh, how did flow diversion get started and what was its impact in terms of endoluminal reconstruction? And I prefer, frankly, endoluminal reconstruction, mostly because of where I came at this uh, problem from. Um, you know, it has picked up uh, the sort of the lexicon of flow diversion, and that's basically how people refer to it. But I think it's important to kind of remind ourselves that essentially what we're trying to do is reconstruct a diseased vessel segment. Uh, so there are many ways um, to begin thinking about treating aneurysms. And over the course of the last 50 years, there have been a lot of technologies. What they all have in common, though, basically, is an attempt to improve the natural history of the disease. And they want to do that um, at best uh, by sort of an uneventful um, circulatory exclusion of the animals. So if I take myself back, if I take us all back to when I started my fellowship, essentially what interventionalists could do uh, was based on balloon technologies. And so this was like a patient with a large cavernous aneurysm, Cranial neuropathies comes in. You can see the cross-sectional imaging, the angiography. And essentially, where the collateral circulation would uh, afford it, we essentially would deconstruct the vessel. So we would occlude the aneurysm and the, the uh, parent vessel that the um, aneurysm arose from. Um, things, by the time I had started my fellowship in 91, had gotten a little bit more sophisticated. People were attempting to do uh, reconstructive procedures with balloons, but essentially, all, a lot of the embolic materials that were used in aneurysm therapy were either deconstruction or reconstructive uh, therapies with balloon. And like evolution, time marches on uh, by natural selection. Where you did not have a good collateral circulation, as in this particular kind of uh, case, uh, we would deconstruct the vessel after doing a bypass. Uh, and this is just showing the surgical bypass that was done before coil embolization and occlusion of the proximal basilar trunk. In 1991, things changed, and uh, that was essentially with the release and, of the Guglielmi detachable coils to a select number of centers. Uh, and this essentially revolutionized 
the endovascular approach to aneurysms in two fundamental ways. Firstly, with other tools that had been developed to deploy the devices, uh, it showed that we could safely access aneurysms and that once we were in the aneurysm, we could do something um, effective um, that was uh, therapeutic. Uh, so the coils um, were essentially were validated by a number of studies. First, the ISAT, and then later the BRAT uh, trial that uh, more or less recapitulated the results of the ISAT. Uh, and then for unruptured aneurysms, there were meta-analyses of the various literature over time that established its uh, utility in that space. Uh, nevertheless, there was always, uh, from the very early stages, the beginning of an understanding of the inadequacies of coils, and particularly in coils where you either had large size of uh, the fundus or in aneurysms with a large neck. And this is just the classic case. I think this case, this aneurysm had been treated two or three times. And here you see its recurrence uh, before it was referred for uh, flow diversion treatment. But basically, the bottom of the aneurysm has opened up. The coils have been plastered along the dome. And you can see the cross-sectional effects of that as the aneurysm grows you have this mass effect on the brain. So it's not just ruptures that we're talking about. For massive aneurysms, we're talking about neurologic sequelae of the um, impact of the mass. And in this particular case, it had to do with vision. So this, I'm going to throw in a, a Turkish word because um, for Ishil's sake, um, this essentially can be distilled down to an unhappiness, an unhappiness with a situation where things are not as good as you had hoped. Um, and that there could possibly be better ways. So initially, there were two responses to the inadequacy of coil. Uh, firstly, were to change the coils, to make them uh, more suitable for packing, to coat them with materials that might uh, facilitate healing. Um, and then secondarily, there were assist techniques that developed. Jacques Moret initially published in the mid-1990s a balloon remodeling technique, which I think uh, transformed sort of the coil space, uh, at least as far as we were concerned, and then later stent-assisted coil. Um, none of them really, in terms of like the bioactive coils or the hydrogel-coated coils or fiber coils, none of them had a definitive uh, improvement on the situation. Um, the techniques, the assist techniques, however, did kind of uh, give us um, some better therapy, uh, therapeutic approaches, but it also informed us more as to the dilemma that we faced. And this was just a particular kind of large aneurysm, ophthalmic segment aneurysm, that I had done a number of years ago. Um, this is looking down the barrel of the, of the balloon, and so you can see how it's essentially enabling us to reconstruct the neck of the aneurysm with coils. And then when you deflate the balloon, you can see the dilemma comes from essentially the, the, the extent of the parent vessel that's involved with the aneurysm neck. And so this really kind of gives us some understanding. This was all before we had fancy three-dimensional imaging. So the balloon itself um, gave us some insight into uh, the problem uh, with wide-necked aneurysms, uh, large wide-necked aneurysms. And so that focused our attention. Instead of on the sack of the aneurysm, we began to think about an alternative target for therapy, and that would be the deficiency in the vessel wall that gives rise to an aneurysm. And that essentially was the beginning of at least my interest, but I think a number of people had this interest concurrently um, in um, sort of endoluminal reconstruction. Now, where did it all get started? Um, I think we owe um, a tremendous debt to those pioneers in the early stages of endovascular arterial aortic reconstruction. Um, both Nikolai Volodos and Juan Perotti, uh, we were familiar with Juan because although he's from Argentina and had started his work at the Cleveland Clinic, he ultimately established a very productive uh, collaboration with Frank Vieth at Montefiore in, in, um, here in New York City. So we were kind of up to date with a lot of the innovations in this space. This work started in 1970s. The first case, though, was done um, in Kharkov um, by Volodos, um, and this was just a large aortic aneurysm. And this is his endograft uh, that, that basically, um, you know, had been constructed by him for implantation here. And so this is essentially what we ultimately wanted to do um, in the head. 
Now, a number of groups in the mid-1990s kind of picked up another neurologic group, the group in Chicago, uh, Glenn Jeremiah's group, um, published a series of um, animal studies, experimental studies, using the magic wall stent, essentially, which was a coronary stent, self-expanding coronary stent. And what they were able to demonstrate, which was quite exciting, was that you could have, just merely with stent implantation in these animals, an organization of thrombosis, an organization of the not only the aneurysm fundus, but you get this integral overgrowth of the stent construct itself. So in other words, a vessel repaving or a reconstruction of the disease vessel. Now, there were other groups, both at UCLA and a, a, lot, a large series of guys, basically at Buffalo, that uh, picked this up and were doing a lot of uh, early um, kind of innovative work in this space in terms of like stent treatment of aneurysms. And by the end of the 1990s, um, people had begun, as Doty had kind of pointed out, uh, experimenting with the uh, some coronary stents. And what enabled that particularly was there was a small company at the time called AVE that came out with the first pillowed balloon delivery system. So that enabled you to take um, these coronary stents around a couple of curves without knocking them off or dislodging them from the balloon. Um, and they were also just a teeny bit more flexible, and that enabled a lot of these case reports and limited series, uh, um, Giuseppe Lanzino's uh, series, to be done with um, the combination of the INX stent or the S670 stent that ABE made at the time. The problem, though, as Doty pointed out, still these were balloon expandable stents. They were rigid. Uh, it became difficult for them to kind of navigate or to, to, to maneuver in a vessel that's changing diameter rapidly, like the superclinoid carotid as it swings down into the captain's segment. So they weren't really ideal. Plus it involved particularly intracranially, and most of these cases were kind of at the uh, skull base uh, margin or extracranial. Um, intracranially inflating a balloon also put the risk of a vessel rupture. And so this kind of led a lot of effort uh, here at NYU, we got interested in self-expanding stents using nickel titanium uh, to come up with what was called uh, this uh, as sub-4 at the time. Later, it was rebadged as the Neuroform stent uh, by Boston Scientific uh, when they acquired it. The chief engineer, I just want to point out on this uh, this project, was Alec Piplani, he's unfortunately deceased, but he was an innovator in this space and really kind of brought a lot to the table. Like Doty pointed out, there were certain requirements. Uh, you had to be deliverable through a tortuous neurovascular anatomy. Uh, this device went through a microcatheter that we were all familiar with. It's basically unsheathed. It was able to uh, sort of open on its own without the assistance of a balloon. But you had to have a sufficient radial force so the device didn't migrate. It had to be flexible enough so it could conform to the curvatures of the carotid arm and other um, cerebral vascular um, vessels. And you wanted... In this case, because we were coupling it with coils, essentially it was the, anal the analogy of having a balloon um, to protect, uh, you know, for coiling wide neck aneurysms. You needed a cell size that enabled you to uh, enter the aneurysm and uh, coil it after the stent was deployed. Uh, that strategy changed with time, but uh, basically you can distill down, and this just shows uh, the neuroform being uh, put in the glass model, and then the idea was to come and put coils, and then the combination of the stent plus the coils provided a scaffolding for the intima to grow across and ultimately to heal it. So there were three purposes, basically. Firstly, um, it provides a resistive boundary so that you could coil aneurysms or use other kind of embolic agents. Um, it was sort of a bioinductive scaffold with the coils to sort of facilitate that intima overgrowth over the aneurysm neck. And then as um, later with time, we found that it had some altered hemodynamic uh, properties, although that really kind of was in the in the domain of using multiple stents and things like that. These low coverage stents don't have a particular uh, distinct uh, uh, hemodynamic alteration. This was the very first case in the world where this was done. Uh, it was in Duisburg, Germany. We had gone there and in a very primitive way, the stent had to be loaded, examined with a microscope to make sure it was, it was okay. And so here you see basically the marker bands there were these platinum marker bands, very difficult to see in the early stage. You could not see the nickel titanium uh, uh, body of the stent. Uh, but nevertheless, if you understood how it worked, 
as you unsheathed it and brought the delivery microcatheter back, you see the marker bands exploding. They open up here and then proximally they open up and when you come across the proximal segment. Uh, and then you would go back through and stent, or you could jail a microcatheter and deploy the stent uh, sort of with a parallel technique and end up uh, coiling off the aneurysm and the stent protecting you by and large from herniating into the parent vessel and getting into thrombotic issues. Um, so the results were initially promising. However, as the tool got used in more complex aneurysms, uh, Max and I, after about um, a decade of, of stents, not just this one, but Enterprise and uh, a, um, a Bolt's um, Leo stent, uh, we kind of looked at the literature at that time. And essentially, it was sort of a disappointing 61% uh, of the aneurysms were occluded in follow-up angiography, which ranged from four to uh, 18 months in this uh, large series of, uh, of papers. Well, there were a few games you could play with the stents. You could like oversize them and that would typically kind of crowd out uh, the space and give you a little bit more coverage. Uh, but basically they were somewhat limited in the amount of metal coverage you could provide to the neck of the aneurysm. And then it just comes down to geometry. Essentially with a compressed uh, laser cut stent, you start with a compressed device that actually the more you compress it, it's, it gets stiffer. Uh, so that's one problem. But when it opens up to its nominal size or to the size of the vessel, you're left with like kind of a minimal amount of coverage and it's just pure geometry. Um, so you can only bring a certain amount of metal. The second thing that these devices had, given that they were laser cut, you had essentially two forms and you had the neuroform, which was an open cell construct, and you had the enterprise stent, which Johnson & Johnson later came out with, Fortis came out with, that was a closed cell design. Um, so they look great in, uh, in models, but then when you kind of tip them on their side, you realize how unrealistic this is in terms of the cerebral vascular anatomy, where the curvatures are much more acute uh, than is uh, demonstrated in the classic model. So when you get into that, uh, and this was like a, some very nice work that had been done in Houston, um, and you look at um, what happens to these devices as you put them through increasing grades of curvature, uh, you either get this kind of picket fence distortion or, or you get a folding of the closed cell design stents um, that kind of is, um, it lends itself to what I used to call endoluminal debris. Uh, and we only found that out because you couldn't see these devices as imaging got much better, or as you discovered when you were treating failed cases of this, it was very difficult to sometimes go back through. Uh, so after Boston Scientific acquired this technology, um, people got interested in improving it and like making devices that might be standalone. And there were a couple of things, you know, this almost looks like an aortic stent graft. Um, and then you have other kinds of methodologies. You can put uh, sort of perforated Teflon, uh, um, um, coverings over over the stents, but it's sometimes difficult to get these things to adhere to these fragile stents um, and to uh, kind of sustain uh, being manipulated uh, much. So uh, these kinds of things have other issues. You can close off perforators in the head. Uh, so that all becomes an issue. So ultimately, um, there are two ways you can kind of do that. You can either coat um, one of these laser cut stents or you can roll it and have it kind of unseat, but then that tends to, rolled stents tend to be very inflexible and so it makes it very difficult to deliver. So you're still left with this problem of having a certain amount of metal. As it expands, you're gonna end up with less coverage in the open stent. Ultimately, we decided on braided devices and all of the modern flow diversion devices go this way. And the simple reason is you can take a lot of metal, elongate it within a catheter, and then as it recovers, as it, as it expands, as it dilates, it shortens and it delivers that metal to your target area. So you get much more coverage. And this is ultimately uh, the device that we ended up with at Chestnut Medical, uh, the pipe, which became the pipeline. Initially it was called the Berlin, but a number of the German uh, um, colleagues objected to that. Um, so, we ended up uh, coming with this device. And you can see all of these devices have a lot of flexibility. They're ideal in that sense. 
although they do tend to average us, uh, the geometry of a vessel. And they can be stretched out and elongated in place through a microcatheter. Um, as opposed to the low coverage device, you can give a lot more abnormal diameters. You can provide a lot more surface coverage. Uh, and this is just a, a P64 next to a pipeline device. There are a couple of things that one principle that we talk about, though, with all of these devices is what is called its effective treatment porosity. And this is a very important concept intracranially because there are two dilemmas. One is we want to decrease flow at, in a saccular uh, environment like the aneurysm, but we want to maintain flow in a runoff perforator vessel that might be adjacent to the area and covered by the stent. And so a lot of work was done looking at the porosity that was necessary to close this, but also being above a level, a threshold, which would result in side branches closing acutely. And so a lot of animal work was done to kind of validate that. And here, Dave Kalmus and the group at Mayo did a lot of work for chestnut in this regard. And this is just showing a couple of scanning of electron micrographs, showing that basically where you have like a sort of vertical flow environment where there's no pressure gradient, uh, you can end up getting entomal overgrowth and thrombosis and fibrosis of the aneurysm. But where there is like a pressure gradient that drives flow, it somehow is inhibitory to the acute occlusion of an aneurysm. And the pitch and everything like that is important. The braiding is important in developing the pore density that you want. Um, this was the very first case. Once we had the final uh, version of the pipeline, and it went through everything from a 16 braid, 32 braid, uh, 48 braid, flat ribbon wires of different sorts, finally get to the right one. And this was the first case that we did in Buenos Aires back in mid-2006, where we had an effective result, and we were happy enough to proceed with, ultimately, the PETAS trial. So just, I know Bree went over all of these in detail later, but I just point out these two cases because these two trials essentially established flow diversion in the interventional neurospace. The first was the PETA trial. It was basically a safety uh, trial where effectiveness was a secondary endpoint. Uh, we looked at 31 cases. There was a high degree of complete aneurysm occlusion. Remember, half of these cases were coiled because initially... We were thinking of it more just to be on the safe side as kind of a stent-assisted coiling um, because we wanted the patients uh, to be well-treated. Toward the end, we got a little bit bolder as we learned more about the device and started treating the last half of the patients were essentially treated with uh, device alone. Uh, and then there were, you know, the, except for the, the complexity of the aneurysms that were treated, there was an acceptable um, uh, perioperative stroke rate and no deaths in this particular case. That was followed a couple of years later in the United States to get um, uh, with a PMA trial uh, called the POS trial, which is a multi-center prospective single arm trial using a historic control. This was a very well organized trial and all of the subsequent trials in the US to get FDA clearance have basically been modeled on POS as single arm trials. Uh, it's been criticized for not being a randomized trial, but when you think about the types of aneurysms that were done, randomization makes no sense because coiling really can't address a lot of those coils. Many of the, uh, those cases, surgeries couldn't address many of those cases. And so it ended up basically doing a structured analysis of the history of treating these aneurysms and comparing the results with that kind of historic control. Uh, it was quite successful at met both safety and effectiveness endpoints, which had to both be met for this trial for the FDA to prove it. Again, this was like an unprecedented size in a trial. Uh, 18 millimeters in diameter, mean neck size was 8 millimeters. Um, and you can see for, PM, for FDA clearance, we had to satisfy two things. One is the device had to be statistically, um, had to be significantly more effective than 50%, and it had to be statistically safer than 20% for major ipsilateral stroke or neurologic death. It fulfilled those things. Now, the other thing that we tried to do in the trial was establish a new ground rule. Instead of having like 
um, you know, sort of like all kinds of excuses for partial occlusion. It was it was a binary occluded or not occluded outcome, and that helped us also just in grading the the outcomes. And so, you know, we had a um, a, a core lab that looked at all of the studies independently and was able to kind of assess whether it was closed or not closed. So here's just an example of a, a case that was registered as a failed treatment, even though at one year it's completely occluded angiographically. Uh, so that's a failure. Similarly, if we used any other devices, and this was a very complex aneurysm I did here at NYU, I actually couldn't get past this aneurysm, so I had to coil it so that I could get past the aneurysm to then put a stent. Because we used coils, it was classified as a failure. So there were very strict criteria for what amounted to success on the effectiveness arm. Uh, this just shows the kinds of complexity of cases. You can see not only is this just like a very large wide-necked aneurysm, but it's actually multiple, a couple of aneurysms, tandem aneurysms here, or maybe this is just, as Pedro Lillick likes to say, segmental disease in a very complex lesion that like, the wow factor that Doty refers to at six months. A uh, similar case, large fusiform aneurysm of the petrous segment. There's really no good surgical uh, alternative for this. Maybe you could do balloon occlusion if, there were, if the collaterals were, were effective, but you can actually reconstruct this kind of thing and get this wow phenomenon. So that's another effective treatment. Again, a large ophthalmic segment aneurysm, wide neck, they were all wide neck, all large or giant, and you have the same kind of uh, successful occlusion at six months later. The trial followed patients for five years. Uh, ultimately, these were the outcomes. There were 96, 90% uh, uh, complete occlusions, four residual necks. And if you didn't show up for your angiogram, whether you withdrew or whatever, or, or you passed away uh, during the case, you were counted as a failure, as a treatment failure. So it was very strict. All of the patients were followed. So you knew what happened to which ones. These were the 14, the 15 that were unoccluded at six months. Uh, we followed them for three years, for five years. So ultimately you have understanding of every patient in that group. So let's talk about the mechanism of action. Uh, Essentially, it comes down to two things, and there's been a lot written about this. Uh, Dave Kalmus wrote a beautiful um, review article in neurosurgery back in 2020 that I think encapsulates all of it. Um, essentially, you have you can divide it up between hemodynamic effects and bioinductive effects, and which one is like most. My bias is that it's actually mostly the intimal overgrowth and the bioinductive that ultimately cures the lesion. But hemodynamics definitely has some part to play. And that's been very nicely uh, kind of mathematically described by Barry Lieber and the group at Buffalo, uh, essentially to uncouple momentum exchange across the aneurysm neck. And that leads to thrombosis, organization of the thing. And then ultimately though, the scaffold has to support the aneurysm. Now, what did we learn from all of these cases? There were a lot of observations that weren't intuitive necessarily but I think they become important when we think about like how these tools are applied. Firstly, large aneurysm, saccular aneurysm, treated with three overlapping devices. And you see immediately the hemodynamic effect. It dramatically changes the circulation, the intraaneurysmal circulation. This is like before, this is six months later, you see a completely reconstructed vessel. So it's again, just, you know, anatomically redone. But what's more important is now that that vessel has been reconstructed, the thrombosed aneurysm resorbs. And so you get this relief of mass effect that's not possible with other endosacular kinds of tools. Similarly, you have like a vessel that's large aneurysm, complex aneurysm. The vessel is also diseased. It's being compressed or it's narrowed, it's stenosed. Again, six months later, not only the mass effect of the aneurysm gone, but you have a, a normalization of the caliber of the vessel. So this is what was really exciting, that you have this kind of biologic modulation of the reconstructed vessel. Now let's talk about really complex situations where you have runoff vessels. So this was a choroidal segment aneurysm that was referred to us in the sort of post puffs, but before it was approved by the FDA. We had a continued access. 
Choroidal segment aneurysm, the anterior choroidal artery is issuing from the aneurysm. So you can't clip this, you can't immediately coil that because it will abruptly occlude the choroidal artery. Sometimes you can get away with that, but sometimes not. Again, it's coming up near the bifurcation. So in this particular case, we extended a three stent construct through the bifurcation across the choroidal segment. And this is the immediate effect. You have the sort of uh, what Pedro calls, I think it was the champagne glass or, or some, I don't know, Oreo cookie-like uh, effect, where you get this kind of layered effect, delayed washout. So you have the immediate hemodynamic effect on the aneurysm, which over time uh, occludes. Now, okay, it occludes slowly. So what does that mean? Well, we've done two things here. If you remember, there was an, a hefty A1 segment here, but that's been jailed. It, there's a little atretic piece of it that goes to a, a lenticular, medial lenticular stride here that actually reconstitutes the choroidal. So you have like a reverse moya moya that's going to keep the choroidal, resupply the choroidal. And then the ACA has been picked up on the other side. So in a way, we have like rearranged the collateral circulation. And this is just the lateral showing the choroidal segment there. I don't know if you remember, but here's the choroidal that was initially coming off the sac. Now it's still there. There's the choroidal, but it's coming down through this little moya moya off the lenticular striates. What about the mass effect? Well, again, here's the mass pre, and this is her one year later. It's gone. The mass is gone. It's the aneurysm has resorbed. As the imaging has gotten better, we understand these tools, how they're deployed. Max did a beautiful job. This is all very important to understand when you deploy a device, why is it failing? How can you make it better? This is like a single device coming around. I think it was a like a paraclinoid segment aneurysm that's being treated. What does overlapping stents look like and how does that change the porosity? And this is just kind of looking on fast at that, at that study. There's still active areas of inquiry, the number of devices that you're, should be used and how should we, how should that be applied to aneurysms of different morphology, the antiplatelet therapies, that's still in evolution. And that's going to be changed by the device coatings that get developed coming into the future. Um, adjunctive coiling, yes, there are many times that that's important. And I'll show that in some of the posterior circulations that we do. And then the strategic vascular remodeling, which is really kind of a novel part of, and it sort of heralds a little bit to the deconstructive models that we use, deconstructive approaches that we used to have for aneurysms. But how can we deliberately incorporate vascular remodeling as part of our therapeutic um, strategy? Of course, there are all kinds of different aneurysms. In the United States, we're a little bit more encumbered than you are abroad in terms of indications and what's off-label or on-label. That will have to be addressed. But I think like evolution, it responds to natural selection. And the natural selection, as Dodi so aptly put it, is driving us toward this therapy. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, this was uh, was phenomenal uh, um, to see how really like these, uh, you know, nothing comes for chance really like how a lot of things uh um happen before um that uh, led to this uh this i would say this discovery and this understanding um and uh, you know something like from co uh, or complete uh, other 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 locations in the body like the treatment in other location on the body also was a, was a key factor something that uh, we don't think often um i would like to open this to a discussion um i'm sure um someone from the audience uh, have uh, have some comments or question anybody i would like to say something sorry please please <laughs> i just wanted to apologize because i thought that uh, kim's uh, um presentation would be before mine and and uh, so I probably uh, did anticipate uh, a few things, but uh, uh, he did it much better than me. So he should have been before, and and I apologize for that. 
no 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 need i would say because it was uh it was incredible to hear in the morning your uh your perspective and uh and now uh like listening to 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 kim max I, I have a question for you, Kim. Um, like something that you know, it's interesting to, <laughs> from my perspective, like uh, to see how how uh, um, you know how pipeline really like the the the, in the became like the dominant device at least in the in the earlier time. R regardless, even if there was already like a competitor like in Europe, uh, which is the silk, like. Uh, how how did that happen and maybe like tell us a little about like what was that uh, sort of like uh, environment at that time uh, that led to these um well i think that um you know like it, I, I i'm always a little bit shy about taking credit for this because as you go back in in history you see so many like innovators that were just kind of thinking about the same thing coming up with the same things um I know, you know, we were lucky because we got out very early. I think that kind of followed through from Neuroform onto an interest in developing uh, like uh, more effective stents. And uh, we were working with kind of the same engineering core. So like the, the, the project had a lot of momentum, but I did find out that Bolt was working like uh, uh, traveling around Europe and doing some of these cases that Bolt was working on the same idea. And then ultimately, a friend of mine, Ajay Waklu and uh, Barry uh, Lieber, who started, uh, you know, um, Surpass and uh, were working on their tool. And so there were a lot of um, a lot of different groups coming together, working on similar kinds of devices, um, but um, all with kind of, the, I think, the same goals in mind. Um, how... Strangely, though, I mean, they all are a little bit different. Um, there probably is going to be some ideal type. I think we we went through a lot of different iterations with Pipeline. And that's why I always felt quite good with the 48-strand device that we had that had blended in platinum with, like, uh, you know, 35 NLT. Uh, but, um, but other devices, you know, like, and that's, I think, one of the... Un unsettling things that Dodi kind of was alluding to as the devices mature and they change and they change, do they change for the better or they change for the worse? I don't know. Uh, that's its own science. And I think that there fortunately is enough momentum in the field uh, to carry it forward. But I think what grounded us with pipeline was that we insisted on having clinical trials and having like some patient experience. And that gave us, because we were working very closely with the engineering team, it gave us a lot of insight into the performance of the device and also sort of an understanding of how it should be used. And I think that knowing how the device should be used is critical in, in applying these tools. Excellent. Um, we, we have a um, question from the audience that, uh, um, uh, it's probably a question you you heard before. How do you decide the number of flow diverters needed to reconstruct a diseased vessel? Yeah, I, so I'm not a huge believer in, I mean, I, I know that you probably, if you could, if you really understood it, you could probably find out some quantitative measure, you know, like does it disrupt flow? Can you measure that? You know, this is getting much more sophisticated. The imaging is getting much better. So people can do dynamic imaging. Um, and that might give us some clue. I've been unhappy with a lot of what had been done up till recently. Um, so more or less, it it kind of is is based on empiric on observation. You know, like just from doing many many cases, seeing what type of case fails with a single device, what kind of cases fail with two devices, uh, and when cases fail, they may angiographically occlude. But if that entomal overgrowth doesn't happen, sometimes that thrombus continues to grow. And so it's not intuitively obvious which one. So my bias, it depends on the size of the neck, the complexity of the aneurysm, the size of the aneurysm. Is there a branch vessel coming off of it? Um, can I stagger devices so that I don't 
cover important perforators too too uh, aggressively. So there's there's a gestalt. Uh, unfortunately, I've been left in just sort of empiric um, decision making, nothing based on any kind of uh, quantitative validation, and and that's probably not very satisfying for most people. Okay. Um, then, um, then Selang is uh, connected as one of the guest faculties in the afternoon. I'm going to introduce him uh, 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 later. Uh, but uh, then um, you have a you had a comment. I do. Oh, I have a question. Thank you for the beautiful talk and the, all the beautiful talks this morning. Um, my question is this: You had commented on just sort of briefly on the mechanism of healing, or not so briefly, but then you had said that maybe you had an inclination towards the like new intimal kind of uh, growth being the yep. mechanism of cure. This morning, we saw some beautiful cases, and I think we've all have them in our series, where perhaps there is a like a large perforator of one kind or another coming off of the aneurysm, and you um, you cover the the whole system with a, with a flow diverter, and then the aneurysm begins to shrink, and the vessel stays patent. Yes. And so in that case, you don't have neointimal growth over the whole um, aneurysm, and yet there is something that looks like healing and maybe it's partial healing. Sometimes it's complete. Sometimes it's partial. I think all of us feel relatively comfortable when we see that process starting when there's say 50%, you know, <laughs> decrease in volume or 80% decrease in volume, whatever it is, that that aneurysm intuitively feels safer than it once did um, in that new physiologic state. And yet it's not following what appears to be occurring in an animal model where you get neoentomal growth. And then once you get neoentomal growth, that excluded pouch begins to shrink. And that feels like in, like that's occurring in that order. Um, and that something about sealing that off enables that, uh, that, that pouch to involute. But that involution process is clearly can occur even in the absence of, of new intimal growth. And so I guess, I guess my question is sort of how you think about those cases in, in, ter in terms of the overall paradigm of healing. Yeah, so no, I think they're, you know, they both have a role, and that's why I have both hemodynamic and, and the entomal overgrowth. Uh, but we're, I think it's the entomal overgrowth in a sidewall aneurysm is, is like a better understood property. The cases that you're referring to, um, and Ischel also showed a number of cases that had kind of near completely involuted, although we don't always have transaxial imaging to prove that, but um, like the pica aneurysms, where it's coming, an aneurysm is coming off true pica. You can see remarkable change just by altering the hemodynamics and the runoff to the pica. But that's very unpredictable. So if I look at my series of pica aneurysms, true pica aneurysms, I would say half of them shrink after flow diversion, but equally half of them stay open, even with two, three stents across the pica. And many times I have to ultimately cover it sufficiently that the pica closes and rearranges from its supply from superior cerebellar from collaterals. And so it's not always predictable. And that's, I guess, my unhappiness with like, what is the hemodynamic method or mechanism? Yes, it definitely plays a role. Having thrombosis with the coverage of the neck contributes, I'm sure, to the entomal overgrowth to some degree. What degree, I don't know, because I've also seen cases where there is no entomal overgrowth, but there is thrombosis and the clot in the aneurysm continue to grow, uh, despite being angiographically occluded. And so that becomes a very dicey question. The one I know for sure that's cured is the one where there's entomal overgrowth and the aneurysm shrinks on transaxial imaging. Um, not to dis, not to say that there is no hemodynamic effect. Clearly, there is in two ways. One is you take shear stress or you alter the shear stress on the vessel on the aneurysm wall, and the second thing is that you change the circulation time of the aneurysm, and then by Burkow's principle, you end up with thrombosis in the aneurysm. So those all have an effect. I just don't know how they're related exactly to curing the aneurysm. There is um there is a there are quite a few questions from the audience. Uh, I'm gonna ask you this one, and we're gonna answer the other one uh, online. One question is uh, how is the lack of aneurysm rupture post flow diversion in the past trial? 
was one rupture, like a carotid carinose fistula. So there was one, but certainly like a very rare event. How The question is, how is that explainable in light of the other publications? So, you know, even when you look at kind of dark publications, rarely do you come above like 2% of these large aneurysms. Now, there was a large study in the early days that Esmond sponsored looking at, I think it was the first 1,500 cases in Europe that had been done. And they came with like a rupture potential of about, I think there, of the 1,500 cases, there were like 19 ruptures. When you analyze those cases, they have certain they have certain issues. They basically, I think all but one of them was over 15 millimeters in size. So size matters. And when you get into that, if you think back to the ISUIA data, once you get to a 15 millimeter aneurysm, there's about a, you know, like a 10% five-year rupture risk. And so when you kind of like think about the interval of time between when you put a flow diverter and when the aneurysm is cured, there's going to be a discrete interval that the aneurysm is not cured, it's large, and it could still rupture just on its spontaneous thing. Plus, you've altered the inflow into the aneurysm. So physiologically, you're affecting it. So I do believe that you have an impact. And I think the second thing that's necessary for the aneurysm to rupture is that aneurysm has to be fragile. And if you just take 100 large and giant aneurysms, we know that three or four of those are going to be fragile and are destined to rupture in this year. And so when that happens, we don't know. Now, is this unique, though, to flow diversion? And it turns out that no, it's not. At the time that we were doing the puffs, there was another trial that was running called the Ilana trial, which essentially was taking puffs-like cases, and instead of doing flow diversion, they were doing a bypass, an eczema laser bypass, and occlusion. And they had, I think it was 32 cases that they enrolled. Of those 32, they had two delayed ruptures. So that's with a deconstructive procedure and bypass. Then you look at coiling. Berenstein and Coopersmith had a very interesting series, large ophthalmic segment aneurysms that they followed. And in the 19 or so patients that were coiled, two of those had delayed ruptures. And so, you know, I don't believe it's unique to flow diversion. It's a hazard. I talk to patients when I'm going to treat them. And sometimes, like Dodi, I put coils because I'm nervous uh, about it, especially if there's like a person with like crescendo headaches and there are all these secondary kinds of things. But I think it's much more complicated than just saying that this happened. We did have one rupture, and it turned out retrospectively because the woman had a pulsatile tinnitus when her cavernous segment was ruptured. Um, she had a postural tinnitus about 36 hours after the treatment. So it happened relatively soon. Uh, but we've all seen it. It fortunately is not a, a large number of the cases, but there definitely are criteria. There are certain features of aneurysms that may be predictable, but we don't have like the bottom line. It's more or less a statistical type of thing. Thank you. Um, it's hard to stop. So I will actually continue, maybe we're gonna cut uh, some time from uh, the break later, but uh, um, there's uh, another question, which is what is less risky? Uh, put uh, one flow diverter, follow up, and then maybe put a second or just put two in the first time? I think it's better to close with two because, you know, when you if, if it fails, if one, okay. so, I mean, this always gets to be an economic, this discussion. Um, when I, when we first were releasing pipeline in Europe, we ran into the economics of the whole crisis because it was right after the economic crisis of 2008 that it got approved in Europe. So it's coming out. The pharmacies regulate at many of the hospitals in Europe how many cases could go. And so you come to a place, you're doing a case and the pharmacy says, no, just one device. That's it economic reasons. Okay, that can be rational. You're not necessarily hurting someone. You put a pipeline, if it doesn't 
If it doesn't work in six months, you justify putting another one there. Um, I'm a little like Doty implied with coiling. The thing I can't stand is a patient coming back to my office that's not cured. Because then I have to explain why they have to do another procedure. So personally, I think, and my, I'm, there may be people that disagree with me, but I think the hazard of putting two, three devices is not much greater than putting that initial device on any given procedure. And so I tend to forget about the economics of the whole thing. I tend to like to treat the patient as aggressively as I can, as appropriately as I can. Um, but, but, so, uh, Kim, but it's also you know, also an additional an additional treatment. So you need yes, to puncture so again. You need to navigate again. There's there's risk there as well. There's a, there's a, there's increased there's risk. There's all kinds of things. Not not to say there are cases that I treat with one device. If it's a you know like an aneurysm that has a neck that's less than four millimeters, or even four millimeters if it's small, I usually treat those with one device. Uh, but when I get up to like above a 10 millimeter aneurysm with a five millimeter neck, I'm going with multiple devices. Ophthalmic segments, I typically go at least with two, uh, especially if the ophthalmic is coming from the base of the aneurysm. Because I think once you start chasing it, if it shrinks, but it doesn't go away, once you start chasing it, it becomes more complicated. Thank you so much, uh, Kim. Um, this was uh, uh, incredible and um... There are quite a few questions that we didn't answer. I will ask you to answer a written answer, and uh, I'm gonna uh, show you how uh, how to do that now. Um, we're gonna move forward. Um, uh, we have uh, um, we have uh, John Wainwright, uh, who is a PhD, is a who is a um, an engineer. Um, are you there, John? Are you able to share your screen? Yes, I'm here. Give me one second. While you do that, I'm going to introduce you. Um, John uh, Wainwright is a uh, um, an engineer. He he has worked for many years in in uh, Cordis uh, first, and uh, and then in uh, actually in the in the cardiac world, and then in uh, in 2010 he joined Medtronic, where he worked for uh, uh, 11 years, and uh, you know in all certain different projects, but certainly he has a a very deep understanding of flow diversion. Um, right now, he's uh, working for Mivi, uh, which is a company mostly dedicated to, to uh, uh, stroke. But uh, he's here today to share all his knowledge, and uh, we're eager to hear from you. And we'll have probably many questions, uh, John. Thank you for being here. Sounds good. Thank you for having me, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Uh, so, as Etan mentioned, uh, I am currently the VP of R&D for maybe neuroscience, and we're developing the Q and DAISY or thrombectomy. Uh, also, I have a consulting company outside of thrombectomy, and I consult with a number of companies. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn if you're interested. And I'm also a lecturer at the University of California, Irvine. Um, as Etan mentioned previously, I was an engineer with Medtronic Neurovascular for 11 years. And, you know, I think uh, in this field where my claim to fame is, is around the pipeline shield device that I took that from its uh, early concept all the way through commercialization um, and was there for the first case with uh, Dr. Kim Nelson and, and Shapiro in the U.S. after pipeline shield finally got approved. And then I left Medtronic two months later. So it was a nice conclusion to my career at Medtronic. So I came to flow diversion a little later, and so I had data to build on. And as an engineer, the first thing I look at is where are the devices not working? And this is the MOD database. It's put together by the FDA. It's required for any US company or companies that sell products in the US to report. Uh, and it gives you a really good idea of where devices are working. Uh, so this is for all flow diverters from, uh, from April 2011. So that was the date the FDA finally approved the pipeline device. And so this is where I was working to try to you know, minimize these failures. And you can see there's activation failure. That's the, the stent opening. There's material deformation, breaking, and migration. 
Thankfully, these are relatively low, but they're significant problems. Uh, if we look at this based off patient problems, you know, thrombosis is the highest uh, patient problem. Uh, that's followed by stenosis, which uh, is a little harder to understand, and there really aren't good clinical models to figure out, or preclinical models to figure out why that happens in some patients. So if we look a little deeper at thrombosis, the, the MOD database can actually break this up by uh, manufacturer. And you know each of these uh, incident reports has a great amount of detail in it. And I've spent many hours going through kind of what happens and why. Um, and so on the, the right-hand side, you can see the, the breakdown. Microvention has the most incidence of thrombosis. Uh, what you don't see is the sales numbers, though. So it's a little hard to figure out percentages from this data, but uh, it can give you trends at least. So when I was looking at you know, modifying a flow diverter, uh, this is kind of how I, I break it up. On the left-hand side is all of the things that I can control. Uh, the elastic modulus, so whether it's nit nitinol, cobalt chromium, or something else, the wire diameter, the number of wires, the picks per inch, and we'll dive into that a little bit more, the amount that it's oversized, the number of layers or number of devices, and then finally the surface modification. Across the top, you can see all of the outputs, you know, the endothelization, there was a great discussion about what matters most, the endothelization or the flow disruption. Uh, I fully agree with Kim, it's both. Uh, and the wall apposition, the opening force, the risk of thromboembolism, the risk of perforator occlusion, the catheter idea, and delivery force. So if we look at this just for elastic modulus, you know, it probably doesn't matter for endothelization. Maybe it matters for wall apposition, but it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, it definitely matters for opening force because cobalt chrome is basically three times the modulus or that spring back that nitinol is. Uh, risk of thromboembolism doesn't really matter. Perforator occlusion, again, it doesn't matter. Uh, the catheter ID, you know, if you have a higher modulus device that you know might increase your delivery force, so you might need a higher ID. So as I mentioned, you know, steel does have a modulus that's about three times higher than nitinol. So you can see the loading plateau of steel, and it has a very high stress strain curve. So as you deflect that wire, the steel increases its force much faster than nitinol does. Nitinol is very unique material. It's super elastic, so you can bend it up to about 9% and it will fully recover. Uh, this is used in almost all uh, neurovascular stents. Uh, but for flow diversion, you know, the braid uh, gave us a nice workaround that it didn't need to be made out of nitinol. Um, and then, you know, there are other things that are part of a flow diverter. You need some radiopacity. So whether that's platinum, platinum iridium, platinum tungsten, and then there aren't any currently made with either just tungsten or iridium, but these are much harder materials. Uh, you also have to worry about fracture as you get harder and harder. So this is all part of a article that I'm writing with uh, Dr. David Calmez and others. And so hopefully that is published shortly. But if we look at kind of, you know, breaking this out a little bit more, you know, the diameter is really, you know, critical because as that diameter changes, the pores change quite a bit. Uh, the number of you know, wires helps dictate how many, what that surface coverage is, as well as that braiding angle. And the challenge you have is you can't increase that braiding angle too much, or you start ending up having wires that overlap. And at that point, you know, then bad things happen as you deliver the device. So this is really where the spine optimization comes from, is trying to, you know, optimize all of these different parameters to give the best possible outcomes. So it gets a little bit complicated. Um, and this is where you know, designs are definitely iterative. 
um, and you know, trying to build off the, the history of previous devices and what worked well and what didn't. And then where I spent a lot of my time was on surface modification. And that was exactly because the thrombosis was the number one complication with flow diversion and actually any neurovascular stent. So what causes thrombosis? So, uh, you know, this is Verkhaus triad, you know, one of the things is altered blood flow. So this is related to wall apposition. The other is, you know, endothelial injury. This is you know, through our device delivery, and it's also our foreign material. And then hypercoagulability. So that's more patient specific, nothing that you or I can control. And so really what I could play with is trying to get the best possible wall apposition and reduce that foreign material response. Uh, the device delivery, so this is just from a microcatheter passing along a vessel that it disrupts the endothelium. This is one of the biggest challenges for devices is as soon as that endothelium is disrupted, you now have a source for platelet aggregation and then acceleration of the thrombosis. Uh, this is what makes getting to a single antiplatelet so difficult is there's no way to quantify how much this affects or in that specific patient. Um, it, it also is the reason that the uh, drag and drop technique makes me cringe a little bit, but still sometimes necessary based on patient anatomy. So there's a recent article by uh, Gunis and others uh, talking about surface modification strategies. And you know the, the technology keeps growing. So, you know, Pipeline Shield was the first one on the, the market, but there's been other devices that have worked on passive coatings. So the uh, Fenox device, as well as the, now the Fred X device are available, uh, all working on that passive coating type technology or biomimetic type technology. Uh, there's also, more active drug devices now being explored. This isn't new technology. You know, heparin-based devices have been used in the coronary for over 20 years, but maybe they're better suited for the neurovascular because it's a whole different disease state. And then some of the more interesting ones are working on that endothelialization. You know, if you can get the device to endothelialize faster, you can exclude the aneurysm and then it's permanently healed. And so, you know, it is really a race and it's where, you know, where is that benefit and where are the risks? You know, if it, the device endothelializes completely and you cover perforators, then you end up in a bad position. So there's always, you know, benefits and detractors. So there are no perfect preclinical models. Um, and this is one of the things I think uh, Medtronic and my team did very well. And it was working with a lot of you as collaborators of figuring out how we can test this device. And so we published aggressively because this is how we develop better data. And it, I think, gave a good uh, playbook for all the companies to look at. You know, you can't base, say, make a claim around one test. And I'll go through this a little bit more. But you know, we looked at thrombogenicity as well as endothelization and then aneurysm occlusion and had multiple models for each one of those. Oops. So one of the things I mentioned was the wall apposition and you know, OCT and the work that Matt Gunis and uh, Gentuity have done have really brought that to the next level. It'll be interesting to see where that technology develops, that uh, it was interesting to see the uh, presentation from WLNC this year where uh, Dr. Pedro Lilic presented post-thrombosis and all of the thrombosis that was still in the vessel, even though it looked clear on angiography. So this just gives us a very high level of detail that isn't available. Uh, from this publication using the rabbit model, uh, the, the Gunas lab showed that communicating malapposition made it much more likely that the, device, the aneurysm was not going to heal. 
And by communicating malopposition, it's malopposition right next to the aneurysm neck. You know, this is also important for thrombosis that if you are not opposed to the vessel wall, that you're going to have more chance of flow disruption and thrombosis. On the right hand side, this is actually a SEM of the FRED device. And the flow diverter is actually separated from that outer braid of the stent. So the stent or the outer braid makes the device e very easy to deliver, but then it also separates that flow diversion path between the device. So as I mentioned, we looked at this multiple different ways. First, we started without blood flow, and we could see that shield was similar to not having a sample, but this had no flow. So this was only looking at that material thrombogenicity. Uh, in this model, the FRED device was similar to the Pipeline Flex or Pipeline Classic. It was the same braid. But when we added flow, the FRED device was shown to be much more thrombogenic. And this is from the recent publication on the FRED device, where even their data shows it's much more thrombogenic. Um, and fortunately, the FREDX has reduced that thrombogenicity. And you know, this is where models are, uh, make it a little bit more difficult when you have to develop better models to even see differences in the thrombogenicity at this point. So the other way we've looked at this is in the animal models, and this is a rabbit elastase study, um, which you know the model was developed by Dr. Kalmas, and now there's multiple labs that perform this. But this is right off the brachiocephalic trunk of the rabbit, and it gives you a rather nice wide neck aneurysm. Um, it's not perfect, the neurovascular. You are in a highly pulsatile environment. You do have a much thicker vessel, but it's one of the better animal models we have, but not perfect. So looking at you know, wall apposition and endothelization, one of the benefits we have is we can actually do a cross section of the device and look at the entire device endothelization. Uh, OCD, also gives you the similar type format. And what we saw is that the Pipeline Vantage actually had better endothelization than the Pipeline Flex. Uh, there are two variables that change, not only the, the surface uh, treatment with the shield technology, but also the braid changed with the Pipeline uh, Vantage. So Pipeline Vantage was recently cleared in the US, uh, but it's my understanding it's not quite for sale. So. Uh, hopefully shortly. And then, you know, as I mentioned, preclinical data is not perfect. The only way to really understand what these changes and their effects are through clinical data. And that's one of the nice things that Medtronic has done with the Inspire registries. It enables collection of data on a large scale for new devices. And that's really where the learning uh, and conclusion comes from. So endothelization, uh, if you look at endothelization just in a Petri dish, again, it's not a very good pre it's not a very good model. There's so many factors that are missing. Uh, phosphoricholine is actually used to prevent cell adhesion in a Petri dish, that it's sold as a commercial product. And that's why it's much more important to look at this in animal models, uh, in work by uh, Matsuda, and uh, Dr. Lopez, we actually showed that the pipeline shield had faster endothelization using OCT at day seven. Uh, by day 21, everything was pretty well endothelialized in that model. And recently, uh, the Gunas lab has shown that there is really not much difference between the Vantage, the pipeline flex, and the pipeline shield. Uh, Pipeline Vantage did have a little bit more uniform endothelization and a little thinner than the other two devices, and not much change over the 30 days. So takeaways, there are, is no perfect flow diverter. It, it's all a matter of trade-offs. You know, it, this is what I do as an engineer, make those trade-offs, and you as a physician, and it's all trying to get the best 
device and treatment for a patient. You know, this is why I love neurovascular is the partnership and the impact uh, with the, on the patients for a positive outcome. And, you know, it's really those, that cooperation that makes neurovascular so interesting in terms of an engineer. Uh, you know, when I worked at Cordis, maybe I would see a, a physician once every six months, but, you know, it's these opportunities to interact with physicians that makes me a much better engineer and to understand the therapies um, and hopefully give you better devices. So I mentioned getting to a single antiplatelet is going to be very difficult to do. Uh, you know, there are new technologies that are being developed and we'll see how those play out in the preclinical and then the clinical space. You know, the active heparin might be an option. Uh, I specifically stayed away from that because you're trying to create a clot in the aneurysm as part of the healing mechanism. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that plays out and if uh, aneurysm occlusion is affected. And then, as I mentioned, there are no good preclinical models. Um, it's just a matter of how many can you test in to give some confidence before you get to the patients. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, John. Um, this was really good. I mean, for us, like, you know, we need this a little more often in our conference, really like going back uh, back to the basics and the the this well what you showed us um i'll uh, i'll take um i'll take the lead here with a question and uh talking a little we're very very interested about like uh these uh, new flow diverters that uh, uh again we don't have yet but uh you know though the um in the easel uh, talked about uh, this morning and uh, we had a little discussion this morning and uh, it seems, uh, based on this uh, European experience, there are more problems. And uh, you know, one of uh, one of the problems with the fish mounting, with change of the shape, and you know, though this here and the easel uh, can uh, can repeat that and explaining better than I do. But essentially, it seems like there's something different. There's something weird about how these newer flow diverters are built that are causing more problem. And you know, as my from my very like very generic uh, look at it you know these are first of all these are dft so they are uh, deep field tube like with uh, with uh, it's different metal a different composition and the amount of wires is more so, so all this seems different what can be the reason why that's the case and what's your interpretation how to solve that problem and so forth yeah and so you know that is a difficult question uh, you know, if you look at the elastic modulus, so the drawn filled tube is filled with platinum, um, you know, and so platinum has a much lower modulus than, uh, you know, platinum iridium or platinum tungsten. Uh, and so it is a softer material. It is only in the core. So deflecting, you know, the inner portion of a wire has less of an impact. That's why, you know, Bicycles are made out of tubes because that outer diameter gives you most of the strength. Uh, you know, it the the Vantage also has smaller wire diameters because they were we we're trying to optimize for endothelization and wall apposition. And so, you know, in changing one thing, you also change another. That you know, there it, that individual wire has less strength to it because it's a smaller diameter. Um, and then, you know, the number of wires increased, and that was really for surface coverage. You know, if you look at a five millimeter device, it had much lower surface coverage than a two and a half millimeter device. And so trying to, you know, optimize that healing uh, was where the, the 64 came from. And, you know, that seems to be where a, a few devices have kind of landed, especially for those larger sizes that you know, it, it seems to be a good trade-off. Uh, I think we will learn more about the types of patients that have the stenosis issues um, and the, potentially be able to you know, pick the device that's going to be best for that patient. You know, the more tools we have or with you know, OCT or predictive flow, uh, I think the, the better off we'll be. Um. Anybody wants to comment about this? 
I, I would like to comment. Uh, this is Dodi. The, uh, hello, John. Uh, I was the one responsible for the for the comment on the newer devices, and uh, so the the impression is that they oppose less well to the wall. Meaning, you, you just said that having a higher number of wires would would make it more, uh, more like uh, that they, they could go to the wall better. But in in, in reality, the impression was that uh, it, the this higher number made the, the whole system more rigid. I I I tried to explain it by by comparing it to a straw rather than to a sock and uh and and so when you try to 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 play with it it really seems to to be to stay rigid and not really go well around and 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 be soft inside the vessel all along the 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 vessel wall uh, uh, this is my technical impression with my hands and what i do how could we explain that if if it's real? Because that that's that's really what what we. Well, it, it's not only my impression. Of course, the, the whole people who have tried it have more or less the same. Um, unless you're in a very straight segment, which in the brain is really rare. <laughs> but <laughs> if you are in a very straight segment, of course, wonderful. It opens immediately. It goes to the wall. Blah blah blah. To, or well. But if you start having curves, then it it's more difficult. That that that's wh uh, what I experienced. Is there any reason for that, or you just say that it's it's me? I'm a little bit crazy. Uh, so you know, it is a a different device, right? Every time you make something different, it, it's a whole new learning curve, and it's also you know gathering the clinical data to figure out you know if it's doing everything it's intended you know the the intention of the project was to give the the best wall opposition possible and i think this is where you know the inspire a registry is useful because then we can gather clinical data as quickly as possible uh, my understanding is professor feeler uh, presented that work at wlnc uh, this year um, but it hasn't been published yet and so, you know, with the larger data set, it, it seems like Vantage had very similar results to Pipeline Shield, um, but, you know, it is a registry, so those are always flawed. John, if I may follow up on what Dori was saying, yeah. um, and I think it's like gets into the weeds of engineering and this and that, like one of the issues with perceived issues with the Flex was that like the slow opening of the distal device. So yeah. from that perspective, if we say that what wall opposition is, is better opening of the distal aspect, then my understanding is that is what, what, what was like meant to be addressed in part. But if we're talking about like ability, like conformability, if we will, maybe I'm not using the right term, like how can it adapt to curvature? What happens in the proximal end? Like the 64, not that it's a magic number, but other 64 devices seem to have been a bit stiff. Um, and of course, they're all different. But like, you know, just to press you a little bit more on this, like, is is there more like, how do you evaluate like in all of these scenarios? Like, how well does it take the curve? How well can it change its diameter when it's on the curve? Like all of these factors. Yeah. And so, you know, Again, you know, in vitro models have come a, a long way, but they're not perfect. Um, and, you know, I can, you know, all devices go through a lot of testing, um, you know, upwards, you know, more than a, a thousand pieces of, of uh, devices, you know, to by the time you get to, to market. And, you know, testing in as many anatomies as possible is the the best way to you know develop a device that is going to be capable. Uh, however, that being said, it's impossible to test in all anatomies, and so there's always going to be an an option of you know when one device works better than another. 
You know, I think Fenox works well because it's a, a one millimeter oversized device in some indications when you need that extra diameter. Um, but then if those you know, recapturable ends end up in a curve, that can be problematic. And so I think it is just a matter of, you know, based off, unfortunately, experience of picking the best device for that patient, for that anatomy. Um, and then there are tools that are helping with, you know, picking sizing. And so it, it becomes a little bit less guesswork. And hopefully at some point, those tools actually help us pick better, better devices and develop better devices. Thank you. Um, it it seems to me like, yeah, thank you very much, John, a little bit political answers. <laughs> I would uh, like. <laughs> I no longer work for Medtronic, and I can't comment on any of those projects. Okay, but uh, because that, that's, I just wanted to know from the engineering point of view if it's true that it's a little bit more stiff or in the in in the vertical direction, meaning or not. If if it's just an impression, I wouldn't say it's more stiff because. You know, while the number of wires have increased, the the diameter has decreased. So it was trying to get, you know, an appropriate balance. Um, and so, you know, I'll I'll leave it to the data to figure out if that was achieved. John, what is the diameter of the new wire? Uh, I don't know that it's published, so I, I won't uh, speak to that. But it is published that it's thinner wires. Okay. Uh, I, I did reach out and there is no material for the U.S. yet. So, uh, I... yeah, that's is one of my pet peeves with a lot of devices is they're released. They're, they're telling us to put it in people's heads. And, you know, what information actually do we have? Not that we won't have it by the time it comes to us, but there's a lot of devices out there present for years. You can't you don't know. Like they don't tell you nothing about fundamental things. Yeah, yeah, and that was the other reason, right? You know, there aren't any pre perfect preclinical models, but you know, the more information that I could provide, I, I think the better decisions. Um, thank you, John. Any anybody else uh, connected uh, from the faculty has uh, any question or comment for John? John, I've got a, a quick question. Thank you for the fantastic presentation. Um, there's a big focus on material thrombogenicity, perhaps because it's something that can be controlled and sort of modeled. But it also seems like there may be thrombogenicity related to, for example, the microarchitecture of the tool, where you have little pockets where the wires meet and with little eddy currents and little static, you know, things. And it seems as though um, that's those sort of let's call them like architectural features that may result in thrombogenicity are studied um, to a lesser extent or were talked about to a lesser extent. And it may be that simply because of the structure of braiding wires that you will always need some degree of, of antiplatelet. And that might be, uh, you know, one, one strong antiplatelet as Max Shapiro was speaking about previously, we're very focused on two antiplatelets, but really it's just like sort of the probably a little bit more about the net sort of, you know, antiplatelet effect. Um, and so how does, do, do you like think about that at all? Or is there really just sort of more of a focus on material thrombogenicity because it's the, it's the kind of the easier piece to study? Yeah. So, I mean, those eddy currents were, were definitely why, you know, wall apposition is so important, uh, not only for aneurysm healing, but also for the, the thrombosis. Um, and, you know, it is kind of a shortcoming of, of a braided technology is you need overlapped wires. This is why we can use cobalt chrome is because the wires themselves are not bending. Uh, it's just opening. It's also what gives you the foreshortening. So, you know, there, there are people that are working on thin film technologies uh, to maybe overcome that. But then, you know, as Dr. Kim Nelson showed, you know, how do you get a laser cut backbone to oppose the vessel wall? Uh, it, it's not a, a simple thing either. Um, and so, you know, there there isn't a perfect answer at, at this point. I think it's, you know, trying to build devices that, you know, address a certain problem. And then it's what trade-offs you end up with. And you know, the, the thin film 
technology is not radio opaque. And so, you know, that is going to be a, a challenge uh, with that is, you know, maybe it gives you better healing, but if you don't know if you have wall opposition and you can't adjust for that, then, you know, that's a, a downside. Thank you. We have um, Rene raised his hand. Uh, you have a question or a comment. I'm going to introduce you shortly for your talk, but in the meantime, go ahead. Okay. Yes. Hello, Rene from Europe. Um, it is uh, I wonder whether the new generation of flow diverters ha uh, don't have a higher ability to expand properly, but, but a higher tendency also to fish mouse, at least for some flow diverters available in Europe. Uh, I would say I have this impression. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think, you know, modeling that response is very difficult. And, you know, it um, it, it appears there might be some age-related and gender-related uh, intricacies to that stenosis. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, but, you know, the, the lower the modulus of a device, the easier it is to deflect. So, you know, if you go from pure cobalt chrome uh, to, you know, night and all or a drawn filled tube, it's going to have a, a lower modulus and it will be easier to, you know, for the body to remodel that negatively. No, no. I, what I meant was if you have more radial force, which is what we're all looking for, does it have the negative side effect of inducing more fish mousing? Uh, it, that's hard to say. Um, and again, there, there's not a good way to model that preclinically. And, you know, it's definitely one of the, the biggest challenges. Um, but also having higher radial force than in a curve, you might not be able to uh, to get the wall apposition that you want. So higher radial force doesn't necessarily mean better wall apposition. Um, and so it. it's very complicated. <laughs> That's why we need the engineers like you. Um, thank you, John. Thank you for uh, for this uh, beautiful uh, session um, and uh, uh, question and answers was uh, was uh, was a very good part of this. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce the next the next speaker, um, uh, Professor Chapeau. Can you can you share your screen? Yes, absolutely. I will do so now. While you do, I'm going to introduce you. Um, we all, I'm sure, know um, Professor René Chapeau. Um, he's uh, talking to us from uh, Germany. Uh, he's uh, originally from uh, from France, and uh, uh, he um, he did his training in uh, in Paris at uh, La Riboisière. And then after that, after working a little in France, he moved to uh, Germany, Essen, where he worked there since he been working there since 2007. He's an obvious, uh, obviously a leader in the field. We all know him uh, from his incredible uh, experience that he's always uh, willing to share in every in every kind of setting. And uh, we've been especially like impressed uh, recently by seeing his experience with kissing flow diverters. And um, Without further ado, uh, we're here. We're eager to hear your experience. Uh, please, uh, Professor Chapeau. Okay. Hello to all of you. It's a pleasure to be on board. So, uh, yes, why to use uh, kissing flow diverters? I won't go too much into that explanations, but I would say simply because there are situations where it fails. So when to do uh, parallel or kissing flow diverters will go through different cases. I think it's the best way to see where we use this uh, because otherwise um, it seems difficult to have a good solution when all four vessels are involved as in this kind of ACOM aneurysms. Um, isolating the ACOM by putting flow diverters in parallel with or without coiling. The first one we did with coiling, we have some different follow-ups available. Here is one patient, here is another one. You see all those patients we treated had exactly the same anatomy where there's always an acute bend between A1 and A2, which is indeed the challenging part. But once this is done, um, you see that on the follow-ups, those aneurysms are completely excluded. This bit less uh, obvious than the other ones, but also um, the ACOM is just disrupted. Um, some bit of narrowing here, but obviously no aneurysm. 
this is very similar to the other ones and was treated a couple of years ago. Most of those patients have been treated with one of the flow diverters that we do have in Europe since a couple of years, which goes through a 17 microcatheter that makes it quite helpful, but I don't think it changes anything to the technique. So these were for the ACOMs. Uh, Distal ICAs are very unusual aneurysms, something like this. This do not like with the tremors in the middle, um, where goal of treatment here was in fact to put a flow diverter here and not carrying so much of A1, but we still did an occlusion test and the occlusion test showed a very significant delay on the right um, side in compared to the left one. The veins were just coming, uh, the anterior veins uh, were also too delayed. That's why we searched for something else and um, whether coding should have to be done or not, I still leave it open, but at least we've been doing it and then placed these times of all silks to, uh, no, sorry, these are threads. <laughs> threads have been placed here in parallel and this is the two years follow-up. Um, some situations in SAH with also this patient. So you see very highly selected patients where I'm not sure that we've got another solution either than to expect that the job will be done. But what to do here? Here's a fusiform distal ICA with a PCOM, which has a fetal origin, so no P1 segment from the basilar. And here's the bleb, obviously. So if we just flow divert here, what's going to be with the PCA? That's why we put the flow diverters in parallel, uh, adding a couple of coils. This is uh, this patient had been treated um, in the past from another aneurysm elsewhere, whatever. Um, here's placement in parallel where one of the um, things I think is important when doing this is to deliver both stents simultaneously as the stents are somehow oversized uh, uh, to the size you would spontaneously take. And I fear that if one would be opened um, before the other one, uh, if they're not released simultaneously, we may have one overexpansion of one end and the other one being potentially fish mouse. So here's the immediate results, followed by some coiling, the usual reductions in flow that we all like to see, and some follow-up here that's quite short follow-up, but some later follow-up. Obviously, it seemed to work. There was no ischemia in those patients. MCAs, only few patients with MCAs, those patients here treated with kissing balloons, coiling, look very good, but look between the post, immediate post and follow up, obviously further growth. So that coils enough did not do the job. I did not put as many stents as I do in compared to today. And here for the retreatment, uh, kissing. Um, six was achieved with some follow up a couple of years later. Uh, this year had been clipped where um, microcatheter had been placed to add some coils, both flow divergers placed in parallel. And what I find quite interesting on this follow up is to see that between the immediate result, where in retrospect, I'm a bit afraid to see that one is much larger than the other one. But you see that on three years uh, follow-up, you see that um, bifurcation seems somehow to have been zipped down alongside the M1. Um, going to the proximal basilar, we've got a couple of patients with this type of configuration where the choice for placing two flow diverters here was that the diameter of the basilar was close to, to six or to five and a half. And at that time, I don't think that there was any flow diverters that went up to five and a half. So this time it was indeed putting both in parallel, but differently than in the, the other ones we saw before, at least in the MCA, so that both ends were in the same artery, but then proximally in two different ones. Yes, here indeed, five and a half millimeter of diameter. And uh, um Piece before release. And well, some six months follow up. Interestingly, there was an immediate thrombosis on the MR a couple of days later. 
And then on the follow-up a bit later, there was a recanalization. So we had to proceed with further treatments, whether it was necessary to coil or not. Obviously here it was not enough. So we went through the peak of that you can see here to go down. There was some place in between the flow diverters, add a couple of coils and then add a couple of pipelines inside to threads. You may see them here, but then it worked. Then it was cured, uh, as you can see here on this later follow-up. Uh, this year, exactly the same aneurysm, only larger, that we treated this year, where we did the same thing. We put the flow directors in parallel. One of the concerns was that you may see here um, the branches coming here. I guess it must be an ICA coming from the sac. Um, surprisingly, either he had collaterals or not. These were some issues during placement that could be solved. So uh, the technical construct was the way we wanted to. At day one, you see that it looks good. At day 10, it's more thrombose, but this patient had a bleeding two months later. He made a massive SAH. Um, I'm not sure whether it's related to the fact that those are kissing flow diverters, but much more that uh, it was just a, a very large unthrombosed aneurysm where we know that this may occur. But of course, uh, we can debate on this. Concerning distal basilaris, these are the highest number of patients treated with those kinds of aneurysm, which of course was not treated primarily like this, but the story of this patient was first bleeding, treated with a combination of device, so piconus and coils, some thrombus here that you may see. So Reopro was given. And then very important recolonization treated by, I think the colleagues here did a T-stenting and coiling. So here T-stenting like this. And then the result looks definitely very decent, but again, a massive recolonization with two webs. And again, another massive recolonization after both webs that you may see here, where it's growing on a terrible way. So I think that we have almost no range of what can be done here. And probably we can guess why the results were so poor I find that interaction here is quite interesting to see that the different states placed could not just expand properly. And this could be the reason potentially why there was further growth. At least uh, we first had to find a way to damage the materials, various core balloons. Then we had to add a core stand here on the left side before we delivered the flow diverters and added some coiling. And since then, I mean, it was long procedures there was a lot of uh, some ischemia but the follow-ups are really fine after four months and two years it stopped growing and the patient is fine so in very aggressive aneurysms uh, probably we need to be very aggressive too uh, this one also this time it's a young boy 15 years old first coining after rupture this dysplastic p1 here that looks very frightening where uh, some calibration with some core balloons to try to understand what's going on. And then a uh, placement of some flow diverters. This one was a bit short. We add another one in telescopic in order to obtain this. And here's a six months follow up. Um, and seems to be more or less stable. The left side here um, evaluated on a very favorable way. Probably a bit of flow remaining here. Some ruptured aneurysms were treated too. I mean, of course, we can treat this aneurysm by any way, but the chance for this to recur seems to be quite large. That's why in this configuration, we put the flow diverters in parallel. And interesting pictures are probably these pictures here, where you can see how the stand behave. Goal, of course, is to avoid this place around, but... I think uh, we did our best to try to avoid this. Okay. And um, here is some immediate results. Same same thing here with some follow-up. So most of those patients have rather good results. Um, uh, concerning sizing, probably sizing is something which is... Um, 
<laughs> which may be a concern because if you're facing a four millimeter diameter vessel, if you just take one device, you will take a four or four point something millimeter device. And in fact, if you have to choose for four millimeter vessel where you put both flow diverters, should it be two times three, two times two or something in between? If you take this here, I mean, four is two plus two, it would look like this, which definitely is not enough, which means, in fact, we need to calculate the surface. At least that's the way we do it in order to have the surface of both flow diverters larger than the surface of the artery where they're being placed. And that's not that complicated, but it's still an exercise that we're not trained to do. Going back to the examples we had, in a four millimeter vessel, the one that fits are three and three and not two and two or something in between. And that's why um, probably delivery of the flow diverters must be uh, achieved um, more or less in a parallel way to allow both of them having the main degree of expansion. Otherwise, I fear that uh, if one is overexpanded, the other one may may have a problems. Uh, we had different complications. I mean, some of those aneurysms were absolutely giant, uncontrolled aneurysms, so we did not control all situations. Um, we had some patients with ischemia. When one patient with occlusion, we had this patient with hemorrhage, so still a very significant amount of um, complication rates, but also most of those aneurysms um, or a large amount of those aneurysms were very difficult to control. Here's the example where this one here um, was also treated by kissing flow diverters, but you may see on some pictures that the SCAs are coming somewhere from the sac. So if you put the flow diverters like this, but the SCAs are not in contact to the sac, specifically on the right side, we don't see it here. Um, this is one week later effect on the aneurysm doesn't look too bad. After two weeks, we had a well thrombosis, but after three weeks, um, the patient made an ischemia um, and did not have a good outcome. So when to concern kissing flow diverters is probably um, the most important thing that it works is, yes, a clear message. It's possible to do so. Uh, certainly, potentially higher ischemic risk. All those patients receive Pazugrel because I'm um, very much afraid that they could thrombose. Uh, we take care to keep the end of flow, both flow diverters in the vessel, whether it's a proximal or distal end at the same level. Um, but when to treat them is certainly something that we'll be able to debate on now. And I think I'm done. Yeah. Thank you, Rene. This is a uh, this is fantastic, impressive. You know the like this show us that you know the limit of flow diversion is really like uh, uh, something that is good. <laughs> We're exploring, and uh, you know this um, sort of like parallel placement. Um, it's something that in our experience we we talked about many times. You know, looking at some aneurysm, can we do that? We we never ended up doing it. At least. Uh, in uh, our experience as far as I'm aware. So it's good to see that, you know, there are some situations where this can can be something that uh, uh, has uh, has some positives. So um, I'm very happy to have seen your experience. Um, anybody wants, uh, wants to comment? Kim? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, a brilliant advance because uh, because I agree. I, as uh, Eitan has described, we've had cases where we thought possibly that's the way to go, but I guess we're always a bit timid and so look to other things. So it's impressive to see that it can work, um, but that you have to be diligent in doing the calculations and making sure that uh, the things uh, are deployed simultaneously and you know you don't end up with constraints. Um, so yes, congratulations. It's a nice body of work. Then... Um, um yeah, please. No, I mean, the, the, the justification to do so is um, probably related to the frustration when you got a bifurcation 
um, aneurysm where you float over to one side and you see that the bifurcation branch still um, is recruited and is keeping the aneurysm alive. And <laughs> that's that's the reason to do. Now, um, one question I have technically is that uh, you insisted a few times that uh, you like to open them in parallel together. I assume because your experience is that when you went the other way around, you didn't see the second one expanding. The reason why I'm surprised that is, would, is that I would expect because we're taking in the same size, the same size, that when you open the second one, it would actually push the second one to open, uh, to like sort of like constrain the other one that is open. So I'm surprised about that. Uh, that so I I don't know if you have a comment about that. Um, yes, the comment is that the radial force of a flow diverter is not something which is linear. Uh, there are some kind of curves that are shown where there is a, a kind of double curve and in fact an unexpanded stand. An unexpanded flow diverter has a less smaller uh, radial force than when it's expanded. And I yes. think it's if one is open and you've got the other one unexpanded, it will never open. And that's why about playing, I mean, being aware of this, no, I did not do it. First opening one, I was afraid of having this problem. So that's why I always try to play with it. But somehow it's possible. I mean, you can unsheath most of them and then deploy them, push, pull. There's always some free space in the aneurysm that allows somehow to get them um, more or less properly expanded. I mean, I showed the example of the MCA where in retrospect, um, <laughs> I'm happy that the division branch did not occlude. Um, and interestingly, it expanded later on, but I'm not sure that we will do it like this. And I fear that one of those, um, I mean, the non-expanded one has a high chance to thrombose. Renee. Yeah, I think that's very important to uh, point out. Uh, if you think about the radial force of these braided stents, and they, they peak at radial force near nominal. So if one is opened completely, like Rene has just said, the other one, even if it's the same size, it's at a constrained diameter. So it has less outward remodeling force. The second thing is when you deploy it, if one is deployed ahead of the other one, for it now to narrow, it has to elongate. So it has to be able to kind of change its length as well as its diameter. So there's it's complicated, but I, I think the best way is as he points out that you do it simultaneously somehow. Um, um, okay, go ahead. We have uh, the first one was then saline. Uh, Easily you're after Dodi. Um, uh, then you have a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, beautiful presentation. Um, one thing that strikes me uh, in that presentation is that in some of the architectures of what you're treating, you end up with a double barrel on the proximal side. And in some, you end up with a double barrel on the distal side. And as you point out, you have, do have the potential for an endo leak in the double barreled segment because of the sort of triangle created by the devices as they come together. And I'm curious, uh, two things. One, do you notice a difference in efficacy, whether the double barrel is on the proximal end or the distal end? One might think intuitively that you pay a bigger price for an endo leak proximally than you do distally, although the opposite may be true. And the second one is, um, do you feel like you need a longer segment of sort of double barrel apposition just to sort of um, cre create um, as as sort of as effective a seal in the in the double barreled limb as possible? And, and, and one reason that you could potentially imagine that you could do that is simply by longer length of the two stents together. And then by chance, as they, you know, fold with each other and and opposed to the wall, you might end up with a either a higher resistance channels if they're open because they're just longer, or or potentially a seal if, if it, but just but by chance alone. Uh, these are very good questions, and I'm sure that I'm not able to answer them <laughs> because um, I don't have the answer to this. Uh, up to now, my major concern was to avoid uh, thrombosis. And if there are two flow diverters in parallel in the same artery, I put the minimal amount of both devices in the artery. But for this reason, um, I think it's always possible to add another one if you don't get it occluded. But from a first point of view is avoid uh, 
an occlusion of that artery, and that's why I try to keep it as more as short as possible. Um, but future will tell us. Thank I think you. everything you said makes sense. Dodi? Oh, yes. Uh, whenever you listen to René Chapeau, I, I would spend a word of caution. I don't know how many people are listening now or watching or maybe now or, or in the future you know, on YouTube, whatever. I just would say, well, don't go home and try this on the first case you see. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially because... Uh, um, some of these cases we have seen from uh, earlier presentation could be uh, uh, achieved uh, with just one flow diverter, the, especially the one with the, uh, at the level of the posterior communicating, the level of the uh, middle cellular artery. So before trying this double barrel, um, try to be good with uh, just the one single barrel. Thank you, Dodi. Um, certainly, like these are extreme uh, cases, uh, you know, uh, treated by uh, quite an experienced operator. So, yeah. So, everybody, let's keep it in mind. You remind me to say that actually we have around 200 people connected. So, you know, I forgot to to mention that. So, uh, yeah, we uh, we uh, let's keep that in mind. Uh, uh, Isil, Isil, you had a, a, a comment or a question? Question. Please. Uh, okay. Uh, number one, uh, during the uh, opening, uh, have you experienced any dissection due to stretching of the main artery uh, while opening uh, two devices at the same time? No, no, no. Uh, I think what would happen is that uh, devices don't open. I mean, one would open, the other one would not open, but um, the... Um, Artery containing both devices. Um, um, up to now, there was no issue. No. Uh, what do you do if one does not open up? Um, one in one patient, we add another stance. I mean, both. <laughs> it's a situation where both were quite properly done, and I don't know why I wanted to go through the stent again to stabilize them while I was coiling, and this led to some fish mousing of the stent. So I created a mess, and to resolve this, I had to add uh, another stent inside. I added a Nevo, I think, to or to avoid uh, fish mousing to be excessive. And uh, you are coiling through the jailed third catheter, no? Yes, yes. Okay. I would fear if you have both in place, if you try to go through, that both No, move. no, no. I, I thought, you know, barely... Uh coiling and then you know not enough to pack but because you're going to put two uh, flow diverters anyway uh, you may just coil with the balloon assistance perhaps and then put two flow diverters that's what I thought uh, you so, are doing um, that's a good point indeed um, we do this quite often here uh, I'm a bit too much afraid of the behavior of both flow diverters I want to see properly and to have optimal visualization, if you have coils, they may be in front of them and you wouldn't be able to see them. That's okay. why the other version was done first. Okay. Uh, on, on that regard, Max has a question, but before that, uh, there's three questions from the audience about the type of flow diverter that you use for this. Uh, are you, do you have any preference of one versus the other? Um, specifically, there's a question about uh, 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 Fred versus pipeline or other or silk vista baby you mentioned uh, can you go into all these details uh various stents were used uh, because of handling in rather smaller vessels handling of 17 micro catheters are, is just easier and that's the reason why most of those patients were treated with vista babies but uh we've been doing some with Freds and with pipelines so I don't think that the flow diverter itself, is is an issue okay max renee no thank you so much um some of the cases you showed like in addition to the double barrel right there was like these obvious as you recognize as you show like vessels coming off the dome like really really high risk for that reason as well right if we remove like if you say okay like we're, we don't like we remove these from the equation 
And if you ask like, what is the complication risk? Like what's the hazard of like double barrel alone for something that doesn't maybe have these additional features? What would you think is is like the realistically the, the, the risk? 30%. 30? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's why I think that indication must be uh, an aneurysm where uh, the chance of doing a um, regular treatment is not good. I mean, all those giant basilar uh, where flow diverter is put on one side where you know that usually it never works. Um, I think we need to be more aggressive, but highly selected. Have, have you done something like like flow divert a light on one side, like go with something, whatever that you can go through then and maybe like deploy like some, is that, is that not, not, not with kissing, not with kissing flow diverters. I think it's better to have the same material. I don't know what happens if two different metals are in contact. Some years ago, there was some contact about some concerns about having um, interaction between different metals and, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I prefer not to <laughs> to know it by complication. Thank you. Um, to follow this, there is going to be a debate of one hour, so it's, it's uh, we're going to take a little of that time to answer more questions because uh, this uh, has generated many. We have uh, Ares, Ares Nosek. You you had a question, Ares? Yeah. Uh, that was that was really awesome, Rene. Thank you so much for participating here. Um, I just want to tell you, Rene, that since I saw your title on the agenda, and I've heard Ethan is talking about it a lot, and you know, then it was on the on the agenda, and I was saying to myself, as the only surgeon on the on the panel now, that I'm going to watch in each and every case of yours just to verify that there maybe there is a good surgical option, and I can tell you that there was none. I would not try to treat in any surgical option. All the cases that you showed are extremely complex with extreme high surgical risk. And um, it's amazing what you're doing. And thank you so much. And uh, Rene, he, as a surgeon, he does take uh, very challenging uh, cases uh, in surgery. So uh, if he says that, uh, that's, uh, that tells a lot. Um, so um, um, thank you. You're going to stay with us for the next session. Um, uh, so uh, next session is um is um is a debate and there's gonna be two debates here um and the first one on giant aneurysm and uh, the second one on vertebral basilar aneurysm. The reason is uh, we we this, we chose these topics for the debate is that uh, still today um you know there's not very much agreement on how to treat these aneurysms. Personally, um, every time I go to conferences, especially like, you know, m and conferences, um, there are cases of, uh, you know, giant aneurysm that goes wrong. And and the reason uh, the reason is that, uh, you know, obviously they're high risk patient, they're high risk aneurysms. And uh, the what uh, what all these discussions during during the M&M lead to is like there's a it seems to be not uh, not to be like a magic solution. And uh, and so it's good to have, since we are so lucky to have this, uh, this uh, incredible faculty here, I asked uh, some of you, uh, all of you actually, to, to bring a, a case that went, uh, went uh, well. And uh, because it's important when we look at these cases to discuss like cases like went well and to understand from that, like maybe something was done in particular that led to that outcome. Um, um, if uh, um, I would like to start, uh, uh, Dodi sent me the the PowerPoint, so I will uh, I will share it, um, and uh, um, and I will start from that. Um, let me see here. There we are. Um, um sorry. Yeah, I share the screen, and there it is. All right, this is your PowerPoint, uh, Dodi. Okay. Do you, see, you see the images? Yes. All right. Yeah, and uh, I, I can go forward. You, you tell me. Okay. Uh, so he, uh, we have a series of uh, pretty big analysts, but this one is uh, probably in the in the largest uh, 
uh, population. So this is a 17-year-old girl who comes with headaches and irregularities in menstruation. Uh, she has been studied in a different hospital, and uh, the first thing they see is uh, next uh, with MR, a, a, a very big aneurysm, uh, uh, probably in the cavernous portion uh, of the carotid artery on the left side. Uh, next, okay, so this is the MR uh, 3D, whatever, reconstruction. And these are their angiographic images. So a very big uh, pouch. Uh, next, yes, this is uh, again the 3D reconstruction. And you see that, well, there was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the carotid siphon looks okay, uh, but maybe the very distal. Uh, portion of this um, horizontal part of this uh, of the carotid is uh, um, still uh, uh, sick and abnormal. Anyway, next, uh, yes, there was a little problem in, in the origin, but it doesn't matter. Next, so when she comes, we do uh, again the angiography. You can see that. Next, uh, there were no collaterals. Uh, or very poor, so we uh, we um, could uh, uh, see that there was no possibility of occluding the carotid artery, which would have been our first option, view the giant size of the aneurysm. There could have been a, the, um, a, a, a chance with the bypass and occlusion, of course, uh, but then uh, we tried first uh, uh, um, agreeing with the, with the girl and their parents uh, and her parents. Uh, we agreed for it, uh, seeing if we could manage uh, via endovascular. And so you will see next uh, uh, the first uh, uh, transit through the aneurysm. Next, uh, yes, we, we went with a microcatheter, followed the next... Uh, uh, by um, um, a larger catheter there. Yes, thank you. Uh, a distal access catheter. So uh, this was our position. Next, uh, we could uh, finally place the first the next uh, uh, pipeline. This is a very old generation of pipelines. Uh, starting with the supraclinoid carotid, we wanted really to go to the normal uh, artery. And then... Uh, uh, after that, next, uh, in order to uh, go back one, yes, in order to catheterize again the stent that we uh, deployed, we needed to place a second uh, uh, guide wire. So this is the body wire technique. Uh, uh, inside the 27 catheter, you can place 114 wire and 110 wire. Uh, very easily, and this has helped us a lot in the, this very difficult catheterization. So with that, we went through again uh, the next, uh, the uh, the first tent, the next, and we deployed the uh, uh, second one, next. Yes, you see the second one here, probably, I cannot see, probably we are already at the third, next. And uh, finally, so we placed the uh, four pipelines, but then the, the two more proximal detached, as you have seen in a different case before, because you really have to be a lot uh, one inside the other if you want to telescope. But we had finished our pipelines, so we added the two silks uh, inside the, the pipelines. Next. So four pipelines and two silks later, this is what we achieved. Um, good, uh, bad, we, we, we don't know. We, it took uh, uh, quite a lot of time, four hours, next. But finally, uh, one month follow-up showed uh, a decrease, a, a shrinking of the sac, and uh, next, uh, and the symptoms uh, went away quite immediately, next. And uh, six months we had angiography. It was very nice to see that the artery looked uh, nice. There was still next uh, a little bit of uh, uh, something coming. Uh, yeah, uh, it, that's where the pipeline was finished and the silk uh, was starting. 
uh, this was done. Uh, so the silk was inside, of course, the pipeline because it was placed uh, afterwards. So it was not the right thing to do. But finally, we had to do it like this. Next. You can see it maybe a little bit better here. Next. At 18 months, there was a complete reconstruction and perfect uh, resolution of the problem. Next. Especially if you look at the MR, this was uh, when she came and... Uh, at eight months, uh, the energy is completely disappeared. Next. Okay. Just to show that we also had another one case, uh, exactly the same. Uh, Let's, uh, so it's not just one, but more than one. <laughs> Let's discuss a little. You know, I have a few comments, and then I, I hope uh, the faculty will interject and, uh, and uh, do their own. So one comment I have when I see this uh, fantastic case is the following. 17-year-old. Let's say she passed the BTO, right? Let's say she, you know, she had excellent collaterals. Today, would you still like, uh, would you, as you said, would you sacrifice or you would still do the kind of treatment you showed us here? Okay. Um, before this case, I had a very long experience with carotid occlusion, of course, because that's where I come from. Uh, so probably 20, 30 years of carotid occlusions. And I can tell you that they have worked very well, even in very young patients. Uh, we have done that, especially many, um, a long time ago, for carotid cavernous fistula, post-traumatic carotid cavernous fistula. And uh, uh, I still see patients 40 years later, 30 years later, that were 16, 17 at the time, and, and they are doing very well. So I think that it's still a very good option. Now, this is one case. It went very well. We have a second one, which is very similar, and it, go it went well also. Well, I don't know. Maybe I, I would be, uh, I could discuss it. And uh, probably at the end, I would be pushed to, to do it like this, even if I know that um, the numbers are very different. So we have... You know, uh, I I quote you, Dodi. The nature gave you a, gave us car a carotid because we, we it's important for us to give a carotid, right? Uh, I'm quoting you. You tell us these things, right? Well, and, uh, well yes, yes, and no, um, because nature can um, find solutions to uh, any traumatic uh, happening in a, in whatever. So. If, if the trauma is the occlusion of a carotid, so if you have a dis dissected carotid, like a, 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 in, a, in an accident, uh, a very young people can have that, occlude their carotid forever, and nothing happens. So nature can find solutions. Of course, uh, uh, we, of course, it's very debatable what's best to do. And uh, yeah, the, the, the problem of nature is like nature uh, for a 17 year old is different than when the 17 year old will be uh, 65 or 70. And maybe the, uh, she's going to develop some matter in the other vessel. And that's where like the treatment that you did when she was 17, not in this case, but let's say you sacrifice, that's where it can become a problem. Um, um, Rene. Go ahead. You don't need to raise your hand. This is a debate. Keep your mic open, please. Okay. Um, I mean, important. I mean, congratulations. That is a fabulous case. Um, at some point, it will be important to know what is the ratio of patients which where the treatment works so well. Uh, because this will be, in the end, a, a very important factor. But we need... a pioneers like you to do these cases to show that it works. Um, I wonder, uh, and that's my question to you, Dodi, would you do the same for an aneurysm of similar size, but which is intradural and not extradural, considering the um, potential hemorrhagic risk? Uh, what hemorrhagic risk? <laughs> no. No, I, I, we have done it, in fact, and we have done it in a case which was ruptured. So the hemorrhage had already been there. And uh, and we placed, uh, I don't remember, seven, eight uh, flow diverters, one inside the other, uh, to reconstruct a very long segment, starting from the middle cerebral artery and going to the internal carotid artery. So, um, yes, no, I wouldn't be... Uh, worried about the um, the fact uh, that it's intradural. 
Um, and, and I even I would even be more prone to do it because there is not a, 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 another solution or a, a, a better solution. Uh, so in this case, there was uh, two of them: one occluding the carotid, and the other one bypass and occlusion of the carotid. But in, if it's uh, intradural, it's much more difficult. So it's interesting. So you. You, you don't think that there is a hemorrhagic risk for the unthrombosed. And I make really a big difference between the thrombosed and the non-thrombosed. The non-thrombosed aneurysm, they don't bleed uh, after flow diversion. I mean, the big ones where you need to reconstruct with a, with a bunch of flow diverters. But um, the ones that are not thrombosed, um, uh, I would say that the risk of bleeding, or let's say in my experience, we had a significant amount of... Uh, of terrible bleeding inducing the death of the patient in the giant and thrombosed. Um, yes, I agree. I agree. Um, those are more kind of saccular aneurysms. Uh, this this uh, more fusiform aneurysm are, I think, a little bit different. Uh, but every case is 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 a, a single case. So, yeah. Anyone else on this uh, this concept? Please, Yisil, go ahead. Yeah, Dodi. So, like, just for the like for majority of the audience, if you were to ask, like, they might have the the simpler question of like, say, you have a big aneurysm that's intradural, would you add coils? Like a simple, like maybe not so complex, but like a large intradural one, would you coil it? Would you use multiple devices? Well, well, we 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 have coiled the uh, most of the large and giant aneurysm above uh, 15 millimeters of size that uh, that has uh, been going on uh, since we had the first uh, one or two cases uh, and in the world uh, there was uh, this uh, uh, aneurysm rupture and ruptured aneurysm rupture after flow diversion what should we do and uh, and so the, uh, the the silk people the bald people start to say we, you need to use coils every time you use a flow diverter and then we did. We said, well, maybe not, but in very large and giant, maybe yes. Uh, we, I think, we have had less uh, um, hemorrhages and ruptures with coils. We don't have, of course, any uh, um, randomized trial to prove it. Um, but today, if I did not put coils inside a giant aneurysm, and it r ruptured. Afterwards, I would say, well, I was so stupid not to place coils. So, um, but if ruptures and I have placed coils, well, I say, okay, it happens. So, um, uh, yes, it it would be better if it didn't rupture, <laughs> of course. But uh, uh, if we have a different, uh, the other thing is placing more than one flow diverter uh, inside. Uh, so, not not really telescopic, but one inside the other could help also. So. This also is a, is another um, thing that I would do in, in cases where I see a very high flow going directly inside the aneurysm. Um, in those cases, yes, I would put coils, but also more than one flow diverter in order to really change uh, the flow, uh, um, that it's not anymore a jet inside the aneurysm, but it's turned in towards the carotid. Uh, sorry, uh, Isil uh, first, and then Renee again. Uh, actually, I have two things to say. One uh, regarding the parent's artery occlusion, I have uh, seen and treated at least three cases uh, who had parent artery occlusion for uh, with surgery uh, by endovascular means, whatever, and uh, developing ACOM aneurysm in the long term follow up that I ended up treating those cases. So it is not without any risk. So parent artery occlusion has its risks uh, beyond uh, the potential less collaterals in the elderly period, et cetera. Uh, number two, uh, for the giant aneurysms, if they are intradural, 
uh, we coil uh, except for the posterior circulation where mass effect might be an issue. But for the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in the posterior circulation, we have uh, difficulty in the decision. But in the ICA, um, we uh, coil. Uh, and uh, we do not put the flow diverter in the same session in uh, as a, uh, a policy that we developed after you know hearing or experiencing certain issues regarding the rupture. Uh, so we uh, coil first and then wait for at least like six months. And when the uh, coil, but like, you know, old time coiling, pack, really pack. And then it recanalizes for anyway. I mean, uh, giant aneurysms recanalize. Then as a second step, we go ahead and put a flow diverter. The idea behind this, having a uh, more stable uh, thrombus, a long time uh, developing thrombus, and also uh, from the experience that uh, the aneurysms uh, which get uh, rupture after uh, flow diverter treatment uh, were uh, usually uh, the ones uh, that were coiled and the flow diverter placement uh, at the same time during the same session. The uh, recanalized aneurysms, uh, when we put flow diverter, nothing happened. I mean, uh, the um, recurrent aneurysms, we didn't have uh, or we, we have not heard any such case. So this is our current policy, uh, stage one coiling and stage two flow diverter treatment for the ICA intradural joint aneurysms. And you put one flow diverter? Uh, depends, so, uh, de depending on how much wall is uh, actually involved. Uh, could be one, could be two. Okay. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are not allowed to put more than two in an in aneurysm uh, okay. currently because of the uh, Ministry of Health policy. Rene, you had a comment uh, before? Yes, uh, several comments um, concerning the question whether to coil or not. Uh, I think that the large of the aneurysm, I mean, I... 100% agree was what Dodi said, uh, but there's another way to answer to this, which is to say the larger the aneurysm, the less it makes sense to place coils. I mean, a 15, 20 millimeter aneurysm, you can put some coils, but when it's 40, 50 millimeter, how many coils you want to place and where? So it seems to be a kind of contradiction because the larger the aneurysm is, the less I know where I should place coils and I don't do it, in fact. Um, concerning um, what Isil just said, it seems to go in the same direction that un, um, that non-thrombosed aneurysms are more dangerous to treat than partially thrombosed aneurysm. Mm -hmm. That's the policy of first placing coils and thrombus and, and change to occur. And I'm sure that <laughs> there is something behind it. The unthrombosed the giant arm more at risk of rupture. Isil, yes, can but... you prepare your case? Uh, sorry, Dolly, one second. Isil, can you prepare your case to share in the meantime? Sure. Okay. Dolly, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say that these very large giant tenders with no thrombosis in it, uh, they usually are very prone to rupture the next minute you see them. So uh, it, you must be very aggressive with coils at least uh, i don't know uh, in order to avoid uh, the rupture which is going to happen uh, i think uh, very very soon uh, so but yes i agree go ahead diesel uh let me just remove the okay so uh, he's not only giant but he's also basilar so that's yes uh, that's yeah. an intradural yeah. intradural 
Yes, yes, definitely. As you see here, the patient, uh, a young male patient, presented with uh, swallowing difficulties, severe ataxia, moderate left hemiparesis, a uh, joint aneurysm of the basilar trunk, and, uh, not uh, too white neck, I mean white neck, but uh, had a jet uh, flow into the uh, joint aneurysm and also has a small aneurysm on the other side. You see the mass effect of the aneurysm uh, on the brain stem already. Uh, and... Um, this is the uh, video showing the uh, smaller aneurysm on the other side. Uh, and uh, there are very small uh, posterior communicating arteries. So uh, uh, here you ask, uh, how should we treat? So um, yes, let me interrupt you for a second. And uh, let me ask uh, the panel, are you OK with that? Of course, that's why I prepared that way, actually. So in turn, uh, uh, try to not be too long, uh, but in turn, please, uh, uh, how would you treat this? Please, don't be shy. Who, who? Me? <laughs> yes. You, everybody. Well, uh, in, uh, I would, I would, well, I would be very scared. So the first thing I would do is try to, to place a balloon and see if okay, those... hold on actually hold on a second i've i've received some uh some messages that uh nobody's able to see the screen uh nick please uh nick we need help here because easel uh easel screen is not being shared okay all right so um while you talk, uh, Isil, can you go back for the rest of the audience so they can see they can see okay. the screen? Okay, please, Dodi, go ahead. Okay. No, I, I would really like to occlude that basilar artery if possible. So uh, I would for probably first try to do a balloon test occlusion and see if those uh, communicating arteries, especially in a young patient, uh, usually you get you get uh, um, away with it. Otherwise, uh, um, well. Uh, coiling would be my first option, uh, knowing that it will be canalized and then place a flow diverter. Thank you. Next. Whatever I would do here I would feel uh, very uncomfortable. A uh, flow diverter, I would have fear of having a rupture. A parent artery occlusion, which would be the same first step, would mean that I would have to uh, occlude... Um, the eye cast probably on each side and create significant ischemia so uh that i mean whatever we do here <laughs> i fear complication to to occur yes anybody else wants to say their approach no i mean i i, I, I agree i think it's uh it's daunting let's assume that she doesn't pass the test occlusion she has small pcoms but let's assume she doesn't then i i would i would be offering flow diversion uh the question is with or without coiling. And I think I'm persuaded these days by uh, what Renee says, how much coil is enough for a big aneurysm like this? I'm a little encouraged. It looks like the right ICA may come off in a segment of the vessel that isn't uh, incorporated into the aneurysm. I'm not sure. Anybody else? Harris, is there any surgical option? I we don't. Can... I think is okay. that the answer? Is that his answer? Yeah, it's no, right? <laughs> Max, what were you saying? I would. I think there's like a shadow of like an Ica Ica coming off distal to the. So I I would really try to figure out where the like Icas are, uh, and are there any branches coming off the actual aneurysm itself? If not, I would probably coil first. I would stage it. Try to yes, yeah, so take a ton of coil. Uh, but looks like there is a projection where we could still put a uh, flow diverter after coiling. We might like be able to see, but ultimately, I think it would take a flow diverter to to cure it. Isil, can you show the previous the previous slide for a second, please? Of course. Yeah, I'm I'm just waiting for the first endonasal approach 
uh, <laughs> with clipping, but probably not not in this case. Wouldn't start with this, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, go ahead, Diesel. Unless uh, anybody else wants to say anything else. Well, so there's a piece that we we haven't really discussed much, and there's been the discussion of uh, you know like intravascular imaging. But uh, one of the things that can facilitate cases like this, in which we started to do, is just doing a uh, an angio with a with a good Dyna CT to uh, kind of resolve some of the um, some of the issues that we've been discussing. I, I don't have it in a number of the cases that I have because it you know predates some of the some of the work that uh, my cases predate the introduction to some of this really high resolution imaging, but it can really kind of, it's sort of the answer key in some ways. So to understanding like to, uh, where are the perforators. Where the and perforators. The... But, but I would say, assuming that I, I agree with what's been said, it looks like there's a large uh, AICA that comes up, maybe a little distal on the right and um, maybe like a pica on the left. And so um, assuming that there are no uh, large perforators that come off of this uh, aneurysm, I mean, my approach would be to uh, gel a microcatheter or microcatheter as if you want to approach each of the sides separately, just so that you can float over at first, uh, really see and make sure that your stents are or stent is opposed. Though I think I would advocate using more than one stent for a lesion like this. And then you can coil away without worrying about the uh, implications either on the, you know, the conduit that you're trying to preserve because it's protected, um, or the implications related to uh, ultimately understanding that you've done what you think you what you thought you did with the float averters. Thank you, Isil. Go ahead. What do you think about the size of the neck, uh, Isil? The size of the neck of the aneurysm on the left. Uh, actually, the neck is not that wide. I mean, of course, wider than four millimeter, no doubt about that, but uh, not. Uh, too wide compared with the size of the aneurysm mass, actually. Uh, but uh, but there was, and there's a clear jet into the aneurysm, which actually bothered us very much, uh, that we worried about having a uh, aggressive clotting in, uh, induced by the flow of diversion if we do only flow of diversion. On the other hand, uh, if we coil, then there would be increased mass effect. Um, and uh, so, uh, you, as I said, our usual approach is actually coiling first and then wait for the regrowth and do flow of diversion. But in this case, uh, we didn't, I mean, I, I couldn't dare to pack the scenerism with coiling because of the uh, mass effect. It already has uh, had the mass effect. Uh, so uh, it was not an option for me. Uh, and uh, parent artery occlusion, uh, we couldn't uh, actually uh, dare to do that because of the PCOMs are very small, uh, not effective PCOMs. Uh, flow of diversion with telescopic stents or flow of diverters, how many and what will be the medication uh, were our, uh, our questions. Uh, we used to do telescopic stents in the old times when we have such aneurysms uh, and we don't, the, uh, before the era of flow of diverters, uh, it worked in uh, many of the patients uh that might be another option uh probably uh the uh, flo uh, plotting can be slower uh, which may perhaps decrease the risk of uh acute rupture i don't know but i mean just based on the old time experience so these were the uh, two options that we thought uh and uh, we ended up uh, putting uh, three uh, pipeline device, uh, flow diverters, one big, I mean, one long, uh, to cover the entire segment, and uh, two smaller uh, to shorter uh, for, uh, to cover the neck only. Uh, the Both aneurysms are at the uh, same level. And uh, you see the uh, post-operative angio, which is very, very scary. <laughs> no blood going into the aneurysm. Uh, uh, I mean, 
of course there is but uh, apparently there is big uh, contrast stagnation but also, uh, pay- sorry, Ejil, you also have a kind of a pulsation of the contrast, uh, or not, the, from the from the film, from the movie, uh, before the 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 movie. Well, let, let the, me uh, play yeah. again. So yeah, there is a little feeling in the aneurysm, and you see the outflow, right? That's what you mean, Dodi, right? You see the outflow of. Uh... Uh, not really. You have to go back to two slides, <laughs> Ejil. Oh, okay. Oops. Okay, now you go forward. And yeah, you see the movie, look, it, it's kind of pulsating the contrast around the the flow diversion, no? Look at yes. it. Yes, I mean, back. but and doesn't that happen usually? You have like a Windcastle effect. That, that, well, not we, usually, but if it happens, I would be very scared at this point. And there is some outflow too. There's undiluted contrast coming out. I mean, yes, there, that there line of undiluted. There has to be otherwise. So, so Dodi, right. if you had this, what would you do? If you had, this, <laughs> yeah. what would you do? Would you add some other flow diverters? Because that's the only thing that you can do, in fact. Yeah. Or well, I would go out and turn on my motorcycle, and we'll be away <laughs> Run away. two seconds. <laughs> but it, it, if I had to do that, I would consider even. Um, covered stent in this case, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. at this point, but anyway, so yes, just adding flow diverters. I would be very, very scared. Please I, go I, for it, show us the result. Oh, oh. So, yeah. yeah, another question Did you this ever do it? Like uh, hold stand. on, hold on, hold on, Max, one, one at a time. Uh, 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 uh Renee started before you. Go ahead, Renee. No, no. You, you said you would put a um, covered stent, which indeed I think is, is a great idea. Um, did you ever had some situations? Uh, um, no, uh, probably the opposite. I, I placed the flow diverter where I did place a covered stent. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. The, um, not not with the flow diverter. I I, I did place the covered stent uh, by themselves. Yes, mm. and Max. I never had a rupture of the aneurysm. Mm. I agree with covered uh, stent. We used covered stent in one vertebral joint aneurysm with a uh, brain stem uh, compression, and uh, the patient had a significant edema and had a few months. Uh, and uh, having um, uh, gastrostomy uh, because couldn't swallow anything. He had a terrible uh, couple of months due to um, brainstem edema. Uh, And uh, finally, he was out of that period uh, intact, and uh, we were able to send him home. Uh, intact and uh, it worked. I mean, he didn't rupture, but uh, all the edema and inflammation uh, in the aneurysm because of the acute thrombosis, he had very significant mass effect uh, for a few months. It was many uh, years ago before the uh, flow of diverter era, actually, but it was in the distal vertebral artery uh, uh, segment, not in the basilar artery. Max, you had a comment before? No, I was thinking covered stand too. It just looked like that eye cup was just like a little bit too close to the neck. Close. But Yeah, yeah. Um, early days, so just to in the early days of this, there was like consideration of doing prophylactic VP shunting for patients like these, like say the mass effect squishes the aqueduct or something. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, that's true. Um, but it may also uh, provoke uh, the rupture of the aneurysm, no? I suppose with over drainage, yes, I guess it depends on the type of shunt. Please well, easy. Yeah, usually we we put a variable, you put you know, like a, a valve that um you can adjust. And you keep it kind of medium unless you need it, then you can open it up a bit. 
Yeah, especially for the fusiform aneurysms, the, the atherosclerotic yes. uh, joint aneurysms. Yes. Uh, Go ahead and uh, show us uh, the rest of the case. Okay. And uh, the patient was on prasugrel only. With a, a we still do a light transmission agrogometry with uh, the inhibition level, not PRU. Our uh, lab does not give PRU. Ninety-five percent inhibition rate, very high, but still. Uh, in order to slow down uh, the uh, clotting, uh, the aggressive clotting, uh, we decided to start um, claxane as well, the low molecular weight heparin, uh, in addition to the good old uh, dexamethasone. So two times uh, 0.6 cc claxane, uh, and uh, dexamethasone. The swallowing difficulty and the taxia had some improvement, no change in the left hemiparesis, but we were able to send him home post-operative third day with uh, prasugrel and Zeralto uh, because he's going to use for a long time. That was the idea. Uh, and dexamethasone and um Although the patient initially improved, uh, his neurologic status started to worsen progressively during the following six weeks. Uh, he, he became not being able to walk by himself. Every week we were talking with his family saying that, oh, he's this bad, that bad, uh, and uh, he couldn't uh, actually walk. Uh, and uh, this was the post-operative fourth week MR control uh, showing the uh, thrombosis. Uh, and after actually uh, four months, uh, he started to uh, getting better, recover gradually. And this is the six months DSA on this patient. Uh, Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, that both aneurysms uh, got occluded. There is, there may still be some feeling from here. Uh, he was neurologically intact at six months. I'm going to show the uh, sectional imaging as well. This is five and a half year CTA. And this is two year control DSA. Uh, this is two years control MR shrinkage of the aneurysm mass. Still, there is some mass, but not, uh, you know, uh, definitely shrunken. And this is the three years control on this patient. Aneurysm almost disappeared. I mean, even shrunk more between two years and three years. So um, I don't know if we were lucky and the patient was lucky or uh, uh, um, anticoagulation plus anti-aggregation worked and uh, prevented uh, acute rupture of the aneurysm. However, for the four months, he really had significant mass effect and a significant uh, neurological deficit. Uh, but after four months, he recovered. So this is the this is the case to discuss. Yeah, that's uh, that's fantastic. You know, this is incredible. Uh, uh, such a dangerous aneurysm. You know, like this is one that uh, you know. I don't know. I don't even know what number to place here in terms of complication rate, and uh, you show at the as uh, inc an incredible result. Before I leave uh, other comments, uh, um, next is gonna be uh, Dan Saline, and after which uh, uh, Rene. Um, um, anybody wants to comment while Dan prepares the slides? Question, Ishil. So, how, how for how long did you keep him on the on the anticoagulation and antiplatelet? Uh, antiplatelet is uh, more than one year. Uh, actually, 
uh, and anticoagulation is uh, at, uh, for the uh, four months. Uh, after four months, uh, we uh, started to taper so that uh, because uh, the MRI there are uh, there were MRIs in between, and uh, uh, there was still flow in it. Uh, and we wanted to uh, uh, stop the anticoagulation so that the aneurysm can get occluded at some point. That was the idea. So after four months, we started uh, uh, to stop um, the Zeralto. Not uh, like this, but, you know, uh, in a, uh, a few weeks' time. I mean, uh, it is not, there's no scientific uh, explanation <laughs> for the regime, uh, just uh, based on the patient's clinical presentation and uh, symptomatology. All right, then, um, can you share, please? Then unmute yourself and share, please. Yep, I was just trying to share. I'm not uh, able to. Uh, okay, there we go. We are not seeing it though. Yep, yep. I have it uh, pop up in just a moment here. Okay. Ah, okay. All right, there we go. Thank you. I uh, hang on. let me just switch displays. Okay, can you see a uh, normal presentation? Yeah. Full screen, go ahead. great. Okay, here we go. These are my uh, disclosures. Uh, so this was a uh, this is kind of a fun case. Um, it has a little bit of a surprise, and there are some elements of this case that have been touched on previously. This was, um, I showed this, I think, at a uh, SNIS uh, pipeline panel uh, in uh, Toronto. So some of you may recognize it. This is a 27-year-old female, new onset of right third and sixth cranial nerve palsies. Patient had uh, came in and had a CTA. It's a donut-shaped aneurysm, very similar to the, uh, at least morphology of the aneurysm that uh, Dr. Shep, that Renee showed uh, previously. Um, let me talk about why why we get, uh, why we might have donut-shaped aneurysms. This is actually the third donut-shaped aneurysm that I've treated. Uh, so brought the patient is in that for the donut. Is that thrombus, right? We agree. Is that thrombus in the middle? Well, actually, so that's a good question. So if it's thrombus, are you saying it's acute thrombus or chronic thrombus? Don't in other words, hard. is it hard or soft? Hard, chronic thrombus. Hey, Tom, is, is this what you were saying as well? What do you say, Rene? I did not taste, but I would say hard. <laughs> <Chronic>. <laughs> okay, so... So he's, a, he's already done the case. Uh, uh, so we've got two votes for hard. Eitan, is this what you were saying as well? Or you were saying, I think you were saying soft. This was, the, right. this was actually a debate no, in our lab in, in, during the case. And we are going to find out, actually. because uh, uh, I, I didn't say that. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Maybe the MRI would give us a more sense. I don't know. Oh, it's sort of, yeah, the signal intensity. Okay. Well, we're going to find out because I had not planned on entering the aneurysm, except that it turned out to be ruptured. So, uh, so just clarify rapture for the younger audience. Why you're saying it's ruptured here? Okay, so it's a uh, it's a CC fistula. We're seeing the uh, inferior vitreosal sinus here and jugular vein, and we're also seeing a few other veins here um, coursing towards the posterior fossa, including the superior. You know, SPS is right here, and there's some other smaller veins here. So. Uh, um, do you want to? Do you want me to stop to uh, so people can comment on you know yeah. yes, how they please. might want to approach treatment? Go ahead. Uh, Sorry, I missed it. How, how did it happen? I missed it. Sorry, Dan. Uh, it just this was just the presentation. I was just told this patient was discovered to have oh, this okay. large aneurysm, presented okay, okay. with third and certain six nerve palsies. Did a CTA. Nobody saw this on the CTA. The CTA, as usual, like has a lot of venous contamination in it, and uh, so it's kind of impossible to see. And I'm sorry, um, and then put on the schedule for Friday morning. So yeah. it's a surprise. It was a fun surprise. So okay. no previous antiplatelets before that DSA. Uh no, we well we had we had we had we did put the patient on antiplatelets in anticipation of doing a full diversion case for what we thought was a giant you know cavernous aneurysm. So yes, the patient did have antiplatelets. The you know starting from the day prior when the patient arrived at our institution. So could the thrombus have been partially uh, resolved? because of the antiplatelets. We saw this a couple of times, explaining also uh, the fistula or- Oh, oh, the, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, 
like the thrombus in the core of the donut or or just that there was other thrombus in the aneurysm? No, no, the, the middle one. The middle one. Yeah, well, actually, so actually, so um, the middle thrombus can only be seen sort of from a from like a underneath, essentially, from like a real sort of transfacial kind of view. So we're not we're not the, the, the thrombus in the middle is still there. It's just that yeah. we're not we're not seeing it on either of these projections. I'll show it to you in a moment because we'll look at the 3Ds. In fact, do you want me to show the 3Ds to uh, so people can have a better sense of what it looks like? Yeah, um, OK, OK. So I'll show you the 3Ds here. So this, this is what this looks like. This is the morphology here. Um, so there is sort of like a shadow of the preserved vessel coming through this segment of aneurysm. And there's also pretty bad stenosis here. We'll get into that in just a moment. It definitely makes catheterization a little more challenging, both in terms of selecting with the wire as well as in terms of tracking a 27 catheter through this segment, although something has made this much easier over time uh, uh, recently, and that actually recently became available in Europe. So we can get into that in just a moment. Um, there's the stenosis. And uh, we kind of look at the rest of this here. here. Here's the here's the donut, which you can see is still is still very much intact. And then what is uh, that small we, vessel past the stenosis. There's a small past the stenosis. What is yeah, it? Yeah, it's the ophthalmic, ophthalmic origin. Yeah. Uh, and then we can look at the uh, transaxial images just because I think that they kind of help us resolve the uh, the size of the hole between artery and vein, sort of back here. Um, and you can see this, uh, you know, the thrombus, uh, the core of the donut is still intact, bagel, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so the hole is actually fairly small. And seeing where it is is actually extremely helpful. To know exactly, um, you know, what we're trying to target because this might be challenging to close, and um, you know, can be really helpful to to see exactly what we are trying to close, the disease that we are treating essentially. Do you want to discuss uh, sort of how different people yeah, might please. might approach this? Okay. Uh, anybody wants to say like what's their approach? Um, um, please go ahead, just talk. Anybody? How are the collaterals? Could you occlude the artery? Um, I probably could have. She's 26. Um, I probably could have gotten away with that, but it, at the age of 26, I wasn't. It wasn't a. It wasn't a huge consideration. I'd probably... I, I think you can still go ahead with flow diversion for the aneurysm, and then you know you could fix the CC fistula, and maybe transvenous or something like that. So you, Kim, you would not uh, treat the. You would not because of the fistula. Uh, uh, call the aneurysm because one of the questions is like how effective is going to no. be since uh, the demand is going to be even more than the usual like ophthalmic through the dome of the aneurysm kind of concept now there's you you have even like a quite a, a gradient of pressure so even more demand through the through the flow diverter like you would not close the fistula because of that i i would close the fistula but i think you could do that transvenous okay anybody else Maybe placing a microcatheter inside the aneurysm and have a better view of what happens. Yeah, you might want to do that too. I mean, in preparation, you know, put a catheter inside. Um, and I think, like Renee, if you're going to use coils in the aneurysm, I would probably reconstruct the flow diverter first, reconstruct the carotid, so that you see what you're doing, and then start coiling if you if you want to. And the coils probably will lay posteriorly first so um that might help you but um but i still think you can close it transvenous my main concern here would be, my main concern here would be how can i get to the ica beyond the aneurysm and whether the clot can be a kind of support to better enter the distal ica but you're going to tell us Okay, great. Should I uh, should I continue here? Yeah. So you know you're so thank you for some uh, you know brilliant analysis. Um, I um, decided to uh, treat the fistula trans arterial, just thinking that I can jail a catheter, I can do the flow diversion case, and um, then I can do whatever coiling that I can. And I, I leave, I've given myself one more option actually. So if if it's not completely treated, I've given myself the transvenous route as a sort of secondary option. As you mentioned, there's going to be tremendous demand. The patient is now also on dual antiplatelets and heparinized during this case as well. And so that makes it even more difficult to shut the uh, to shut the uh, the fistula down. And so giving myself one more route for uh, a potential uh, issues I thought was, uh, was important. So first thing, uh, I'll just point out for some of the um, people in the audience who may have less experience with flow diversion, 
taking some time to choose really good working projections is totally critical in a case like this. I'll also mention that choosing a roadmap off of the arteriographic run, it's called DSA roadmap on Siemens, it's called smart maps on Philips, is really important too, because it's a sharper roadmap and you can choose a very early phase so that the aneurysm is not completely opacified, which can make it sort of difficult to see through. And so these are some really important things that set you up for success in a case like this. Notice on my lateral projection, I can really get a beautiful view of that stenosis and the outflow. And um, on my AP on my AP view, I have kind of like the um, that shadow of the preserved vessel kind of centered here. So um, I did the catheterization with a uh, with a um, phenom twenty twenty four uh, with uh, phenom twenty seven and an Aristotle twenty four wire. And the key thing about the twenty four wire here is I'm trying to catch the groove of this kind of shadow of a vessel. And there we go, I caught it. If you'll notice, I missed it the first two times. Just go back here. This was actually the entire duration of the uh, catheterization. And this is what these wires have done for us. So I'm trying to catch this groove. I've got a sort of long sloping kind of curve on the on the wire. And here we go, the third time it works and I'm through. And then the second piece is that because there's no step off using a 24 wire with a 27 catheter, you're not gonna get stuck on the uh, stenosis at the distal aspect of the outflow here, which you certainly would using a 14 wire uh, in a case like this. So here's the second piece, which is, does the does the wire support the catheter coming around this turn? And with the 24 wire, it very easily does. So that's made our lives much, much easier. I think that there's nothing that's made these cases safer and easier over the last 10 years than the introduction of the 24 wires. So um, I, uh, another piece that I'll note is that um, I did build a multi-stent construct here. I ended up using three stents. And we talked about the different performance characteristics of different stents. With Pipeline Flex, when you load the stent more, you get more radial force. And that's important for fixing stenoses like these. One of the things that I notice about Vantage in just playing around with it in a flow model and what I've seen in Surpass is that those devices like to be deployed under quite a bit of tension. And that's when they're sort of in a kind of natural state where they can expand. And um, doing a case like this with a stent that um, ribbons a little bit as you add more load is probably not ideal because you're gonna have a lot of difficulties fixing the stenosis. I'll also add that the radial force of multiple stents, I think is very helpful in a case like this to help force that uh, that stenosis open. So here we go, here are my three stents. You can see my jailed microcatheter here. And, uh, and then we started coiling. So here we're just coiling in the same projection that I used for the flow diversion. And there was a, question, a debate in the lab, which is, this is what I call a coil time-lapse. So this is one, one coil after the next, um, which is, is that clot in the middle hard or soft? So different people bet in different ways that we that we saw here. We changed our projection here, and you can see that even though I'm packing coils quite tightly, I'm not entering the core of this at all. I'm not changing that center at all. So I agree that it's thrombus, but I think that it's mature, um, organized thrombus. And so essentially, I have very little control over the catheter, but I know that the hole is right around here. So it's right around maybe three or four o'clock, if you think of this as uh, this ring here as a clock. So every time I see coils coming out in this location, I start using smaller, softer coils in order to pack them a little bit more densely. But of course, it is uh, not much control. So here's my coil time lapse. I'll save you the pain of this since this was 90 coils. Every now and again, I'm just doing a little puff of contrast and I still see venous opacification. A little puff of contrast, venous opacification. So here we go. I finally reached 90 and I no longer see any vein. And uh, within about three months, the uh, the patient's symptoms, uh, third and sixth cranial nerve palsies had resolved. And she came back at six months. And the angiography looks exactly like this. You can't really see through the coil mass to see what's happening with respect to the stent. But notice that you do have this, um, you know, contractile force of the, uh, of the coils. Um, it's a much smaller donut than it was previously. Um, and you typically only see that once a, uh, once the stents are completely owned, endothelialized and the, and the lesion is cured. So I think there's a lot of interesting things to think about in this case, um, approaching, um, you know, a CC fistula that also, uh, needs flow diversion, um, sort of some of the issues related to the architecture of the lesion and a, uh, ultimately a successful outcome for the patient. And the retraction of this uh, clot uh, that really like, you know, the resolution of this clot that led to the re re reduction in mass is really, really interesting to see. Um, while uh, um, while other prepare, uh, um, uh, while uh, um, Rene, while you prepare your uh, PowerPoint for your case, uh, if anybody has comments about this, please uh, just talk. You're trying to speak, Kim? No, no, I, I think it's beautiful. I mean, it was fantastic. Um, Any just, the only other question I would have to say is, if you start a case where there's a CC fistula, would you consider 
like stopping the antiplatelets, forgetting about that, see if it like occludes on its own or, um, and then come back a few weeks later or something like this. I did. I, I thought about a lot of those things. Um, I, I think that given her age and the cranial neuropathy, I thought that it was best to try to, you know, push this thing to cure as quickly as possible. Cause I thought we'd have the, be the best chance in a 26 year old of giving her a, you know, a lifetime, you know, functional third and sixth uh, cranial nerves. And um, I also thought that uh, if we were to cure the dural fistula in the moment, um, it might make it quite a bit more challenging to see whatever we were trying to do later on with respect to the, uh, with respect to the um, aneurysm. And so that's where I thought, you know, I think I can get away with doing these uh, simultaneously with a jail. I, I, I started out with a Navian actually, and I switched out to a Phenom Plus because I want to put a, uh, a, a 17 microcatheter um, parallel to a, a Phenom Plus through my BMX. So, you know, the, the system did change a little bit, um, but I don't know. I, I thought I could get away with it all, uh, all in the moment. And so, uh, so I decided to, uh, to give it a try. Um, I have a question. So the uh, patient's uh, symptoms never got worse after the treatment? No, uh, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I'm just, I mean, she did have a complete third and sixth cranial neuropathy already. And so um, I, I'm trying to remember she developed just a little bit of facial pain um, afterwards. Um, that may have been it, but uh, but no, nothing, nothing terribly substantial. So she had total ophthalmoplegia to begin with? Correct. Is this the situation? Yep. I, I, eyelid shut uh, from the third, complete third uh -huh. and complete sixth. Yes. Okay. Because um, I had a case. Uh, it was the worst case. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the worst cases, I would say. Bilateral ICA aneurysms. Both are uh, large to giant, like two centimeter uh, each. And um, the patient patient had headache to start with, but the aneurysms were big, and uh, I decided to treat. I mean, uh, despite that, the only symptom is uh, a headache, and uh, I I did flow diverter treatment for both sides uh, in the same session. That might be a, a mistake, and after like two days or three days, and she had on uh, prasugrel as usual, having steroid as usual in all of our large and giant aneurysms. However, uh, at um, like uh, three days after or something, uh, just a few days, uh, she had a sudden headache and uh, had uh, had the ophthalmoplegia on one side. And when we did the MRI, we saw that the aneurysm is ruptured and uh, to end up in CCF. And we treated CCF, uh, but because of the flow diverter, uh, we went from the transvenous side and occlude from the uh, venous side, the fistula, and uh, she, cut, she had total ophthalmoplegia on that side. And three days later, uh, while we were, you know, okay, it's going to go, mass effect, etc. She had the other side rupture this time. And uh, the patient is already one eye was shot. And the other one, I, I don't have any option but to parent artery occlusion. Because, you know, uh, first uh, we did uh, another flow diverter in case we can, you know, uh, handle it uh, with flow diverter, keeping the parent artery. But of course, uh, there was uh, still uh, CCF and uh, I ended up closing that parent artery and that eye uh, opened up by time. Uh, but it took some time and it was the, uh, I mean, I cannot forget that patient. Uh, eventually, she had at least one side uh, recovered. The other one got better, but not totally. It was a disaster case for me. So I was, uh, that's why I asked if she got any worse or no, but she's uh, started with total ophthalmoplegia anyway. So yeah, that's right. uh, at least in that regard, uh, she, anything would be improvement. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Isil. 
Um, thank you, Dan. Um, I know it's hard to stop discussion, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, we want to see also the case from uh, uh, René. Um, we're running a little behind. Um, René, please go ahead and uh, and uh, you, you're sharing the screen. So um, Okay, so we've been actually, seeing a lot of... No, very... not sharing the screen yet. Please go ahead and share the screen. Okay, I, I shared my screen. Okay, do you have it? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, very good. I mean... Uh, impressive. I was wondering after uh, 50, between 50 and 90 calls, whether you would have considered some liquid embolics too. And um, okay, here is the, the patient I'm going to show a previous history of sinusitis and headaches. And um, well, you asked for giant aneurysm. So he's also another giant aneurysm, wow. which is indeed um, like this, where if you look more into, I mean, we did a balloon test occlusion that failed. So consider pro proximal telescopic flow diverter, telescope uh, proximal from proximal to distal because the access was quite okay to be reached. But there was a stenosis that you may see, but you don't really know, is it a stenosis or is it a jet phenomenon? And in fact, that was indeed a stenosis because when the first flow diverter was in place, uh, this is what it looked like. So um, may I ask whether this should be uh, left or or not, the stenosis? Um, my, my understanding of this is like, uh, uh, you know, this is secondary probably to the mass effect from the aneurysm. So in our experience, and, uh, you know, Kim will show us probably cases uh, in the next talk, but it's really like that can actually improve over time. So um, I wouldn't necessarily treat the stenosis at this stage. The, the question is, would you angioplasty now before you put another stent? Because once you put two or three stents there, it's going to lock it in, more or less. It, it becomes more difficult to yeah. also go in and may dislodge the whole construct. That was exactly my concern. Um, that's why I indeed placed a, a PTA balloon, which helped a little bit, but not as much as, as intended. Hold on. Uh, this is not a PTA balloon. This here is a remodeling balloon. So, of course, it does not help. But I think at some point a PTA balloon was placed. No, sorry, this was just a um, remodeling balloon. So, uh, of course, it does not help. But then access was um, required to have an intermediate catheter. It must be a Sophia to get access here to the distal part. And um, when delivering the distal stand, you could uh, pull on the whole system to make it shorter. But of course, when you have to read release the flow diverters and when you push it already extends back to to the aneurysm so here are some of the additional placement that were done um it must be number two i guess or number three the second one was placed more proximal and this is number three to do the junction between the distal part and the construct and here it's about to be fine but you see the Sophia has been taken backwards, but here the flow diverter is not absolutely willing to open. And usually to make it open, you need to push on it. <laughs> so that's the kind of game, I guess you all know that we have to place in this situation to push and pull. But if you push more, then you reopen the construct and you have to do it a couple of times, of course, taking the longest possible things. So now there is more which is open, and now the whole flow diverter, the longest one, is being opened, and then this is being pulled inside and delivered. But you may see that he is not completely open. So these kind of stupid games where at this point you don't want to lose access again. So some additional uh, navigation inside, adding some materials, doing indeed a, a PTA with coronary balloon. So all this took quite some time, but in the end there was a construction. Um, I did not consider to place coils here just because I don't know how many would have been required and there was no CCF. So And it's extra dural, so I had no concern. But still it took some time and you see that at this point 
situation starts to be ugly, despite all antiplatelets that were given preventively, heparin that was added, but it took some time and some clots are starting to occur. And then when you say, oh, oh I must do something, then obviously the clots that were here are gone inside the flow diverter. So, well, you guess what we've been doing here is to put some stent trievers. We do usually those maneuvers with with um, um, more than one stent trever that enable to to get it out. And um, well, at this stage, at this stage, I wondered whether this stenosis was still potentially the reason for the clot to occur, and that's why I added a core stent here to make it properly open, which is then the end of part one. So this is the um, immediate result. Patient woke on fine. She had ophthalmoplegia, of course, which... Um... New ophthalmoplegia. New ophthalmoplegia? Sorry? New yeah, ophthalmoplegia. Had... No, no, no. She had... No, no. It was the ophthalmoplegia. Oh, she okay. Already on. before which is then end of part one, but this is a follow-up here where, I mean, it looks super good, but super good is this part. And if you look on, on MR, um, hmm, this no, no, is... You think, is this like a post, like infectious aneurysm if she had sinusitis history? Like, is that what happened? I guess so, I guess so yes, I guess so. Because it's in the it's in the sphenoid sinus, this thing, right? Mm -hmm. or and she had just before her symptoms started, she had this episode of ENT infection. So we presume that it was uh, secondary to this. And now we have the control, which angiographically looks good on MR. It did not seem, I mean, these are not exactly the same ones. I tried to search, but it seemed to be more or less the same side. Size and by the way, comparing the size of those super large aneurysms, I feel always very uncomfortable because I don't think I'm properly able to compare without uh, using a use which makes a fusion of both pictures. And then you scroll with the mouse to see whether the aneurysm is smaller or not. Otherwise, it's too large and irregular to properly measure something. At least as uh, size seems to be quite similar it changed somehow but is it more larger and less longer it's not exactly the same level also so uh still because of the persistent aneurysm um the idea was to add other flow diverters which um we did but we did not only uh, add a flow diverter we did what what i call the onyx sandwich technique which is to potentialize the efficiency of the flow diverter by adding some liquid embolics, which means practically to first place a microcatheter, which must be here. You must see here the marathon. Then number two, add a flow diverter. I mean, a layer of flow diverter, enough lengths. And number so three... Jail, jail, so jail that marathon? Jail the marathon in between two layers of flow diverter and then mm -hmm. add a balloon in order to be able to add some liquid embolics. Is and... that a clinic? What kind of balloon is it? Is that what balloon do you use for them? Um, the longest remodeling balloon we have, so it must be a three centimeter remodeling balloon. Is it Copernic or is it Eclipse? So the big Copernic is a eight is a eight centimeters. This is a three, uh, but, but which one I, I don't remember. By looking at the pictures, I mean but we don't have anything that long that I know of. Hey, hey, and then <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome. So um, I mean a three centimeter um, remodeling balloon, adding some different layers on and on. Um, in order to occlude it and rule it completely out. This is a follow-up that two years later, where in the meantime, you can see that after adding some onyx in between the layers, the aneurysm very rapidly shrunk down. 
So I'm going to show more on the Onyx Sandwich uh, during Alice that we're going to do in a couple of weeks, but we can already have some discussions going on on this. Fantastic. And I, indeed, I just wondered if um, in the patient before with the CCF, adding a balloon through the flow diverters and putting some liquid embolics, is, if anyway there was a fistula, it would have been um, uh, a way to, to reduce the amount of coils. Thank you, Rene. This is a fantastic, uh, innovative, new, like uh, anybody wants to comment on this? So my only thing is, uh, are you nervous about Onyx escaping distally beyond? How do you, how do you contend with that? Uh, is, what is your, your, your preventative strategy from distal embolization of Onyx? Because I think that's the biggest concern we have because we can't go through the damn stent flow diverters, you know? Indeed, uh, but you you see it diffusing quite quite slowly. At some time, if it goes in between the two layers, then the diffusion may be more rapid. So injection is being done on the subtracted fluoroscopy, as available on the on the new Icono system, which avoids each time to make a blank roadmap. Then you obtain it immediately, and you can see each drop that you get. Point one, point two. If the ophthalmic is there, you must see whether it's taken in charge or at least occlude the ICA proximally enough to make sure that you've got a reverse flow to the ophthalmic, which is what we did. Ah. Uh. Okay. Which Onyx uh, thirty four eighteen does it? What uh, five hundred is not available anymore. Unfortunately, we did the first one with five hundred, and now we take thirty four. Anybody else? Yeah, Aton and I had a case. We were doing this in a carotid blowout once, where despite having a big balloon in there, it kind of leaked out distally as. Adnan is suggesting. Uh, I don't we know exactly. MBCA, Kim, we were using MBCA. NBCA, yes, we were using MBA, NBCA to kind of do it rapidly. <laughs> but uh, it leaked out around everything, and uh, um, and we ended up with a distal embolus of, uh, of liquid embolic. But um, it does seem so like a worthwhile technique to develop, though. I mean, because there are we times where... You want to make a covered stent in a way. Mm. With a couple of situations where indeed Onyx leaked either proximal or distally, so that um, indeed we need longer balloons for this to be able to see it. Um, when it's Onyx, uh, a couple of drops can be removed. Uh, um, I think it's playing with the limits, but um, if an aneurysm is not shrinking as you expect it to be, it may help. Uh, if you have perforators, of course, forget it. So here's a thought. Um, you know, um, you showed this in Shanghai. I had never seen this before. So uh, Rene was talking about NPA soft feeders for AVMs, where they're very short trunks. And so he's going transvenous because he's concerned as he starts obliterating the AVM, he's going to get reflux into the pericolosal. These are distal ACA. Remember what I'm talking about, Rene? So yeah, he sure. preventatively put stent retriever in the pericolosal to be able to drag out the onyx that he expected was going to go in the vessel. Maybe that's a strategy here. Yes, potentially. Uh, uh, but here, like, okay, so you deliver this flow diverter and then you go in or also with a stent retriever before you start. But then you, you like, you wouldn't have the balloon, right? No, no, you have the balloon. You need to have a bigger guide, balloon and, um, so you need a microcatheter or a balloon and uh, two microcatheters and a balloon, which you can do with an eight front sheet. It's almost like in this case, you might want like a filter, like a filter device that you use. Like a filter device, to a right. Centriever. You know, it's almost like you're, you know, you're more trying to trying to capture things as opposed to sort of. The only thing is if you have a wire that goes up outside the balloon, it's going to create a little channel. That the a little end of leak. Stuff might yeah. escape. But exactly right. The balloon, the catheter it itself be... is a point where the onyx leaks because the balloon is round, but there's a little encroachment yes. of the microcatheter where it follows this. But but Kim, you could use the filter wire or the centrifugal wire as your guide wire for your balloon. 
But um, I mean, depending yeah, yeah, on how, many, how much uh, embolic agent you want to have, how proximal and um, um, potentially most of it goes to that pouch and then you don't need to go up to the, yeah. to the very limit. But Rene, to, of, hmm? to begin with, I know this is a very elegant solution, but would you consider just adding two more stents to this? Yes, sure. But then you say, okay, why not a couple of wait, drops yeah. or something? And that's why before, otherwise, if you need to do it again, you need to again place other flow diverters with yeah. your micro catheter. Otherwise, you may not hold it. Uh, I'm waiting for Eris's transphenoidal case. <laughs> a direct puncture. Trans I wanted to, to make a, jo a joke about that, but I decided no, not to. <laughs> I don't think it's an unreasonable option. And transnasal puncture, you control it just like we do like fistulas through, through the egg. I mean, that's, that's another way to go, maybe. Uh, seriously, once um, flow diverters are placed in, if you want to reduce the mass effect, I think it should be a very reasonable way to puncture it and to reduce some of the stuff inside. It breaks my heart to stop this uh, amazing debate, uh, but we're running too late here. Um, we're going to have to cut on the time of the next debate, unfortunately. We're uh, we're a little late. Um, thank you, everybody. This was uh, awesome. Um, please stay on for the for the next. The next talk is uh, Kim Nelson talking us about um, uh, flow diversion for posterior circulation, after which is going to be Adnan, and I'm going to introduce you, Adnan, uh, when you're on for the next talk. So yours is going to be probably in around 25 minutes or so, okay? Kim, I, can you... I will can just you... make a, an offer, though. Adnan, if you have to go, I can flip with you, and you can oh, go first if you want I, to. I, I, Kim, I would appreciate very much, because we are drilling... Retro sig right now you, for an you acoustic. Look, you look so, dressed for action. That's why. Oh so, yes, I'm making an offer. So okay, I, so I, I very much appreciate that. So we'll let maybe I'll not go now, and then I, I will follow. Thank you, um, Adnan, uh, Adnan Sidik. We all know him from uh, his uh, incredible work throughout the years. His uh, presence, his charisma, his leadership. Um, you know, he's a. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's too much for me for telling you all your uh, all your uh, roles. Uh, you know, certainly he's the um, he's the uh, CEO uh, of the um, uh, Gates Vascular Institute and uh, uh, distinguished professor at uh, Jacobs Institute, SUNY University. He's one of the um, one of the founders of uh, many things, among which uh, WLNC. We all know that uh, the conference and. Uh, it, the, the, he's uh, the uh, in charge of the 3C uh, Jackson Hole meeting, and uh, uh, I don't know what else to say. You know, there's so many, too, too many things to say. Thank you so much for being here and to share your experience on this uh, particular topic, which uh, we're all very interested about. Uh, um, we're eager to listen from you, Adnan. Thank you very much. Um, can you see my slides? Okay. Um, I do here. Let me double check in the. Um... Yes. 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 Okay, good. Perfect. Yes. So uh, thank you, Eitan and Kim and Maxim and everybody else. I appreciate this opportunity. So a little bit, of, uh, I, I think Kim is going to cover posterior circulation. This is not necessarily just posterior circulation, but certainly it's is where we find it most often, we find it most problematic. Relatively uncommon aneurysms, um, dissection, atherosclerosis, uh, tend to be the underlying cause. And they present with a myriad sort of uh, presentations, rarely rupture, but rupture can certainly occur. Usually ischemia, hydrocephalus, direct compression, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, and uh, also uh, just occlusion with major ischemia. And so Essentially, what happens is that as the vessel wall dilates because of whatever the inciting event might be, uh, there's re adaptive remodeling, which results in further elongation and uh, the progression of the underlying course, whether it's atherosclerosis or dissection um, or just connective tissue disorder. Um, and so almost always they tend to be in proximal vessels uh, much more likely than distal vessels. Basilar, vertebral basilar, and carotid are common. 
Uh, but Vertebo basilar is the most problematic one, particularly given the fact the perforators are always involved with almost circumferential involvement of the vessel wall. So there's no part of the wall which is quite normal and does involve all the arterial branches, and this can be quite problematic. So people have done everything for these, and everything seems to have failed. So there's been clipping attempted, which doesn't make sense because they are, you know, the whole vessel is involved with bypass, without bypass, with coil, without coils, with stenting, without stenting, with flow diversion, without, and every single flow diverter has been used. Um, and so the basic concept with flow diversion, obviously, is to cause reduction in the size of the aneurysm. So this is an important part. While saccular aneurysms, we don't care much about for fusiform, it's really important to show a decline in the cross-sectional area. And here is an example of a fusiform carotid aneurysm with multiple ectatic components uh, treated with flow diversion uh, with and without coil. So here we've done this without. This is a FRED, which has been placed. You can do this with coils. Typically, coils are done to prevent a rupture risk, but I, I don't quite buy that as much. I use coil more as a scaffold, particularly that case where Rene was just showing with the 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 flow diverter was doing like a you know yin yang kind of elongating, contracting, elongating, contracting. Putting a few coils may stabilize the flow diverter mass. Uh, here is an example of uh, uh, coil with flow diverter. This is a fusiform aneurysm um, of the vertebral with a small daughter sac, and this has been treated. Now, bypasses have been done a variety of different ways. This is an SDA to SCA, SDA to or radial artery to SCA, or um, radial artery to MCA. These are all sort of bypasses that Lawton's talked about. The problem is they usually don't have good outcomes. Here's my little bypass case uh, where I have a patient who has a uh, progressively enlarging middle cerebral artery aneurysm with west vessel wall enhancement. There you can see it. And this is the angiogram. And I was concerned that both those MCA trunks coming out were very large. Now, I know um, uh, my friend um, uh, Isil and Saruhan talk about just putting in the flow diverter in one, let the vessel remodel. Here, I elected to place a radial artery graft into the superior trunk and then do an M2 to M2, and then distal clip ligate uh, the aneurysm. And you know the patient did very well with complete regression of the aneurysm, uh, and that certainly can be done. Uh, here is, um, I'll skip this, but I'll show you this case. This is a ugly case that came to me again, fusiform aneurysm with the saccular component of the distal ACA and fusiform IC. Everything was fusiform on the right side, nothing on the left side. So it looked like a hemibody. There you can see a dilated vertebral segment too. So hemibody syndrome uh, with doliquoectasia of the right-sided cerebral vessels. And uh, so here, what I did was I did initially, uh, I did an 8383 bypass. Uh, let me skip through there. They're being connected. And once the, uh, the bypass is placed, uh, then I based, basically placed a distal clip, distal to the, the aneurysm, and completely occluded it, and then confirmed that the bypass was patent. And once that was done, this is the bypass, it's patent, then went back and uh, placed coils in this distal sac from below and a flow diverter in the ICA. So put a flow diverter in the ICA, coiled off the distal sac, and this is sort of the final result from the left side. And this is the final result from the right side. Now I've left this open because I see a lot of lenticular stride perforators. There's a flow diverter in the MCA. You can see stenosis progressively going to cause an occlusion and the ACOM will then continue to fill it. So combining surgery and endovascular can, certainly works. Um, coming to fusiform posterior circulation, again, uh, ugly disease. Uh, honestly, when you look at death, there's almost a 50% risk of death within eight years. Uh, and this significantly increases with size. Uh, bypass for these posterior circulation, 62% mortality. Um, this is my first paper on the topic where I tried flow diversion. This is quite old, uh, 2010 or 11, and half these patients died. Um, 
And then I realized I was not going to tackle the biggest people. I would use segmental fusiform, and we actually got much better. What did I do differently in this series? I did not use coils. I did not occlude the contralateral vertebral. I just placed one floor diverter as much as is possible, ra rarely two. Uh, and we had one stroke, and that one stroke occurred because I took the distal vert on the contralateral side, causing a uh, pontomedullary junction ischemia with an MRS of four. Um, so we have continued to sort of treat these with a variety of different problems. The biggest issue with these is almost never rupture, it's always ischemia from perforators. And we know that perforators collateralize in the posterior circulation because unlike the anterior circulation, the posterior circulation develops in a very, very, very different way where islands of vessels coalesce to form the trunk. So there's always collateralization. So the goal, I think one other strategy is to potentially give time for collateralization. And that was the impetus. So I came up with this idea and then I found out that a lot of my colleagues had the same exact idea. So we put together a series of these where we compared uh, dual antiplatelet versus triple therapy for vertebrobasal or dual echoectatic aneurysms. And uh, the whole goal here is to maintain perforators, to buy time, to allow for gradual flow remodeling and um, uh, vessel remodeling as a result of that. So triple therapy means aspen, uh, clopidogrel, or ticagrelor, preferably ticagrelor. We don't use clopidogrel anymore because of resistance. And then we bridge post-procedure with heparin to an oral anticoagulant, typically Eliquis or Pradaxa. So true triple therapy. And so here's an example of some of those cohorts where you have true fusiform aneurysms. And uh, this is the triple therapy cohort. These were the guys who were treated with triple therapy. These are the guys who were treated with dual antiplatelet therapy. So here's an example of uh, these cases right here. And uh, basically these were relatively younger patients, 60s, uh, mostly male. So that's the one thing which is uh, interestingly different from saccular, it's more a male disease. And they presented with the same sort of set of uh, stuff with about a third uh, compression, a third ischemia, and a third just progressive headaches. Um, about a quarter uh, or fifth had uh, underlying disability already at the time of treatment. This is really important. We'll come back to this in a second. And aneurysms were a little bit larger in triple therapy, a little bit smaller in, uh, in uh, with about 12 millimeters maximal diameter, and again, equal length of the vessel. Um, and a small subset, about a third each, had uh, some thrombus already formed, um, and you know, about half of cases were atherosclerosis. So important thing here to note is that uh, the vast majority of cases um, with triple therapy, we were able to use one device, um, and then smaller uh, number of multiple devices, again, depending on the length of the aneurysm. Uh, there were more devices placed in the dual antiplatelet cohort for, for whatever reason. So there is that thing that needs to be considered. Uh, adjunctive coiling was identical in, in a third of cases. And the important thing is uh, there was... Uh, only one seizure encountered during intraoperative complications. So intra-procedure, people seem to do very well. Uh, in terms of what devices, this included pipeline, sill, shield, surpass, uh, essentially, and FRED. Uh, so essentially, all these devices that are currently available were used. Uh, again, preference was single layer. Um, and then in hospital course, this is really important. The biggest complication we deal with, acute ischemic stroke. One patient or 7% had a stroke on triple therapy and 23% had on dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, unfortunately, groin hematomas did occur, um, again, equal, but urethral bleeding. So ble nuisance bleeding occurred more likely in triple therapy. In terms of... Um, when you look at um, these cases, you've got to be careful about removing the Foley catheter in these patients, uh, given the urethral bleeding risk. Um, and then uh, in terms of long-term outcomes, this is the most impressive aspect of the data, is that if you look at the follow-up, and you can see the follow-up is quite extensive uh, in these patients, the acute stroke uh, that originally occurred 
uh, resulted in uh, a decline in the modified Rankin score uh, of only that same patient. But when you look at overall MRS decline time of last follow-up, 70% had modified Rankin score decline in the dual antiplatelet therapy category for this. So I think this is a major, major, major issue. Almost, so 21% had moderate to severe disability at last follow-up. Remember, that was the kind of number that already began with. But when you look at dual antiplatelet, almost 80% had a moderate to severe disability at last follow-up. Uh, angiographic follow-up was, again, quite delayed. Um, and important to know, triple therapy resulted in a lower permanent occlusion rate and a higher permanent rate on dual antiplatelet therapy, but yeah, at the cost of increased disability, which I think is 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 quite important. Um, and so, what were the reasons? Well, additional acute ischemic stroke eight days after discharge in the dual antiplatelet, progression of brainstem compression, higher decline of MRS, and moderate to severe disability uh, were all more common with a higher occlusion rate in dual antiplatelet therapy. So that was sort of the primary sort of uh, uh, takeaway is that triple therapy had lower occlusion rate, but the patients actually tolerate the procedure very well. And here's some examples um, of, uh, of some cases. So for example, this is classic doliquivectatic fusiform day zero. This is day 445. This is probably one of the first ones where I kept the dual anticoagulation going for over a year, triple therapy. I think a year is too much. I think three months is probably okay, but currently I do six months. This is at day 720. And I don't take the contralateral vertebral artery, at least not acutely. Uh, but, you know, these, uh, this is a case now where the patient had three pipelines with dual antiplatelet therapy, excellent angiographic result continued to worsen because of brainstem compression, hydrocephalus requiring shunting, and eventual death at 12 months. So here, the patient has progressive improvement of compressive symptoms, slow but steady occlusion of the aneurysm sac. So perfect result, dead patient, imperfect result, alive, stable patient. Uh, here's a 67-year-old. I think I just showed you this. This is the immediate post-op contrast stasis uneventful MRS1, last follow-up at three years. Um, here's uh, the progression, as I showed you. These are the lateral views. And you can see that there's still some collateral flow in, in, in the sac, which is feeding some of these vessels. It doesn't bother the patient. It certainly doesn't bother me. A 68-year-old here, another sort of fusiform, a little bit more normal vessel up top, um, placed with radial access, single pipeline, and again, no occlusion of the contralateral vertebral MRS zero at 660 days with this is the, the final result. Again, the patient seems to be doing okay. Uh, you could say, oh, well, I still see the saccular component. I see it less now than I saw before. And I've done nothing other than leave the patient a dual antiplatelet. And that's the important thing to note that these patients need to really stay on dual anti antiplatelet forever, forever, um, for now. Um, and then here's uh, another one, um, ugly vertebral basilar, single pipeline flex, and a pixaban was added after the procedure. This is the initial uh, mild stasis. And after a year, a pixaban was uh, stopped and the patient uh, remains neurologically intact. Now, this sac is a little bit smaller, two millimeters smaller than the maximum size it had before the procedure but doesn't look that appreciably different. Um, could you go back and occlude the distal vert on the other side? I've certainly contemplated that. I haven't done that yet, but I, I wonder if that is what would be needed in these patients. So I think higher occlusion with dual antiplatelet, triple therapy, lower occlusion, but less stroke and better functional outcome. And I guess this I'm thinking about is maybe add that second vertebral occlusion in a delayed fashion when you know collaterals are well-developed. Um, and uh, I think vessel deconstruction should always be staged, no question. I think you need those collaterals to fill somehow. I think triple therapy is a good idea, but it does come with hemorrhagic risk. My last case that I did, uh, 
had a devastating MRS4 outcome because of an unrelated basal ganglia hemorrhage uh, for after vertebral basilar treatment. And in hindsight, she had echogradient signal positive. So she had some hypertensive disease on bilaterally. And so I think if you see that, if you see echogradient signals pre-procedure, that's a contraindication to triple therapy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adnan. <clears throat> this is, uh, you know, it's uh, it really shows us how uh, these are so complex uh, aneurysm in terms of treatment because they're extremely high risk. Uh, high risk if you don't do anything. High risk, whatever you do. So, uh, you know, finding ways to reduce that risk, you know, uh, it's something you 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 showed us, and uh, this is uh, very very uh, useful. Um, any any comment, uh, anyone? I just have a question. Like, is there a role for just triple anti or antiplatelet anticoagulant uh, without any other intervention? So uh, I did that uh, before flow diversion. Um, I did that with aspirin, Plavix, and Coumadin, and every one of them died. Okay. And they, so know you know, I had a, I had one or two ruptures, and I had um, the the remainder with uh, ischemic strokes. And uh, in fact, I remember the most famous one was the neuropathologist that was faculty while I was in residency, and he had the same syndrome. Half the body, his hand was large. He had doliquectasia, hemis uh, ipsilateral side. And I treated him with exactly that triple therapy and Coumadin because he kept having ischemic events. Um, and uh, there was prior to flow diversion, prior to puffs, and he passed away as well. So I'm not sure, although we don't have a medical arm, um, although I believe there would be aquapoise in trying to do that. Thank you. Any other comment? Uh, can you tell me again what's... Hello, Adnan. Can you tell hey, me again <laughs> what's the average follow-up time in this group? Um, almost three years. The last one is 900 days. So pretty remarkable because this was all, you know, we just had a discussion. I said, oh, I've done a few of those. Oh, I've done that. We just compiled all these cases together. And honestly, I did not expect the the disability, I think that's the most important takeaway here is that the disability is quite significant. But I forewarn everybody who wants to try this, look at a pre-op MRI, make sure there's no susceptibility signal anywhere because um, I missed that on a patient and who had a very bad outcome with, with exactly this strategy. And do you have any improvement in a mass effect, for example? Yeah. So again, the mass effect remains stable, but they don't shrink rapidly. You know, they, they shrink very, 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 very slowly. And so that's why I wonder if there is value in doing a contralateral vert takedown, maybe a year or two after, because I, I haven't done that yet. And I, I do wonder that you give it enough time to collateralize and then you go back and then you shut off the other side. But I haven't done that yet because you know, see, they all seem to be doing okay. Nobody's died. It's kind of hard for me to just try to improve a picture. And they do shrink, but they don't go away. So I feel they may be equilibrium of sorts. And maybe that's the best we can do for this disease. I'm there, not is sure. a, there is a question from the audience. Uh, um, if the aneurysm is not enlarging and the patient is presenting with ischemic symptoms, why not just manage medically? Oh, I guess uh, I guess that's the that's the question of Kim. But why just not manage yes. with antiplatelet antiplatelet? Right. If the so, aneurysm is not enlarging. Yes. Once the once the diameter of the vessel gets to eight millimeters then the morbidity mortality is 80 uh, is is 40% or 50% over 5 years 8 millimeters is dependent on the size so do i treat everybody who comes with a 5 millimeter mild ectasia absolutely not i follow them 
but if they are enlarging on dual antiplatelets and statin therapy, which is what typically we do. I've even tried PCSK9 in some of these cases. Um, most of them don't grow four or five millimeters, but some of them do. And those are the ones where I think treating earlier is a better way of dealing with this rather than waiting for them to become monstrosities. And then someone was asking about the follow-up for a WLNC case you did, but I will let that uh, to, yeah. you know, sure it follow yeah, so, uh, right. so, WLNC, no, you, you that is, the follow-up so, of the prior year. So. Yeah, no, right. So we'll show it WLNC, but that is exactly the case I'm talking about. Um, she did unbelievably well, uh, neurologically intact, getting ready to go out of the ICU day four or day five on triple therapy has a catastrophic right-sided basal ganglia hemorrhage. Oh, that's the case you mentioned to us. That's the case. And okay. then when I went back, I was so excited about this double barrel. That's what, what they're talking about. I did the double barrel PCA to vertebral, two parallel pipelines, and I went proximal to distal. So it was, it was, it was, it was an incredibly beautiful case with Alad and I, we were doing it together. Synchronized pipelining, like synchronized swimming. Um, but had a catastrophic basal ganglia hemorrhage that I had to take to the OR to evacuate. Uh, and the patient did not do well because of that. And I, there were DW, SWI signals uh, that I saw afterwards. Right. Um, anybody else? All right. Um... All right. Adnan, uh, thank you so much for taking time off uh, from the OR. And uh, um, if you if you happen to be available again, we're starting the debate in a half hour from now. It's not going to be that long, but uh, if you want to join back in half hour um, uh, and you're, you can, please feel free. I will do that. And Kim, thanks for letting me. Oh, yes, you. no problem. It's an excellent lecture. I'm glad I got to hear it. Thank you. All right. Kim, please uh, share your screen. Can you see it? No. Um, while uh, I, I think Max is coming there, but uh, uh, while okay. uh, so I'm like, going. I'm going to introduce you again for those who didn't hear the introduction before. Hey, here we are. Um, Professor Peter Kim Nelson um, is going to talk to us about uh, the use in posterior circulation and the uh, I was, uh, I would say, lucky uh, to be here at NYU at that time when, uh, you know, while it was already proved to him and the rest of the group how useful and good it was and safe it was for the anterior circulation, but for the posterior circulation was still like a little like an unknown. And um, so in many cases, you know, that was... Uh, uh, it was uh, sort of like with good and bad results uh, in the posterior circulation experience. And uh, and I think that's what uh, Kim Nelson will share with us today, like uh, how that all that experience led to better understanding. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, and it's very complicated. I definitely do not have the answer. I seem to be swimming against the current because I started out with an approach much like what Adnan is describing now, of understenting because I was worried about perforators and closing them. Um, and um, I guess when this came up at a meeting several years ago, Demetrius Lopez was more or less outlining this approach. And the question I have is like, are we just punting it downstream a bit? So, okay, yes, if I just medicate, um, I can get a year or two out of that patient, and then he'll come back to another problem. So it's a, it's very, very complicated. Uh, I wish I had the answer. It's like Eitan says, it just appears, you know, random that a patient does well or a patient uh, does poorly. But slowly, with more and more of these cases, uh, we hopefully will ultimately have a body of knowledge that 
enables us to understand things. So this is definitely beyond puffs, uh, the posterior circulation, but it's it's a tale of two cities, basically, because in the early days, um, there was a lot of enthusiasm about this. Um, and unfortunately, I, I think I kind of helped uh, push that uh, agenda. Uh, so one of the things that's always interesting about, I consider the basilar fusiform, the true giant basilar fusiform, to be kind of the 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 the, the frontier of flow diversion application. And as with all innovation, basically there are a number of things that drive advances. One is like new tools get developed, new delivery systems get developed. Um, but there's also innovation in the application of the tools, which is what we basically as medical doctors do. We are practicing an art and that requires a synthesis of knowledge and because like what Max went over earlier today, a, a deep familiarity with the tools. And what I have tried to dispel for years now is this notion of a magic wand, that a flow diverter is a magic wand. No, it's a tool and you really have to understand how to use that tool. And you also have to be able to assess your application of that tool. And then you need to insight into the applied setting, the anatomy, embryology, physiology, et cetera. And out of that uh, will come an advance. Uh, so I'm just going to go over a couple of cases that that got us started down this road. This was a case I did with this one, Zagura in uh, Budapest. It was the first fusiform basilar that I had done, a young soccer player uh, that a appeared with like an acute onset of diplopia. And this was basically the MR. Uh, this angiographically is what's going on here. And you see, basically it's a it's a fusiform aneurysm that occurs between the ICA and superior cerebellar segments of this vessel. And so without really knowing what we were doing, uh, you know, but doing what we thought was the obvious from our PETA experience at that point, uh, we ended up putting a stack of five pipelines staggering them so that basically the ICA was covered with maybe two and one was kind of coming up here to the spirit cerebellar segment to anchor the two anchor the device and this is basically the follow-up angiogram and you know the the patient did exceedingly well later that week in Cleveland I had the opportunity with Dave Fiorella and Mike Kelly to treat another patient a young girl again coming with acute onset of cranial neuropathy related to this massive aneurysm. Here you see the CTA. Uh, this is basically what she looked for. And, and again, I just want to point out, it's involving a segment of the basilar between the ICA and the superior cerebellar segments. Um, we didn't recognize the importance of that at the initial part. Most of it was just to try to kind of keep the minimize the coverage of the ICA and the superior cerebellar and maximize the coverage, in this case, seven stents over the aneurysmal segment of the vessel. And this is her seven days later. Dave was you know, re relatively fastidious about the follow-up. So he was getting angiograms quite frequently. And this is one year post uh, procedure. And you can see there's like a, a little collateralization of the of the, of the, the vasovasorum of this vessel and, and like a lot of collaterals into uh, the ICA territory on the right side. But this is what was really dramatic is that the mass of the aneurysm had involuted. And so we were very, very extra extraordinarily uh, you know, enthusiastic about this. So now armed with two cases, um, I had done a tour of um, Australia and they had a few of these cases. So we kind of started treating a few of these and they followed up with 32 patients uh, with excellent occlusion outcomes, three perforator infarcts. By the way, back to a statement initial made earlier in the day, heavy smokers predominantly with the perforator infarcts in the posterior circulation. Uh, but excellent results, uh, you know, mild neurologic sequelae in all of these patients, but excellent occlusion results. And so there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm until Adnan arrived with his initial experience that he um, communicated earlier in his, his his talk. And this was really, uh, you know, like a question of what is happening here? Because of these seven patients, uh, five of them did very poorly um, and were dead. And so the question is, where are we going? Uh, this was followed up with a European uh, uh, experience, a minor experience, but all dismal cases. 
uh, but fusiform. And so the question arises, what's happening? Contrasting that, a more recent article from the Jefferson Group in Philadelphia, seven patients, no complications, angiographic occlusion in six of seven aneurysms. What is the story here? And I think it kind of distills down. If you dissect all the cases that are done, you end up with this. When we talk about posterior circulation aneurysms, we're talking about a heterogeneity of disease. So you can classify these aneurysms, and then you can sort of sort them out based on the likelihood that they occlude the clinical outcomes and uh, also complications that you experience. So this is just an assortment of cases that I have to touch on each of these territories and types of aneurysms. Here's a, a saccular uh, sidewall aneurysm off the distal vert segment. Um, <clears throat> you know, a, a quite a quite nice case for a flow diversion event here. Basically, you just lay a, a diverter down here between, there may be one or two small perforators, but usually those aren't occluded by one or two pipelines. So in this case, we overlap two pipelines, and this is the immediate result. You get the diversion effect, and then this is at one year follow-up, you have occlusion of the aneurysm. Um, and then follow-up MRA, which I sometimes do just to kind of survey for aneurysms and see the follow-up. This is another case, mostly thrombosed aneurysm. This is more of a true kind of pica origin aneurysm. Much of it's thrombosed. Again, we laid down two flow diverters here just with time and basically an involution. I won't say it's 100% cured, but it's definitely involuted over time. The patient's done very well. Uh, this was another case that came to us. Uh, a patient, a young woman uh, in uh, her early 20s, coming in with cranial neuropathies um, with brainstem uh, symptoms. And basically what was done at that time was a deconstructive procedure closing the distal right uh, vert. And this is what she had, so this is like in the aftermath of that procedure. You can see that there's the mass of the aneurysm at that time. And this is three years later. She recurs with, again, a new onset of symptoms. Angiography is done. And now you can see that the lesion now involves more of the distal left vertebral artery. This is the occlusion, occluded segment of the right vertebral artery. And it goes through the VB junction. There's also a uh, fenestration at the VB junction. Uh, so she gets sent here for pipeline at that time. It was uh, prior to pipeline's uh, approval but we had it on uh, compassionate use basis. Uh, and so basically this is the, what the recurrence. And you can see even between the 2009 study of why the time she arrives to New York, there's even further enlargement of this mostly thrombosed aneurysm. Again, this is a vertebral basilar junction aneurysm though. And so the results can be expected to be quite good here. So basically a pipeline construct, four devices is laid down, extending from the proximal basilar into the distal right vertebral artery. We add a little, little bit of coiling into the inflow zone just to kind of reduce the exchange. And you see the delayed washout. And this is basically the 12 month follow-up angiogram. Now she has, we are out to 10 years on her and she's done very remarkably well. Uh, this was a gentleman a push coming in with a right acute onset right third nerve palsy. And again, it involves this part of the posterior circulation, the posterior cerebral arteries. You see the mass effect here from this aneurysm. It's mostly thrombosed, and you understand that from the sac of the aneurysm, but the mass effect displacing the superior cerebellar artery, separating it from the PCA, showing you the true size of the aneurysm angiographically. So basically, two devices were laid across this thing. It is circumferentially involves the PCA. And so two devices extend across the uh, se aneurysmal segment. This is at one year follow-up. And you see basically there's been resolution of mass effect. And this is just a follow-up transaxial imaging showing you basically the initial aneurysm mass. And now it's essentially resolved. <clears throat> now, there are people and they do a lot of experimental work and they make allegations that there are some reasons we can suspect that flow diversion is not ideal in bifurcation situations. And I don't really understand all of it. I don't know the implications of 
like distorted flows and things like that and the sheer stress that they have on aneurysms. Um, but what I can say is sometimes you run up with a real case that mimics uh, a, a, a model and uh, you have a different outcome. And so basically this is a single pipeline that was placed from the right P1 into the Basler, distal Basler. And this is the immediate result. And you can see three years later, mass is gone and this is what we're left with. Sometimes you have a more frightening situation. A patient comes in, there's a lot of edema here, they're acutely symptomatic. Um, you don't know what to make of this exactly. The core of the aneurysm is still open, uh, but there's obviously thrombus around it. I'm a little worried about, you know, a clue about um, uh, ruptures or something like that because the thing seems to be more acutely active. Uh, so in this case, uh, we're going to coil this, but instead of just using a regular old stent, I, I prefer to use a flow diversion in this kind of stent-assisted coiling uh, application because I think you get a much more uh, profound um, effect at the aneurysm base uh, to protect it from uh, recurring. And this is basically one 12-month follow-up on this case. So that's basically how we'd like to manage it. Now, some of these times, sometimes you get into a very, very complex case. This is a case I did with uh, my partner, Howard Rena. It was a woman that came in with an acute third nerve palsy. She initially had this aneurysm. Uh, they elected to follow her um, and see if the, if the palsy would resolve. Things got worse. And you can see basically within a couple of months, the aneurysm is blown out. So this is a very actively evolving uh, lesion. And this is what we're left with angiographically. So it's a complex situation. You have a sort of fusiform involvement of the left superior cerebellar. The P1 comes from the aneurysm fundus. The right P1 is a tretic, and then the superior cerebellar on the other side. And so here's where I think you have to get um, you know, more uh, flexible in your approach to these lesions. Uh, not just kind of flow diverting into the PCA maybe, to kind of reconstruct that because you have this developing fusiform uh, and it's a evolve, rapidly evolving aneurysm, uh, you need to start combining things. And this is where I think the artistry of what we do with our tools come into play. And so we ended up, you know, angiographically evaluating. This is the right side. Again, she has that atretic P1 on, on the right, more of a PCA, a P1 on the left, but the PCOM will fill the dome of the aneurysm uh, retrogradely just like this in the AP. We did a lot of balloon test occlusion just to see what kind of collateral support she had into the superior cerebellar segment. Uh, but many times these people with fusiform aneurysms, they can tolerate an occlusion. And so what we did is we decided to do this in two stages. First, deconstructing the left superior cerebellar artery. So we ended up doing that, not with coils, but because I wanted to be able to do CTAs and, and image it properly. We ended up using a pad. I put a short five, which ballooned out. And then inside the pad, I put an MVP and we deconstructed the left superior cerebellar. And so this is post stage one, where we're going to deconstruct this off of antiplatelets. So she's not on antiplatelets because I want the pad and the MVP to thrombose that segment of the vessel. Now she comes back um, a month later to reconstruct it. And it's already getting a little bit larger. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is not build into the PCA. I'm going to terminate the basilar apex at the superior cerebellar. So we're going to pipeline into the superior cerebellar, extend that down into the basilar and isolate this terminus here. And so that's basically what was done. We had to go loop the loop through the aneurysm. And then we ended up putting a pipe from the superior cerebellar on the right into the basilar. The left superior cerebellar is occluded. So hopefully there'll be less draw to run on the reverse runoff, a retrograde flow in the in the in the um in the basilar. And that percheron that was coming from her distal left P1 segment will fill from the PCOM. Uh, and so this is basically what it looks like in subacute follow-up. And this was one year later, basically the basilar connecting to the superior cerebellar running off uh, the left side, basically the PCA filling that and back to the percherons 
uh, on the left. And then the right side, just its fetal type PCOM supplying itself, but nothing filling from the aneurysm. Now, let's talk about the distal basilar fusiforms, the, the whole, the large, massive lesions. And I showed you two cases, my initial two cases, which parenthetically or happily were this type. And I think this type we can be successful with. There is risk of perforator injury possibly, but I think this type is a different beast from this kind of thing where there's the necessity for, for runoff into your Ica vessels. So this again, just to remind you was that young girl that we did at Cleveland Clinic. Again, it's this kind of connect, this kind of fusiform massive aneurysm, but it involves this piece of the basal, of the distal basal. And so you can expect to have a good outcome. This is a different an, a different person, massive, mostly thrombosed aneurysm, holobasilar, basically goes here, but the ICA is still filling from through the clot of the base of the aneurysm. And so I was nervous. This was one of the early cases that we did. I didn't know better. I thought, let me just put a pipeline light. So we have two devices that are extending from the superior cerebellar segment down into the left vert, and then I actually closed the right vert uh, approximately. And so you're saying basically the construct, it goes through the, the up here into the distal basilar. This is what it looked like a month later. I was super happy, except the gentleman, and this is in the early days, by now, I was really taking mostly people that were very symptomatic. So he already had a, a quadriparasis that progressed to a quadriplegia, despite looking like this, uh, because the clot swells and you end up with more brainstem mass effect, uh, despite the thing being completely thrombosed. So a month later, he's getting worse than hydro. I didn't know better back then, so we didn't have a drain in. He's on dual antiplatelets, so we tried to medically manage this for another month. He ended up going back home, and uh, I found a very daring you know, neurosurgeon who uh, trained with me in St. Louis, actually. I pawned the patient off on him to uh, place a, shrink, a drain, which he did. And the patient improved mildly, but still for about another year had a quadriparis, ultimately died of an MI. Um, but never got much better than he originally was. So I learned something. I learned that the patients need to be prepared. And so this is a person coming again with cranial neuropathies. She has uh, a mild paraplegia with some lower cranial neuropathies, swallowing issues. So we end up pegging her. And uh, we end up putting the drain preemptively. Uh, to manage the hydrocephalus, keeping it with a you know a high pressure valve to so that we can adjust should she get into more difficulty. Uh, and so this is the case. Again, the ICAs are kind of coming from the base of the aneurysm, um, the ugly distal segment. We ended up uh, using a balloon to help us get through there and stabilize the construct. Um, this is what it looks like afterward, um, immediately afterward. Uh, she did okay. We brought her back 24 hours later just to take a peek. Uh, the ICA is still filling. The aneurysm is mostly thrombosed, so we were really encouraged. Uh, but then 10 days later, she ruptured this thing and basically bled out and died. Um, so massive rupture of a thrombosed aneurysm, essentially. This was a man, uh, a gentleman, uh, an attorney, who knew more about pipeline than I did. I ran across his case uh, at, at the University of Michigan when I was proctoring there, at the University of Toledo in Akron. He was a, 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 a very intelligent attorney who um, in, found out about his disease, got progressively worse over the course of about a year, researched flow diversion intensively, could quote the literature, um, and finally uh, decided after he got to his quadruporetic state 
that he would undergo the procedure. Um, so he comes in, he comes in from Ohio to New York, um, and we decided to treat him. And you can see most of it's thrombos, huge, massive aneurysm. Uh, by this time, we're doing two things. One is he had bought some time, so he closed off a lot of the perforators uh, while he was waiting um, to his brainstem. And so basically, we elected to build a construct. I'm using multiple devices by now because I want to try to close this as rapidly as possible. And then we also are adding coils to this to stabilize the thrombus to keep to prevent that thrombotic mass from expanding and, and further compressing the brainstem. Uh, so this is basically uh, what it looks like. We ended up having to build this from proximal to distal. Um, and so this is immediately afterward, um, kind of making sure everything's uh, We have a jailed microcatheter outside the construct, and we sort of loosely filled this just to organize the clot that's going to form outside of our construct. This is a one-month follow-up angiogram. He actually had started to improve, had gotten basically over the course of um, like about uh, eight months, got to walking with a quad walker, but then about a year and a half later died of an MI also. And that brings me back to another issue, much like Adnan had suggested, these lesions basically involve people with, ather it's an atheromatous type of, of lesion. And so they have other kinds of things. They have aortic disease. They have coronary artery disease. They have hypertension, all of these things. And so uh, they are a, di a different kind of uh, demographic of, of, um, of, of, of disease. Uh, this is a different kind of case. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an extreme aneurysm, but it's a younger individual. And I think these are more promising. For a long time, I wasn't treating these because I thought it was such an experimental therapy. But ultimately, as we started to have a little bit more success with the extreme cases, at least in the short term, um, I decided to take a few of these cases on. It was a young man that came in with a four-month history of swallowing difficulty and new left six nerve palsy. And this is his MR. This is the angiogram. Again, we're just proximal to the ICA segment, so I think we can be a little bit guardedly optimistic here. And I want to get it before it extends through that segment where I think it'll become more problematic. So this is building the construct. Now we're building it from the right vert. And the reason I did that is I thought that there were more perforators coming off the distal vert. Uh, in reality, and he had a nice pica segment. So when we close this, we accidentally ended up nipping. It looked great angiographically, uh, but when he woke up, he had a Wallenberg, and this is basically the MR that he ended up having. So I had to have him in uh, rehab here for about a month, but he got much better. And uh, at last, he was originally from Sweden, so he went back there, recovered. Uh, I got angiographic follow-up a year later from there. Everything looked good. And at latest, he was hiking in Nepal. So he had a fantastic uh, outcome. Uh, this is another young man with uh, acute onset diplopia, had a right six nerve palsy, but his involves the ICA segment. So it's this kind of an aneurysm. The ICA comes from the sac of the aneurysm. Um, so in this case, we're doing this only with stents. I've gone back and forth, coils, not coils, because I have had some issues with coiling, especially when the big, the massive aneurysms uh, you know, too much coils, then you're left with mass effect. So here I was trying something different, a baffle just laying of a, a five millimeter stent, laying here to break some pulsation, and then five stents of smaller caliber uh, stacked up over the aneurysm sac. Uh, and this is the immediate after effect. You see you have delayed uh, washout, there's delayed washout into that ICA. Keep track of this loop that the ICA makes, because initially you don't see the ICA because the front of the aneurysm has got unopacified blood. And then later, as you fill more of the aneurysm, it um, it fills and runs off into that into that ICA. So initially, the aneurysm measures cross-sectionally about 14 millimeters. Um, as we go through this, three days later, this is the follow-up angio. It's running off. It's mostly thrombose. There's a conduit through the clot into this ICA. 
Then five weeks later, he comes back in with worsening headaches and cranial neuropathy. And the aneurysm's grown. It's thrombosed, but it's grown. Uh, and this, he still looks like that with residual conduit that goes through clot, that's feeding the clot. And there's that loop of the ICA that's going. So what to do? More stents. I, you know, like in that, you see the edema here in the brainstem. Uh, so we kept our fingers closed and we waited seven months. Symptoms resolved. The mass of the aneurysm starts to shrink. And this is the angiogram. I show first the left vert because you see there's no more ICA filling directly there. And then I show you the other vert because in delayed fashion, that loop here, this loop right here, fills from his ICA and superior cerebellus. So he collateralized, we rearranged the circulation. And I think that's what some of these cases take. So what overall, I looked at the first 25 patients that involved the ICA incorporating fusiform aneurysms, it was dismal. Half of them, I, and I only followed, and this is only survival. It doesn't matter, you know, like they could, might have a, a perforator injury, neurologically not improved, but half of them pass away within a year of, uh, of treating it. So it's still, in my mind, a very experimental therapy. I think the younger the patients are, the better it is. Um, you know, like whether you add coils or not, I still haven't decided how many stents you use. Currently, I'm kind of biased more toward closing it down abruptly um, or, or or sooner and and trying to uh, to kind of get control of that um, of the of the growing clot in the aneurysm. But you know, the, certainly I don't have the answer. Uh, so there definitely is a new endovascular strategy. It's just it's still investigational. Uh, and we have to find it, figure out what to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, uh, this is, uh, you know, it shows us, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, posterior circulation aneurysm, it's really not one thing. And, uh, you know, uh, that's an important teaching that uh, uh, you you delivered to us uh, from those years. Um and uh, uh, certainly, like the ones uh, that uh, you know uh, that Adnan showed are really like the 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 highest risk one. And for these other kind of location, there are strategies that can be done. Um, there is a question from the audience. Um, let me read that to you. Um, the question is, Doctor Nelson, I've read the flow diverters are not pressure diverters, but I don't understand this. The pressure is from the arterial flow? Question mark. Do you understand what uh, this person... Okay, uh, yes, I, I do. So basically, the flow diversion, like if you think about the exchange between an aneurysm and, and Barry Lieber worked, you know, applied fluid dynamics to describe this uh, a, a decade or two decades ago. But basically, you have exchange between an aneurysm and a parent vessel. And that can be described in terms of convection and diffusion. When you put a flow diverter in, you are changing the convective exchange and you're biasing the exchange between parent artery and aneurysm to more of diffusion. And you see that many times when you put the flow diverter construct, you have this, you know, this kind of puff that, of contrast that gets into the aneurysm slower, but you get rid of the convective um, inflow. So it definitely has an effect on circulation and flow within the aneurysm. But pulsation is just the pulse wave. And that doesn't change with a, a flow diverter until you get enough of a construct or enough of a wall of serial construct, overlapped constructs, where there is actually a resistance to exchange through the, the, the porosity of the construct. So it has to be, I think uh, Juan Sobral uh, calculated this for pipeline back a long time ago, and there is no resistance, measurable resistance across the wall of the construct until you get up to three stents. So beyond three stents, you do have resistance to flow across that construct wall. And then you will have 
a change in the pulsation uh, at, that's perceived at the wall of the of the aneurysm. But in, in one or two stents, it doesn't change the pulsation wave, the pulse pressure. Now, what I tried to do in that last case that I showed is it occurred to me that, okay, maybe you have some pulsation that comes through this porous device. Can you put another boundary that further disrupts the pulse wave, if you think of it as a fractal, uh, so that you get some transmission through the initial wall, the initial neural, but then there's another barrier to the conduction of pulsation to the vessel wall. And maybe that changes the way that the outer wall models. But we I don't know enough about it. I just, this is just anecdotal. It sort of makes sense to me. Uh, but yes, the question is, is many times confused. Um, one or two layers of, of a flow diverter do not change the wall, the pressure inside the Andrews. Thank you. Um, as uh, you may see from the agenda, we're quite behind with the debate. So, you know, as, uh, uh, if we continue now with some questions, we're probably going to have a chance to share one of the cases that uh, the faculty um, faculty prepared. Uh, anybody else has, uh, has more comment? If I may, uh, and Please. I will not show my case, so no problem. <laughs> uh, I think I think that um, in the basilar artery aneurysm that you showed, uh, Kim, uh, the, the young people go well and the older people go bad, and that's probably because they are completely different aneurysms. I, mean, I agree. So it, we we, I, we shouldn't put them together in my mind. So in one case. You have the atherosclerotic uh, aneurysm of the older person, uh, hypertensive and so on. It's like an aortic um, uh, aneurysm. And the other one is is like, a, um, I usually see them, if you look at them uh, better, you see the basilar artery and you have an aneurysm and it goes like this. So you have a, an upper part of the basilar artery, a lower part of the basilar artery, and an aneurysm in between. But yes. if you take away the the aneurysm and you put them back together, it looks like a normal artery. Yes. So it's like a, a one millimeter of the basilar had just grown and inflated and, and become big. So probably there are no perforators there because it's, it's something which is added to the normal basilar artery. Uh, that is why probably it, it's less risky and more effective uh, uh, the treatment with uh, this is my my understanding of the of the thing so but i would not put them in the same box i think you're right i think like for me like it was more obvious that when people were reporting different outcomes they many times were talking about different anatomic lesions so i wanted to first get that straightened out but then I started noticing the survivors of what I call the challenging anatomic cohorts were all young. Like once they get to be older, they don't have good outcomes. You might stabilize something, but they they usually don't improve to a point that you, makes you like particularly happy. So um, on this uh, question, uh, um, I'll ask Dan Saline to uh, to share his screen, please. Um, um, please, Dan, share your screen. He has a case that uh, actually is maybe something in between. Um, and while he does that, uh, while he shared the screen, uh, um, I would uh, like to uh, ask you another question, Kim, from the audience that is... Uh, um, thanks for the talk. And then he says, uh, and this person says, do you recommend to treat early or wait for those posterior circulation aneur fusiform aneurysms before become uh, become symptomatic before offering treatment? So, so, um, so you want to wait for them to become symptomatic? Yeah, for young patients now, I kind of push to do it earlier. For the elderly smokers, I usually, if they're not very symptomatic, I usually just manage them medically until they start to have symptoms that completely impair their lifestyle. And then I think it's time to kind of bite the bullet. Thank you, Kim. Um, 
Then before you go ahead, I wanted to thank um, uh, Isil uh, has been with us the whole day. It's very late in uh, in Europe uh, and uh, and uh, you know it's been a pleasure to have you as well as uh, 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 Rene who, who left earlier. Um, Dodi, I know it's very late. You know we're happy to keep you here, but f- please you know don't hesitate to tell us if uh, you start becoming hungry. Um, uh, go ahead then, show us please. Okay, great. So I uh, originally agreed to uh, show this case before uh, recent events, but we'll uh, get into those, and uh, this will be uh, interesting uh, for the uh, discussion as well. Uh, these are my uh, oops, these are my disclosures. Okay, so sixty-four-year-old, uh, really active guy, runs marathons, presented the ER with transient global amnesia. Actually, had an MRI and was found to have a uh, this a uh, largely thrombosed um, VB junction aneurysm. So if we get into the uh, architecture of this thing, you know, probably around uh, length is probably about 30 or so millimeters. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so hold so, on, let um, me ask, uh, let me ask Dodi since uh, he was, <laughs> so w- which one, where does this fit your, your, your dichotomy here? Like, is this, uh, you know, a 64, but very healthy. The aneurysm looks something in between. How would you consider that? Something in between. <laughs> maybe maybe it's an old, a person that used to be young with that aneurysm now became old. I don't know, but I, I would consider um, this a good candidate for treatment, not as the ones that we were talking about before. I, I agree. So uh, this patient has, um, you can see the distal basal looks sort of normal from the sort of distal third. And so the distortion really begins at the vertebral basilar junction and kind of extends into the distal third. And so you have a place to potentially anchor a pipeline distally. Um, access was made quite a bit more straightforward, once again, by the uh, presence of uh, 24 wires, which um, support the um, catheter around turns like this. In this case, I couldn't quite get it to track in the uh, distal outflow until I brought the microcatheter up and kind of perched it on the uh, on the top of the aneurysm, and then um, that gave me the support here. But this was the entire access. So access took you know I don't know forty seconds or something. It was went very smoothly with the uh, tools that we have available to us now. There we go. Now we're good. Okay. So now we have access. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> a few things to identify in cases like this. Um, a lot about uh, you know some of the architecture and questions surrounding perforators that Kim described. There's always this question, are there perforators coming off of the aneurysm? And then if so, how much coverage do you want to add over the aneurysm? And I think in the past, we've always hypothesized or postulated quite a bit about whether or not the perforators were gone and how confident you could be of this. But these are questions that can be answered quite definitively these days with the resolution of imaging that we have. And so um, here's a DynaCT. And one of the really interesting things that you can see here is um, that there's a longitudinal arcade um, that is going from the distal vertebral artery. This is on the left, although you can see evidence of something similar on the right that's also giving supply to this. And uh, that uh, then uh, terminates within that distal normal appearing basilar distally. And if you look uh, carefully at this, in fact, you'll see that all the basilar perforators come off of this. And so this is essentially a neo-basilar. There are no perforators coming off of the aneurysm, which is really important to note because it changes the way that you might think about coverage over the aneurysm. And also notice that there's an AICA even that comes off of this arcade too, this larger branch here. So um, in addition, it's important to notice because you might want to, you might want to limit coverage over both the inflow to this longitudinal arcade as well as the outflow distally. And so that's an important piece too, um, particularly because I was going to uh, occlude the other side, the contralateral side, the inflow into the aneurysm outside of the uh, stent construct. But um, I guess, uh, you know, uh, Adnan gave a wonderful talk about the development of collateral. Um, and in this case, the collateral has already developed. And so that's a really important thing to note and to sort of understand. And uh, it gives you a sense of, sa- of your safety with respect to coverage over the neck, coverage over the inflow, and then coverage over sacrificing the, uh, the contralateral side. So um, if you'll notice here, when we went to sacrifice the right side, um, there are these... Uh, so. 
typically speaking, pica is kind of your safety as you're bringing coils down to sacrifice the inflow. And, you know, the peel circulation is very low resistance. It can be hard to sacrifice arteries. It can sometimes take quite a few coils. And it's really important to notice that um, you really probably are not safe to bring coils beyond this uh, little perforator right here, which is probably giving collateral to that longitudinal arcade from the right side. So initially I used a three stent construct. There's three stents over the aneurysm here, which you can see. There's one stent over the, uh, over the distal um, outflow and one stent over the proximal inflow and including the uh, anterior spinal artery, which I don't really worry about much at all because the dominant supply of the anterior spinal artery in the cervical spine is overwhelmingly from the artery of cervical enlargement, which does not come off the vertebral artery distally like this one. So um, we were able to uh, use coils to sacrifice the uh, the right side distally as well. And you can see this is that uh, this is that di more distal of the two perforators in addition to the three, three stents. And so fairly happy with the, uh, with the, construct, three stent coverage, in addition to um to our uh uh um in addition to our uh sacrifice of the right side distal to that final that final perforator. So I actually called Kim Nelson, a mentor at the end of this case, who suggested to me that I needed much more stent coverage over the uh aneurysm sac, that three stents in his experience was not enough. And this gets into a certain gestalt that he was alluding to previously and uh, how much coverage is enough in different circumstances. Um, and I don't think uh, anybody has had as much experience with these types of aneurysms. Um, and so that's really important. Uh, this is, um, you know, he didn't say the words, though I've heard him say them before. You know, this is really um, as much of an art as it is a science in many ways. It's sort of an art that is couched in science. So we spoke over the phone. He said that I thought he needed to add more stents. So I decided to bring the patient back two months later. I knew that I had this longitudinal arcade, so I wasn't worried about adding additional coverage over the neck. You can see that um, we had successfully and durably occluded the right side, which now sort of tapers down and runs off into these little perforators. So the right side looks good. Always a good idea to check that, the inflow into the um, into the VB junction outside of the stents. Um, this is, um, you know, the appearance from the left. The aneurysm does not opacify, but, you know, it's it's thrombosed. It's not, it's certainly not healed at this time. And um, I did a Dyna CT here and, and you know, I think much to his point, there's something really interesting that you notice. These are just uh, axial images here. So we'll start to see the uh, distal uh, vertebral artery here. And notice that as we get into the stent, okay, so sorry about that. Hang on one second here. Okay. Okay, so here we go. So um, as we get into the stent that is seated against artery, notice that we have this layer of something between stent layer of something contrast. So it looks like that has already perhaps uh, start begun to endothelialize. And then as we get into the aneurysmal segment, this giant chasm, notice that we see absolutely none of that, not even the slightest hint over this entire length. It's a little hard to see around the coils, but we have quite a bit more around this entire length. And then as we get into the stent here, as we're starting to seat with the uh, that distal normal appearing basal artery, notice that we begin to appreciate that again. And so there's clearly something that's fundamentally different about the physiology of endothelialization as it occurs uh, in stents that are opposed to an arterial wall versus sitting in a giant uh, across a giant chasm in this case. And we really see that, you know, in in full display on this uh, Dyna CT. So I, I added three additional devices at this also, time. Uh, no, can I interrupt you? Uh, that yes. segment, uh, um, I I mean, you scroll through now relatively quickly for me, but I didn't see any perforator coming from that. Uh, am I right? From what? The distal segment? No, the mid segment where. Oh, there's you know, none. There is none. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the like this imaging, you know, I. Could there be perforator we don't see? Um, uh, yes, I'm. I, I'm. I'm sure we can, but uh, you, we don't like the resolution of Dyna is pretty good, and you know I kind of uh, trust it quite a bit. So the, yeah. the that uh, that is an observation that you can make if you do good imaging. Yeah, absolutely, and you can see this perforator. I mean, and that's an observation that's like even more important to make. Uh, you know, from the beginning of the cases, you know, the part that we showed earlier. But you can actually see this perforator, which is the longitudinal arcade that's now supplying the, uh, you know, sort of the neobasilar artery, um, very beautifully and very easily on this uh, um, on the Dyna CT. So there's a reformat from the Dyna CT. The patient was actually doing beautifully. He got back to his uh, marathon running at two years. So this is only you know about a month ago. Um, I got a call that he's, they're on the way to the ER. They moved, so they no longer live near me. They're on the way to the ER. 
He's having a little bit of trouble walking. His symptoms were actually fairly mild. Um, in the ER, he was. Uh, they found that the he, he he said that he had probably missed a few doses of his antiplatelet. And this is two years out. And Adnan made this point as well about keeping these patients on pretty long term antiplatelet. Um, that uh, he was actually given TPA. After he had TPA, he had a bleed in the in the cerebellum, which needed which they decided to surgically evacuate. And in the end, he's actually doing fairly well. He has you know a, essentially a cerebellar deficit. He's this metric. He is back home. He's he's building up his strength. He's trying to get back into swimming, and uh, you know, getting back into his to uh, you know a pretty rigorous exercise routine. So he's doing fairly well given given what happened. But you know, I, I think that there is the point to be made that um, these endothelialize quite slowly. That these patients need to be on antiplatelet for a long period of time. And he knew this, and he he was attempting to take his his antiplatelet every day. But you know, he he became you know a little bit complacent. I, I don't blame him. It's it's been a very long time. And, uh, and missed a few doses and, um, and had this event. I also think that his symptoms were very mild when he got to the ER. And rather than TPA, I feel that if he had been given a bolus dose of integralin and then left on integralin drip, plus, plus or with or without thrombectomy, that actually he might have had a very good outcome. And so I think that's a really important point as well that these, because one of the issues that happened to him in the ER was once he's given TPA or he's actually given tenecteplase, they now have this 24 hour period where they don't feel comfortable giving him any antiplatelet. And so you have both the risk, a heightened risk of hemorrhage, and then also this risk of additional thrombus because you're not you're not going to be given antiplatelet for a long period of time. And so I think that 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 like is and, like an absolutely an extra hazard that that you don't need to add in challenging cases like this. Ben, I I think in such a case it's going to be very instructive for all of us to get the MRI or the CAT scan is going to show where the infarct is and try to correlate anatomically with the. What perforator uh, uh, does it correspond to? Um, I think yep. uh, with with this Dyna, with this level of Dyna, one if you have the MRI, uh, we're gonna be able, like, really to pinpoint to the one that closed. Yep. I mean, it. You know, by description, the, the stuff all happened at outside hospital. I don't actually have the imaging by description. Oh, it was actually but a cerebellar, cerebellar, it. cerebellar only infarct. So I'm not even sure they had infarct in the brain step. I'm not sure exactly why I understand. Like the stent does not cover any branch that you would think of as being a, a cerebellar yeah. other than the AICA, which yeah. which uh, which is coming off of this arcade. But also understanding, is it like a distal, like sort of like a watershed infarct or is right. it like a... No, it's a good question. So it's going to be, question. it's going to lead us to better understanding. That's a good question. Um, yeah. Anybody else have a comment? We're, we're running on time if we start now the next talk, but uh, if you have a... Uh, and then please prepare the next talk, you're next. Um, <laughs> Um, Kim, yeah. Kim can, I mean, certainly Kim can attest to that. So one of the risk factors for uh, complication is moving from the site of your treatment. Like if you've been, like we've had several cases like this, like these people, like these are like, it's not a cancer patient, but like these people, they're yours for life. Like if they move, if you don't have control over the situation, like... That, and it's beyond, of course, like you've invested so much into this. Um, so I definitely feel for that. Um, that's, you know, that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to say is I think like we talk about endothelialization a lot. There's a lot we don't understand about it. Uh, but there's one thing that I think escapes a lot of people's like sort of consideration of it. They think that endothelialization it's something like a one-time deal. Oh, endothelial is done. Like, that's it. Wall put up, nothing happens. Like, we are living tissue. Like, our bone, our endothelium, like, everything is alive in us. So, endothelium is a living tissue. Like, endothelial is today. It doesn't mean endothelial is tomorrow. There's turnover there. There's all kinds of stuff that's very complicated. And the longer the construct, the more, like, unforgiving this becomes. Um, so, I'm glad he's doing better. But it's um, it's another way of frustration. Yeah, very um, disappointing. Thank you, Max. Let me introduce uh, Dan. I mean, you already heard him before because uh, he participated in the in the sessions. Uh, he showed us already like two amazing cases. Um, so Dan Saline um, uh, is uh, now the national director of uh, Ascension Health uh, and works in Indianapolis as uh, uh, in uh, in the Goodman and Campbell group. Um, then uh, um, comes from. Uh, uh, as a training comes from uh, uh, Columbia first, uh, and then after that uh, NYU, where he was uh, 
um, maybe the last one to do the um, the combined program, combined program that was established by Kim Nelson, as uh, uh, Maxim Shapiro is another one that uh, uh, did this kind of program, which is a mixed program in which the the um, the those uh, who did it uh, would come out with uh, sort of like three titles, right? Like an, as a neurology uh, residency, like uh, so board certified in neurology, in radiology, and uh, and neuroradiology on top of like being trained for interventional neuroradiology. Um, after that, uh, um, then saline remain really like part of the NYU family, and uh, uh, we uh, we remain in uh, incredible contact, uh, both scientific, academic, and uh, and uh, uh, and so forth. And uh, he went first to Col- Columbia University, where he was there and attending for a couple of years, and then in uh, Indiana. Uh, where he really established himself as a as a major uh, expert in uh, uh, many things, including uh, uh, flow diversion. Um, he has a he he does an incredible amount of uh, uh, of uh, aneurysm treatment there. Uh, really like trying to push uh, these techniques, um, and so we're it's a pleasure for us to have uh, uh, Dan back uh, and uh, show us a uh, use uh, in uh, distal flow diversion. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Eitan. I'll also just uh, add that Max Shapiro and I were anatomy lab partners at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine way back in the day. So who would know that we were still working together all these years later as we were uh, hovered over a cadaver together uh, in, uh, you know, like 1999 or something like that. Uh, okay, great. Uh, maybe 1998. Um, so, uh, uh, I was asked to speak uh, a bit about, uh, distal flow diversion. And so we'll get into, uh, hopefully some cases that are informative and, uh, and interesting. Um, these are my disclosures here. Uh, okay. So a couple of just general points about distal flow diversion that I think everyone on the panel here does these all the time. So you may not even think about these things anymore, but for those people who have not waded into this territory, um, it may uh, be a little bit daunting, and you may have some questions as to you know whether or not this is a good idea. But I'll say a couple of things that really kind of um, tilt you in favor of of doing these cases. The first one is that visibility is excellent, and like not just okay, it's excellent, and it's something that no one here on this panel I think thinks about a lot because we've all developed techniques to sort of visualize these you know cases in the skull base where you're always shooting through five inches of bone. But you get into a pericolosal artery, it's just incredibly incredibly easy to see. Um, so we almost always use a single device, although in some cases we use multiple devices. Uh, Kim showed that beautiful case of that PCA where he used two stent coverage over the aneurysm and one stent coverage on, on either side. Um, but typically speaking, it's one device. The smaller devices, you know, open fully on initial expansion. They're very easy to use. So there's very little post-processing needed. Um, catheterization has become much easier with the introduction of the 024 wires, particularly in these types of cases to support the 027 microcatheter and then to eliminate step off. That is the, the, you know, the difference in size between an 014 and the 027 getting stuck on aneurysm next or getting stuck on the, you know, origin of the A1 segment or all these kinds of things that used to happen to us. And, um, you know, basically there's always this question of, of, you know, just how small an artery uh, can you treat with a two and a half millimeter stent? Now we're going to have some options for some smaller stents. Although, you know, we've gone down comfortably to about 1.8 millimeters. And actually with this first case, I'm going to, I'm going to show it's actually at its smallest, a sub millimeter case. Uh, it's about 0.8 millimeters. So, um, we'll get into the first case here. So this is a 52-year-old who presented with worst headache of life, actually at an outside hospital um, in um, actually in uh, uh, South Bend, Indiana, home to Notre Dame University, and was sent to us uh, with because of a cha- is sort of a challenging case. So 52-year-old has this hemorrhage. You can see there's uh, intraparenchymal, subarachnoid, subdural, and uh, when we look at this angiographically, if we take a close look here, you'll notice that there's there's a pseudo aneurysm here. We'll take a closer look at this in just a moment. But as we mag back out here, you'll notice that you see this area of oligemia on the capillary phase. And so that artery, that sort of this plastic looking abnormal aneurysmal segment of artery goes straight through the center of this area of oligemia, which confirms for you that this is actually the cause of the bleed, which I think is, you know, kind of a not a small question in this case. This is before we were doing Dyna CT. So this is just a normal, you know, five second a uh, dual volume kind of acquisition. I wish I had a Dyna CT, it would be more beautiful. But you can see that we have this, you know, segment is sort of like a, um, you know, kind of a, a dissecting, a dissecting pseudo aneurysm here. We've got a little bit of spasm in the artery just proximal here. This is M3, M4. We've got a branch that comes off, a little bit of spasm distally here. 
the length is, you know, a little less than 10, 10 millimeters. Okay, so we choose like good working projections. We can see here, we can see the aneurysm, aneurysmal segment really well here. We're looking at it kind of opened up at a little bit of a oblique view on the lateral. So we can kind of see the outflow. We're going to go into this larger trunk here and kind of pipeline from this proximal larger M4 trunk back across the uh, across the uh, across the aneurysm. So um, this is just to show the uh, catheter. So this is an 027 catheter. You can see the size of the catheter and the size of the you know surrounding arteries. And this is just what it what it looked like to advance the stent into position. Now here is our strategy. The strategy is basically this: we're going to try to. Our only other option really is vessel sacrifice. And so we are going, which is not always so easy. And you really need to pack these pretty tightly in order to get the artery to shut down. You can certainly perforate while you're trying to do that. And so the idea was to put in a stent. And if the stent looked really terrible in this tiny, tiny vessel, I was actually just going to take the patient off of her dual antiplatelets and use the thrombogenicity of the device as a vessel sacrifice tool. And so, um, you know, part of this case, I think we actually published this case, is, is you know, using the... Um, characteristics of the tool to your favor. Usually you think of thrombogenicity as being something bad, but in this case, we could have used it as a, you know, as kind of a vessel sacrifice tool. So we're using that like, you know, to our advantage. Um, but, you know, I don't know, everything went, <laughs> went sort of nicely with the catheterization and would bring the, the stent into position. So I thought, you know, let's try this. We'll, let's see how we do. So this is the stent uh, once it's fully deployed. And you can see, we actually no longer see the stent is very constrained. The vessel gets down to about 0.8 millimeters here. It uh, uh, gets up to about probably a little over one millimeter here, about 1.3 to 1.5 here. We deploy the stent. It looks pretty good. There's nice anti-grade flow. Actually, that side branch actually stays open. And so we thought, you know, let's keep the patient on her, um, on her antiplatelets and let's see how this goes. I actually brought her back later the same day just to kind of see how things looked and they still look good. Um, we no longer see the kind of outpouchings uh, immediately after implantation. So this is what it looks like immediately. You can see we no longer see that irregularity. See the stent goes into this branch, side branch is open. Things look pretty good. Um, so we decided to keep her on this. Uh, I tried to get an MRA five days post. She was doing very nicely. Decided to get an MRA and you can see there's nice flow related signal right through the center of this stent here. So that gives us a good scent. The stent is open, the flow is anti-grade and, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll keep her on her antiplatelets and see how she does. So she actually went home and um, came back six months later and uh, and so uh, for just routine follow up angiography, and uh, and this is what the uh, this is what the stent looked like. So uh, I guess I have a question, which is uh, that I always ask, which is um, what uh, what happened here? Notice the side, the you know the gel uh, branch stayed open. So for the panel, I guess the question is, you know, what do you, uh, and this is what it looked like angiographically. So uh, how do you interpret this? I know how Kim interprets this because uh, I had Kim on the phone within about 12 seconds of seeing this image. So uh, uh, trying to understand what had happened here. I mean, the vessel distal is, is more, smaller than used to be. Um, it's smaller, maybe about the same size. It's really the segment, the segment of stent. That's, That's kind it. of dramatic. Yeah. I mean, the stand, which had been constrained previously, essentially has expanded to nominal. So you created an aneurysm. Over the six months. I wouldn't call it an aneurysm, but I know I know what you're talking about, what you're referring to. You know, I mean, essentially, I, as I understand it, and, you know, Kim, you can feel free to take over since you're the one who sort of had the explanation. It seems that the stent essentially expanded to nominal over time, that in these tiny, you know, tiny distal vessels that, uh, you know, they have a very elastic lamina. And uh, that the radial force of the stent was enough to kind of stretch the artery out over the course of six months, despite, you know, appearing constrained, um, you know, over the first week or so. I think this is the thing that we get into when we talk about like this um, newer devices, how devices behave, like the radial force of the stent has to be like proportional to the vessel. Right here, you're taking like arguably like this is not something that goes into an M3, M4, like you said. So you have this, this result, right? The opposite could be true too. If you take something that doesn't have any radial force and you put it into a big 
That's so we wonder why it comes crimped up like six months later. Yeah. Well, well, I think particularly because you started with a weakened artery, you know, like so a dissected, you know, when you put this to treat an ACOM and it's going in a normal ACA, maybe the vessel can still stay constrained. But here you've put it in a segment that was already dissected yeah. and was abnormal. Yeah. I think that, you know, uh, from the uh, cases that we're doing SCA to MCA, you know, the width of the uh, vessel wall in these cortical vessels, it's like, it's nothing. It's it's much less than one millimeter, much less. I don't remember how much, but you cannot compare it to a proximal ACA or or even M, M1, M2, M3. It's a completely different vessel wall. Yeah. So what about like, also like when, I, when you operate on aneurysms and you see coils, that like make their way through the wall over exactly. time. Exactly, that's why I was saying that. It's you like those almost out. necessarily like yeah. something like grow through it. It it has you know it has this nice layer of intimal growth. For a second, I was like, should I be you know it's like there's something about to rupture or something or something here you know. But it has this nice layer of intimal growth here, and uh, and the patient's done very nicely. And you know that dominant trunk really supplied this area that was just kind of dorsal to the hemorrhage, and you can see that there's no encephalomalacia at all. Um, in that area at, uh, at uh, MRI that I obtained just after the uh, just after I did this, just to kind of show that you know that the treatment on some level was effective. Um, how long? Uh, there is a question from the audience about this, so let me interrupt you now. How long did the stent elongate uh, upon original deployment? Well, I, I can go back and show you. I mean, it was. Um, you can take a look and sort of estimate. Um, I, I would have, like I say, I would have done a post, you know, post implant dynasty T these days, but I wasn't doing that back then. So we could have given you a really good answer, um, with the imaging that we do now, but, um, how, how much did it elongate? You know, uh, I mean, we can sort of estimate. So, so this is the stent, uh, immediately post implantation. And, uh, you know, my guess is that it was, a, you know, it was a 2.5 by 10. So my guess is that it's something like 12 to 14 or something here. So now it looks shorter compared to that. It's shorter. Yes. Yeah. Yes, shorter. it did. Yeah. It, I mean, it basically opened a nominal. It it opened and it uh, and it you know it it foreshortened. It relaxed. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, All righty. So you know, one issue that always comes up is how to manage antiplatelets in these cases. There are many different ways of loading antiplatelets. We've come to our own conclusion, but um, I think that there are many ways of doing it successfully. I think the much more challenging thing is how do you partially take up people off their antiplatelets to do procedures and things. And that's where we have a protocol that we slowly refined over time and through around 50 cases or so has worked extremely well for us. So I'll just share our protocol. Maybe it will be helpful, maybe not. But what we do on the day of the procedure, I prefer patients to be on oral uh, agents over the first 24 hours simply because I think they're more reliable. And if you have a patient on any of the drips, um, some of them are, you know, have very short half-lives, others slightly longer half-lives, but you could always have an IV that blows in the middle of the night in the ICU with nobody noticing. Um, certainly a bigger deal with, with Kangrelor than it is with Integralin, where Kangrelor, the, you know, the half-life is like five minutes. And um, Integralin, it's more like, you know, more like around an, an hour or so or two hours. But uh, we like to have the patients on oral agents. So we start with 90 of Berlinta at 4 a.m. We give 90 of Berlinta at, uh, eight, at 6 a.m. with 81 of aspirin. And then we always start at 8 a.m. So we don't do these cases on weekends because that means that a stroke could come in and the one person who's there could get tied up. We only do them on weekdays and we it's just like a hard start for an 8 a.m. So if a stroke comes, somebody else is doing it in another room. And then we start with 60 of Berlinta BID starting that evening. They're probably a little bit super therapeutic when we do the case, but we actually like that because these patients are hypercoagulable and they're actually focally hypercoagulable right where the implant is going in. And so being a little super therapeutic, I think is actually helpful in, in these cases. Um, then... We try to put off procedures as long as we possibly can. The stent, the stent drops in thrombogenicity quite dramatically over the first two weeks. So the longer that you can put off procedures, the better. We basically um, give an aspirin and hold Berlinta for an entire day. And then the next morning, we give another aspirin. We do all of our procedures between 10 a.m. and noon. If the patient had any procedure in the head, that is, uh, you know, putting an EVD, taking out an EVD, whatever, the patient gets a head CT immediately after. Two hours after the final procedure, the patient gets a 60 of Berlinta and they start a 60 of Berlinta that evening as well. We have not had a thromboembolic or a bleeding event doing this. And we've done quite a bit of, you know, pegs, trachs, um, uh, you know, uh, VP shunts, all of these kinds of things, removal of EVDs, all of these kinds of things. And this has worked extremely effectively for us. Um, if you want to look at the, you know, general 
concept behind both of these for the loading curve. Notice that picagrelor um, gets um, becomes therapeutic much more rapidly than clopidogrel. It very reliably gets to about around 80-90% of its efficacy over the first hour and it's completely 100% uh, of its efficacy over two hours. So you reliably have everything that you need on board after two hours. And um, in terms of the rate of decline of inhibition, when you remove the drug, this is it's not good to look at these absolute values because these are only Plavix medium responders. These are only clopidogrel medium responders, but it's good to look at the, at the slope. And so, and also these are patients who are on 90, 90 of Berlinta and we typically use 60 BID. So the absolutes don't matter as much, but it's the slope that matters. And so just notice that, you know, it really drops pretty dramatically and reliably on Picagrelor. And um, at about 36 hours, you've dropped by about 70% of your maximum efficacy, which means that you're, you know, around 20 to 30% inhibited, which tends to be the sweet spot. Whereas with clopidogrel, it's actually, um, you know, a much slower slope because it finds a reversible way to platelets. You essentially need to make new platelets in order for the, uh, for the effect to wear off. Uh, okay. So next up, healthy 59 year old, uh, female with spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this is a patient with a, you know, a bit of a wide neck pericolosal aneurysm. So in these cases, and you know, this disease really seems to involve the artery. Kim mentioned the idea of segmental disease. We use that kind of um, understanding of aneurysms all the time. Because if you're kind of honest about or precise about where the neck is, a lot of times it really kind of surrounds the uh, artery, the parent artery circumferentially. So here's um, an aneurysm that we will um, coil, which we coil. No, I don't like to use balloons. We just kind of primarily coiled. Um, we had a fairly nice result, but notice that I, you know, I think that the parent artery actually looks diseased as well. And so um, this is a classic case for us where we will coil in anticipation of pipeline. And uh, in this case, um, uh, you know, went up, uh, put in, implanted one device, added a lot of load over the neck of the aneurysm here to uh, increase coverage. You can see there's a tremendous load over the neck of the aneurysm here to increase coverage. And uh, patient re returns uh, six months later. And um, you can see, you can see a nice demonstration of that load here over the neck. And, uh, Notice that this little uh, um, uh, closal marginal uh, branch stays patent, and um, and uh, I'm sorry, per pericolosal branch uh, stays patent, and uh, and uh, we have a cure of this uh, of this aneurysm. So um, something similar here with a slightly different approach initially. 47 year old with subarachnoid hemorrhage, also a slightly different you know kind of architecture. So notice that it looks like the rupture point occurs at the base of what is a fairly wide neck aneurysm that sort of spans this bifurcation. Kind of challenging to control this with either endovascular or, or open technique here. And um, so what ends up happening is that I sort of tipped a web into this sideways and realized that I was leaving a huge cleft, but I controlled this nicely. So here's my web in position. Notice that I'm leaving this huge cleft on the left side of the aneurysm, but also notice that it's sitting nicely over this little kind of pseudo aneurysmal component, which I was really happy about. So I decided to keep that, knowing that I was going to bring the patient back anyway. I thought that that would be enough. She actually cruised through the vasospasm spasm period, did beautifully. And um, you can see we no longer see any of that pseudoaneurysm there, but uh, we still have um, still have this big cleft, uh, not surprisingly. And so uh, this is actually an azagous ACA. So these are the um, bilateral pericolosal arteries here. And so in this case, because... Um, you know, this artery actually became smaller from initial treatment to now. And the reason is that it's being slightly constrained by the shoulder of the web, which is creating just a little bit of a stenosis. So I don't want to kind of double jail that branch. So I decided to go up this smaller branch, uh, put a pipeline in and kind of shove the shoulder of the web away. And I thought that that was kind of cover this segment of the neck of the aneurysm. Although I think you can make arguments for um, for putting the, the device in, in either of these divisions. You know, we need to make a fairly tight turnaround this year um, to get access. And then we also don't want to get stuck on the distal lip of the uh, of the aneurysm, and this is where um, using an 024 wire is uh, has really made these cases much, much, much easier. So just trying to have a fairly tight turn on this, just trying to get it to uh, to make this turn here. This is the entire catheterization, and uh, goes very smoothly. And then I know that I'm not going to get stuck on the lip of this here because um, you know I've eliminated step off with an 024 wire, which I feel confident that I would have had this uh, been an 014 wire, particularly with this type of arrangement, and. Uh, this is the, uh, oops, my apologies. This is this is the uh, wire supporting the catheter, getting into position. I do think, you know, in a lot of these cases, we're, we're partially occlusive. 
just want to advance the guide just a little bit here. Partially occlusive the entire time. So I think that the cleaner the catheterization, the least vasospasm that you can create, the better um, in terms of your outcomes in cases like this. I also want to land this device uh, just on this little segment without covering this little um, you know, uh, division of the uh, anterior cerebral artery, this little frontal anterior frontal division of the anterior cerebral artery. And so a uh, fairly tight landing zone. Notice the roadmap is shifting a little bit, but it's nice to have the web in position because the web will shift as well. And so uh, that'll kind of give me a guide as exactly where to land. So um, I felt pretty good about where we uh, landed this, um, just barely opposed, but this is something that you can be really certain of when you do DynaCT or cone beam CT imaging in general, that you're like definitely opposed on really tight landing zones um, like this one. And so I felt, I felt very good about this. Um, this is a super Dyna, but on the original source images, you can see that it's, it's like exactly where we want to be and that it's fully opposed to the arterial wall over the course of, you know, around a millimeter and a half distal to the uh, aneurysm neck. Also notice that, you know, looking at these MIFs, we were able to kind of shove the, uh, the shoulder of the web back, which is exactly what we wanted to do to kind of uh, fix the stenosis in the segment. This is what it looked like angiographically. And notice even immediately angiographically, even though um, there's a neck that extends across the um, contralateral uh, ACA as well, because of this flow effect, because the flow through the device goes, you know, tends to be redirected to 90 degrees to the wall of the stent, we're sort of no longer seeing that segment of aneurysm. And so, um, it, you know, it's really kind of a beautiful image, uh, even though the stent doesn't actually cover a lot of the neck. It doesn't cover the neck along this entire segment. So um, this is what it looked like originally, remember, and this is what it looks like now. Also, the uh, this angle has kind of been straightened out a little bit by the stent too, which is probably helpful for the uh, jet of flow into the aneurysm. And this is what it looked like uh, when the patient returned uh, for six-month follow-up uh, imaging. Here's our, uh, our uh, superdyna. And notice that we no longer have any neck across here, really just from the slow effect. And on the segment that's uh, actually covered by uh, by stent, um, I don't know, the uh, the aneurysm, is, the remnant has decreased in size by volume by, I don't know, 95% or something. And I would expect that to continue uh, just given um, you know the, what we know of uh, from the three-year puffs and the five-year puffs, uh, puffs data. And uh, Dan, uh, this is uh, awesome. Uh, I, 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 I cannot uh, let you show many more cases. We're running a little out of time. Okay. Um, Should uh, I do one more case? Because you, you asked me to show the next case. I'll do one more case. Uh, yes. Um, okay. I'll do one more case. Uh, uh, this was just, Athan asked me to show this because it, it involves a principle of uh, of flow diversion proximally to treat distally. So this is a patient with a with a fusiform A1 aneurysm. And we've seen some other examples of ways of treating this. Adnan shows a case where he did a beautiful bypass, uh, you know, for something not not terribly dissimilar from this. But um, I do want to show this just because, you know, we brought up the principle of rearranging the circle of Willis and how we might kind of conceive of that. And that was kind of the first thought that we had with this. Um, the patient has a large uh, anterior communicating artery to begin with, with a fenestration here, I'll note. Um, so, you know, our objective here was to uh, really just cover this, um, go from MCA to, uh, to uh, uh, ICA to MCA with two stents, uh, double stent coverage over the neck of the aneurysm, single stent everywhere else. So here we go. Notice that the jet of inflow kind of hits the far wall here and then kind of swirls around. You can see these little tendrils of contrast on the, on the top and bottom of the vessel. Okay, so one stent, here's the second stent. So we have this two stent coverage over the neck. And notice that now in our first angiographic image, uh, you notice that the you know the flow of uh, contrast goes to 90 degrees through the wall of the uh, stent and it's very blunted. And I had a number of options. If the aneurysm didn't go away, I could always have come back you know, from the other side through ACOM and coiled this off. I could have added additional stents on this side. So there are a number of options, I think, uh, in the end for this uh, case. But fairly straightforward in the case, uh, technically, and when the patient came back at six months, we no longer see that uh, any filling of the uh, A1 segment from the ipsilateral side. The patient is, of course, asymptomatic. And um, when we shoot the contralateral side, notice that what we see is um, this fenestration once again. The A1 segment on the right side kind of tapers down to just the size of this little uh, uh, medial lenticular striate, which runs off and remains patent. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, this is uh, really like awesome. It really shows us uh, like how, you know, the push of this technique, even in more distal locations, uh, can be very effective. And I would say safe. Uh, you know, there are some some sort of like things to keep in mind to make this safer. But overall, um, you know, in my experience, I would say our experience, those uh, like, uh, I wouldn't say the 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 complication rate is uh, is bigger than other more 
like I would say, canonical locations. Um, while uh, Erez, uh, uh, can you start uh, sharing your screen and uh, prepare the presentation? While that happens, anybody has any comment? You may be aware then uh, uh, Dodi showed uh, a few years ago in Baldizer uh, a presentation on uh, distal treat, uh, like proximal flow diversion for treatment of more distal aneurysm, what he calls spooky. How did you call it, uh, Dodi? Spooky technique? The spooky comes from <clears throat> Einstein definition of uh, a spooky action at a distance of two particles that uh, relate uh, one to the other, even if they are uh, in universe apart. Uh, and that was just, to, you know, of course, a comic uh, way to say that sometimes you have you put a flow diverter at the origin of a vessel uh, and along this vessel a little bit while away, not exactly on the uh, where the flow diverter is. Uh, uh, you have an aneurysm and the aneurysm will go away just because you change the flow inside that vessel. And uh, so I called it spooky action at a distance, uh, as Einstein would have done, but um, uh, as usual, just for fun. Thank you. So Thank now you. it's, uh, yeah, we call these things uh, a spooky aneurysm, a spooky treatment of an aneurysm. Yes, just for fun. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you, Erez. Please uh, um, uh, let me introduce you. Um, Erez uh, Nosek uh, um, uh, is an associate professor of neurosurgery here at NYU. Um, he uh, has uh, um, he has been a fellow with me. He he's, he comes from Israel. Um, uh, he did his uh, residency there as well as uh, uh, um, uh, as well as medical school and residency there, and then he moved here around the same time I moved, and uh, we were fellows together. Um, after fellowship, he spent uh, a, a few years as an attending at uh, Maimonides Hospital um, here in Brooklyn, and then uh, he moved back uh, uh, to join our group. Um, I believe it was uh, 2017, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, since uh, then, he has pushed really like uh, 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 the limits of uh, of uh, uh, bypass uh, uh, bypass uh, uh, solution for uh, for multiple uh, um, multiple situations um, and uh, uh, he's uh, he's uh, also an interventional radiologist an interventional endovascular neurosurgeon as uh, he defines himself but essentially he does both endovascular and open surgical treatments. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you uh, talk to us about uh, iatrogenic intracranial aneurysm, which is a very, very specific uh, uh, kind of situation, which in any place, any sort of like high volume uh, uh, hospital, those are situations that happen. And there are certain things that are very peculiar about this. And uh, um, I'm uh, uh, eager to listen from you, Eris. Thank you, Aitan. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, I'm pushing the uh, bypass and they are pushing me to do pipes for ruptured aneurysms. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Eitan wanted me uh, to talk about the complication of my partners from neurosurgery department. So I'll talk about iatrogenic uh, aneurysms. Um, we were talking about, you know, should we talk about ruptured cases, dissecting aneurysms, iatrogenic, and then we thought that this topic specifically is is a difficult is a difficult part of our profession they always call us like in the middle of the probably 6 or 7 p.m we have a problem and now you are there and you don't know what to do and uh, we have some experience with that so we will be happy to share with you uh, these are my disclosures they are not really relevant for this talk um so here it out here here how it looks that that's how it looks that's an endovascular approach for pituitary adenoma um, you can see that this is actually the carotid here, the really cavernous carotid. This is the lesion, and the surgeon is actually dissecting, and it is dissecting kind of more lateral to the carotid, and uh, take a look how it looks. You don't need a lot of dissection in order to perforate this vessel, especially when there's an uh, involvement of a, um, of a lesion there in that level. So now... Uh, and now they call you, right? Uh, Erez uh, or whoever you are, we need your help. 
So I think the most important thing at that point is to ask few very important questions uh, before you say, yes, let's go. Uh, first of all is, do you really have control on this specific lesion that you uh, just created? Second is to verify that the patient is stable. If they are not so sure, you need to verify that he's stable. Don't let them take you, um, take the patient to the angiocyte before it's completely stable. The next question for them is what kind of packing did you, they use? And that's a very important issue, whether it's temporary, just a gauze or a paddy that is placed there, or they do have something that can stay there, like a piece of a graft or a... Um, a fat graft or the fascia that they usually use. What did they use in order to control this bleed? And it's important and you'll see shortly why. And the third question is, and you need to raise it sometimes we don't have the time for that, is do you think this patient is going to need an EVD? Because, you know, there's lots of complication with EVD on dual antiplatelet. Um, and you need to know whether he needs an EVD. And if he needs it, they need to put it just before you start your, your treatment. So here is a patient. Is a patient. Uh, they call us. We need your help. Um, we took the patient to the. Um, the, the, the that's a. Uh, that's a. The same case that I just show you with that rupture. Okay. Um, they we took them to the OR. We ask what they put there. There is only a gas gauze there. There is no fat graft. There is nothing there actually. Um, and so we did this angiogram. You see, we think that there is a dissection, but there's no real aneurysm. Uh, that we can see, and the vessel is actually kind of flattened. Uh, that's because of mass effect. And you see the whole gas, gauze is, is here uh, at the level of the nose. At this point, since there was nothing there to support our uh, construct, and we didn't think that there's a real aneurysm, we decided to bring him back, to bring the patient um, back the following day. And uh, here's the following day. You can now see on this uh, uh, Dyna CT reconstruction that there's kind of something here that is actually looks like a dissecting or uh, iatrogenic aneurysm. Um, at this point, we decided to, to treat the patient. We used actually three pipes um, and we managed to protect this lesion. The patient did quite well. You can see the three pipes uh, across the uh, the level of the, uh, of the rupture. Um, you can see how the pipe actually uh, kind of pushed a little bit on the on their on the gauze and on the uh, um, uh, packing and created like uh, like the size of the vessel is back there and you can see how nicely how these three pipes are actually over uh, one each other and you get better control on the rupture side. So what is the pseudoaneurysm? Just in short, I know that most of you know. What I want to show you here is that there's no like real three layers of a vessel, as we know, usually from an aneurysm, there's usually an ad adventitia, and sometimes there's nothing there, right? It's just the hole and something is holding there because the brain is there or something else which holds the aneurysm in position. Now, is there a real difference or is it really important whether it's a pseudoaneurysm or dissecting aneurysm? Actually, no, because there are no three levels of uh, and layers of the vessel wall. So this aneurysm is really not stable. And that's very important to understand. We cannot usually, usually, and you'll see a case that we could, but usually you cannot postpone the treatment for a long period of time. And this is just to show you what's a dissecting or a blister or iatrogenic aneurysm. This is a spontaneous aneurysm. That's not an iatrogenic, just to show you what happens with this aneurysm. It ruptured. Um, brought her to the angiocyte, and you can see by the location, kind of point laterally and superiorly um, at the mid-segment of the supraclinoid carotid. This is the a, a dissecting aneurysm. We did it with, with ATAN. Um, you can see the 3D, how it looks. It was really difficult to categorize the aneurysm and to, to have an, a, a catheter within the aneurysm. Uh, we did manage to do it. We had the, like a, long, a short tail, uh, which is jailed by the pipeline. And you can see how um, uh, we managed to also pack the, the, uh, the, the pipe at this level, just across the neck of the aneurysm. And you can see that the uh, coil mass is actually just next to the parent vessel. Um, this is a follow-up, two-month follow-up, and you can see like complete new vessel, um, and it looks perfect. Um, this is a super dyna that shows, uh, that shows it again. Uh, we used a very short uh, pipe, 
um, just covering the takeoff of the um, of the PICOM and just the takeoff of the ophthalmic without covering the choroidal. But here is what I want to show you. This is how it looks on the 2D. Take a look where the coil mass is. So probably this aneurysm continued to grow during this very uh, few first days after the operation. Um, what's there in terms of the data? Well, you know, as everyone knows, there's not a lot of data. This is a, a series of four patients, two of them actually, only two of them of iatrogenic uh, cases, uh, which did quite well. Um, this is a newer publication from 2023, uh, 33 patients actually. But if you read the aneurysm, the, um, the paper, there's only one aneurysm that was a pseudo aneurysm, but still it's ruptured cases treated with pipeline flex, pseudo aneurysms, kind of the same nature. But what's important to show here is there's lots of EVD complications. And that's why I'm saying and repeating that, that this patient needs to get their EVD prior to our treatment. And the problem is that most of these patients, in these 33 patients that were treated ruptured cases, blister and pseudoaneurysms, 50% of them were treated with just a single device, um, which probably usually not always uh, good enough. You can see that in this treatment, only 82% got complete occlusion. These aneurysms need to be completely secured. We cannot, we cannot leave them with 82%. That's not enough. Um, so... Here's an interesting case just to, to demonstrate the, the one of the most important things with management of these cases. This is a, a resid residual clinoid or cavernous, cavernous meningioma uh, that was taken to the OR for their repeated surgery. Um, and the surgeon actually had a nick at the level of the supraclinoid carotid, but he managed to clip the this, this hole in the supraclinoid carotid. Um, he did use a micro Doppler and he did have good flow in the A1 segment and in the MCA, in both of them. So we decided at that point just to send the patient to the uh, ICU. Uh, but during the night, the patient deteriorated, had a significant hemiplegia. Um, and only the following day was taken to the angio suite. Um, and this is how it looks in the angio suite. So you see there's a no undergrade flow behind, below the um, distal to the choroidal artery, to the uh, choroidal um, artery. Um, and you can see the clip here, um, uh, really at the level of the, of the uh, bifurcation. So now what, can we use a, a, a pipe? Obviously at this point we can't, but if we took the patient immediately after the operation, maybe there was still some flow um, and then it, you know, reoccluded because of a clot, because of a small dissection that was there. So what I want to say, this is very important. You want to do this angiogram as soon as possible after the trauma to the vessel. Um, here, I had no other choice but to do a high flow bypass. And you can see we use the venous vein graft, uh, reconstructed the, uh, and you can see there's flow also to the MCA and to the ICA as well. Um, here's another case. This is a clival meningioma was taken to the OR, um, and then they call you again, right? So these are the four questions that we need to ask always. Control, stable, what did you use, and do we need an EVD? This is the immediate post-op. So many times in the immediate post-op, it's very difficult to see a real lesion. That's why this is the second point of my, uh, of my, of my talk. It's very important to bring for another follow-up angiogram. And you can see at day four, there's clearly a pseudoaneurysm here. So we cannot continue. And sometimes it's a very small, tiny aneurysm that you cannot see also on CT angio. Uh, and you can miss it on a CT angio. Here it's kind of a little bit easier because of the, the location. Um, and here we took the patient. Um, actually, I asked uh, um, Kim to help, to help him, me here. And you see that we chose the left PCA. And why? Uh, multiple reasons. One is there's a Percheron, as you can see on the Dyna CT. We didn't want to cover that, uh, that, uh, that vessel. And second, as, as uh, Dr. Shapiro showed in the beginning of the day, very nicely, you can see that the inner curvature is a little bit tighter than the outer curvature. And we knew that the aneurysm points more towards the uh, left lateral side. And that's why we chose, this is the reason why we chose um, this uh, uh, PCA to go into with the, with the pipe. Um, this is uh, early follow-up angiogram. You can see already that you can see the aneurysm. 
um, it's completely gone with the 3D. And when you take the patient at six month follow up, you can see that there's a juice flow into the right gel PCA, which was already demonstrated to you multiple times during this day. And you can see how bigger is the PCOM uh, taking over because of the gel uh, P1 segment of the PCA. Um, here's another case, endonasal approach for CSF leak. And um, if you look very carefully, by the way, it was missed by the uh, by uh, by the radiologist. You can see that there's actually dehiscence here. Um, you can see it here on the axial. You can see it on the coronal, and you can see it also on the sagittal. There's definitely a dehiscence there, um, and um, obviously they call you um, again, again. Ask these questions and take the patient to immediate angiogram. And you can see there's a small, tiny, very small aneurysm at the mid segment of the cavernous, uh, cavernous carotid. Um, and here is a dynasty. You can see that um, it's kind of a narrow neck and there's another kind of lesion just uh, uh, posterior to this, to this aneurysm. Um, and basically here, there's really nothing that holds it in position. You have to treat this aneurysm. Um, this is some more images, nice images of the uh, Dyna. Um, and we did use uh, multiple uh, construct um, and multiple devices here uh, for this lesion. What do we do in terms of antiplatelet protocol? Uh, this is generally speaking, this is our protocol. We deploy the pipe and only then we start with loading. Uh, we give IV heparin between 2,000 and 3,000 units. And we then load with IV integralin. And postoperatively, all these patients will get rectal aspirin. Um, and then once they extubated and can swallow, we'll change it to Brilinta with 90 milligrams. Um, if they stay intubated for any kind of reason, then we'll continue uh, the integralin um, uh, drip until the patient is extubated and can swallow. This is how it looks. And you see the uh, double coverage, uh, the stuff that uh, Max, I'm not going to repeat. Uh, but it really demonstrates very well uh, how you can, if you take two uh, different sizes of devices. And here's the uh, post-op. You can see just across that lesion where they hit the carotid, uh, actually the, the, the pipe actually the pipe lays just there and protect the um, this aneurysm. This is a follow-up angiogram uh, with complete occlusion. Um, and here's another pituitary supracellar component. Uh, with supercellular component. And uh, well, this is a case actually that was done by Eitan. You can see the involvement of the whole ACOM complex within the, uh, the lesion, the, the, uh, the supracellular component of the uh, pituitary lesion. Um, here you can see the coronal segments and uh, you see how high it goes, the whole, the whole pituitary lesion. And these are the, these are the, this is the complex actually. Um, this is how it looks. This is the chiasm, actually, in the intraoperative through endonasal approach. This is the chiasm. This is left optic, right optic. This is the A2 and another A2. This is a um, actually a video from uh, Dr. Gardner, who is actually a world-renowned uh, endovascular, eh, I'm sorry, endonasal uh, surgeon. And you can see he's cutting the, uh, the lesion of the A2 segment, and this is how it looks. It's very difficult to control actually, is trying to buzz it, but uh, doesn't manage to do it. Um, it then tries to clip it. And also didn't manage to catch it. Finally, with uh, some more bipolar, he managed to, uh, to buzz this aneurysm, this, um, this lesion. This patient, even though they managed to get full, complete control with the bipolar, needs to get an angiogram. No question about that. Um, here at how it looks, the, uh, the uh, post immediate post-op um, CT scan, lots of blood in the, in the region. Um, and you can see this is the right internal carotid artery, and this is the left internal carotid artery. Obviously, there's lots of spasm here um, uh, of the A1 segment, and um, we cannot see any specific lesion at this um, CT. We also, Aiton also did a um, uh, 3D, uh, which also very difficult to notice um, a real lesion at the level of the A1. We always was con concentrated actually at the A1 segment, but then on the uh, uh, axial imaging, you can see, uh, or the 2D imaging of the Dyna, you can see the lesion, right? This is the aneurysm. It's a proximal A2 
uh, lesion. Um, and we continue to monitor the, these patients, especially because there was significant spasm. We, we felt that we can't treat this aneurysm at that point. You, you can see that the A1 segment is even smaller now. Um, and finally, after a uh, few weeks, I think three weeks, we managed to bring the patient in. We, um, Aiton used a, uh, in a compassionate use, he, he used a silk baby. He managed to uh, deploy and lay the stent exactly above the level of the bifurcation, um, as you can see here. And um, this is the end result. And the six-month follow-up, you can see complete occlusion of the aneurysm um, no, without residual, and the patient is doing very well. Uh, so to uh, just as a summary, uh, what's really important in these iatrogenic cases is to verify the hemostasis status to see if the patient needs an EVD. You really want to get and push them to do an immediate post-op angiogram to understand where, where's the lesion and if you can see a lesion. If there's no lesion, really repeat it really early. Within two to four days, you want to see another um, um, DSA. If the, lesion was not no, if the lesion was noted, you really want to pack the pipe across the lesion uh, with multiple devices if you need few devices and if you can allow yourself with multiple devices. You want to load with antiplatelet after you cross and after you deploy the pipe. Um, continue and maintenance uh, with maintenance of the antiplatelet medications. And you want to do also an early follow-up just to see that you have control on the aneurysm. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ares. This is... Uh... This was uh, the dessert uh, to to the the whole uh, day of uh, of uh, talks. You know, you talk as about such a specific kind of use that uh, you know there's no many <laughs> many other ways to deal with these situations. And uh, you know, you showed uh, as a very good example of how this can be a successful thing. But a lot of things need to be thought about because technically, you know, it may not be the hardest case to do. Technically, it's really like a lot of other things that needs to be consider here um any any comment from uh, the other faculty uh, before i share the screen for the final uh, con for the final remarks Eris, thank you so much no i i i think just like the the not a non iatrogenic blister aneurysm paradigm um has really evolved towards flow diversion like in our shop and I think in many others. The iatrogenic ones are also like, usually have a good solution to them. Thank you. Um, so um, can you, uh, Nick, can you share my screen please? Thank you. So this, uh, it was a pleasure. It's been a, it's been a long day. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, I hope uh, uh, everybody connect. We still have a lot of people connected and uh, this is awesome. It shows like uh, the amount of questions that came were so many, I, I, we couldn't answer them all. Uh, I apologize. We will try to answer them in, in the next couple of days. Um, uh, so um, I wanted to, you know, thank again our sponsors and, um, and uh, uh, you know, mention to you about uh, uh, what's uh, coming up. Um, which is Banana 2024. You know, the every two years we're doing like uh, the full uh, three days of uh, neurovascular anatomy course uh, and uh, um, in which we will, you know, we'll talk about every single, <laughs> as much as possible, every single thing in terms of neurovascular anatomy. And uh, um, uh, interactive workshop in the afternoon, um, very interactive session. And then in the evening, sort of like open embo club styles in which uh, everybody brings cases and we discuss. So uh, I hope uh, to see you next year. Um, I wanted again to thank uh, 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 our guest faculty, um, you know, uh, Brie Chancellor, Dodi Boccardi, who stayed here until like it's very late in Italy. Thank you so much, Dodi, uh, for uh, staying so late. Uh, Isil, who just uh, left a few few minutes ago, and um, the, the faculty of the afternoon, John Wainwright, Rene Chapeau, 
Hadan Siddiqui and uh, then Selain, uh, as well as obviously like our uh, NYU internal team, the people who presented the cases uh, and the talks, Max, uh, Kim and and Erez, as well as all the rest of the team. Uh, um, and uh, thank you so much, our current fellows. You know, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be able to to do our work. Uh, but for this for this course. Um, you know, you're going to find material to Nuroenjo um, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, sorry, I missed one slide here. Uh, where was it? This one. Sorry, I missed this slide. Um, yeah, about uh, uh, the course recording. I had a lot of questions about where to find the recording. Essentially, you're going to log in and find the same spot where you did see view course live stream here. You're going to be able to see the recording once that's available, which should be uh, I'm being told the Friday the latest. Uh, you're going to get an email as registrants when this is available. And um, also, you're going to get an email about the credit. Um, anything else? I thank you again. And uh, we we finished late, uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it was awesome, uh, at least for me. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Eitan, for the 